Patrick ran his hand over his face. Any word from Yabon? None, said Duke Brian. We've had nothing since the Battle of Sarth. No ships can get past Quegg's pirates to reach the free cities. All our ships from the far coast were used to support the raid. If word is coming, it is coming by runner, and the chances of a courier getting through the enemy to reach us is thin. Perhaps when we get closer to Illith we may hear of Yabon, but for now we must pray the young duke is able to keep Lamut and Yabon intact. Looking at Jimmy and Dash, Patrick said, Dine with me tonight, both of you, and we'll discuss your duties. In your case, Jimmy, before you leave tomorrow. Tomorrow, said Dash. Patrick, Highness, I thought we would accompany our father to Villanon for his funeral. No time, sorry to say. You'll have to say your own goodbyes after supper tonight. Perhaps we'll hold a little wake after supper. Yes, that would be fitting. But the requirements of this war don't permit any of us the luxury for our personal grief or joys. I had to lie to many nobles of the kingdom about a state wedding, and my intended is not as happy about being married in the ashes of Crondor as she was at the thought of the king's palace. So we all make sacrifices. At supper, then, said Dash. You are dismissed, said the prince. The brothers bowed and left the prince's office. Do you believe that, said Jimmy. What, said Dash. That business about we all make sacrifices? Dash shrugged. It's just Patrick. He never knows when he's ahead and when he should just shut up. Jimmy laughed as they turned the corner toward their rooms. You've got that right. Probably why he was always such a bad card player. Perfect, said Nacor. Alita stood still, but she said, I feel silly. You look wonderful, said Nacor. The young woman stood on a box, a linen sheet around her head and shoulders, otherwise garbed in her normal dress. A sculptor worked furiously in clay, trying to capture her likeness. He had been at it for three days, and stepped back and said, It's finished. Nacor walked around it while Alita got off the box and came to look at it. Do I look like that? she asked. Yes, said Nacor. He continued to walk around it and finally said, Yes, that will do. Looking at the sculptor, he asked, How long will this take? How big do you want it? I want it life-sized. Pointing at Alita, he said, The same size as her. Then it will take a month for each one. Good. A month should be fine. Do you want me to bring them here? I want one delivered here and to be put up in the wagon yard. The other one bring to Crondor. Crondor? Mr. Avery didn't say anything about trucking a statue all the way to Crondor. Do you want to let wagoners put up your statue? The sculptor shrugged. Makes no difference to me, but it will cost extra. Nacor frowned. That's between you and Rue. The sculptor nodded and carefully wrapped up the clay reference piece in oilcloth and moved it to his wagon outside. Alita said, Am I done now? Nacor said, Probably not, but you don't need to pose any more. What is this all about? she asked, folding up the sheet she had worn. I felt very silly posing for that thing. It's a statue of the goddess. You used me? For a statue of the goddess? She seemed appalled. That's... Nacor looked puzzled. Something I don't understand, but it was the right choice. Brother Dominic had been in the corner observing the entire interaction, and he said, Child, trust me, this strange man knows things, things he doesn't understand. But if he knows them, they are true. The young woman looked as if that explanation caused her even more confusion. Dominic said, If Nacor said it's proper for you to pose for the representation of the goddess, then it is. Trust me on this. It's no blasphemy. The girl seemed more reassured by that and said, Well, I have washing to do. 
She left, and Dominic came over to Nacor and asked, What is it you see in that girl? Nacor shrugged. Something wonderful. Care to be more specific? No, said Nacor. Are you coming to Crondor with me? Dominic said, My instructions from the home temple are to accommodate your plans to the best of my ability. If that means accompanying you to Crondor, then I will go. Nacor said, That's good. Things here will continue to operate without me. Chopi can oversee the feeding of the hungry and teaching the children. He's already begun training disciples in the basics of being a monk. The Order of Dala is a good place to start, and that will weed out those looking for a free meal and warm bed from those who really want to contribute. When do we leave? asked Dominic. Nacor shrugged. In a day or two. The last detachments of the army will be leaving to journey to Crondor to join the prince, and we can tag along as escort. Dominic said, Very well. I will be ready. As Dominic left, Nacor turned and regarded Alita, who was hanging washing on a line across the courtyard. The sunlight struck her from behind, putting a golden nimbus of light around her head for a moment, as she stood on her tiptoes to clip the clothing to the line. Nacor grinned. Something very wonderful, he said to himself. Dinner was quiet. Conversation had been subdued throughout the evening. Mostly it had been sporadic. On this or that issue before the throne or a small remembrance of Lord Arutha. But long periods passed in silence. As the last course was removed, waiters appeared with trays upon which rested crystal goblets and decanters of brandy. Patrick said, As the sons of Lord Arutha are not permitted the relief of returning with their father to the capital for his funeral, I thought it appropriate to honor him with an informal wake. If you would be so kind, gentlemen, a word or two in remembrance would be appropriate. Lord Bryan, the Duke of Silden said, since boyhood, Arutha and I were friends. If I was to name the one quality of his, many, that I found most remarkable, it was his unrivaled clarity of thought. Whatever opinion he gave, on whatever subject, it was the distillation of a remarkable mind. He may have been the most gifted man I have known. Jimmy and Dash exchanged glances, for they had never considered what his peers might have thought of their father. The other nobles made their remarks, and last before the boys was Captain Subai. Not given to long speeches, he seemed uncomfortable, but nevertheless said, I think of the Duke as perhaps the wisest man I have known. He knew his limits, and yet was not afraid to challenge them. He put the welfare of others above his own. He loved his family. He will be missed. Subai looked at Jimmy, who said, He was named for a great man. Jimmy nodded toward Patrick, who acknowledged the reference to his grandfather. He was raised by a man who may be unique in our history. Yet he knew how to be himself. Looking at Patrick, he said, I think about being the grandson of Lord James of Crondor, perhaps because I was named for him. I rarely thought what it must have been like to be his son. Tears gathered in James's eyes as he said, I just wish I could have told him how much he meant to me. Dash said, I too. I think I may have taken him for granted. I hope I never make that mistake with anyone else who is dear to me. The prince stood, taking a glass from the servant. Others did as well. Jimmy and Dash each lifted a glass as the prince said, Lord Arutha. Everyone at supper, Lord Silden, Captain Subai, and the other nobles invited to Patrick's intimate dinner, echoed the toast and drank. Then Patrick said, The supper is now over, gentlemen. He withdrew from the hall, and the rest of the guests waited the appropriate time before themselves leaving the hall. James and Patrick left the hall a step behind Lord Silden and Captain Subai. They bid the other men good night and returned to their rooms. Jimmy was about to bid Dash good night when a page came running. Gentlemen, please, attend the prince at once. They hurried after the page, who led them back to the prince's office. 
Inside they found Patrick standing before his desk. His face was a red mask of rage, and in his fist he held a message that he had crushed. He held it out to Lord Silden, who unfolded and read it. His eyes widened. Gods, he said. Looking stricken, he said quietly, Lamut has fallen. Patrick said, A soldier escaped and made his way to L'Oreal, with half of Adawa's army behind him. He died after delivering the message. It came south by fast courier from there to Darkmoor, then to here. Lamut has been in enemy hands for three weeks now. Patrick spoke bitterly. We congratulated ourselves on the ease with which we took Sarth, and it was all a trade. He gave us back a fishing town, a port of no importance, and in exchange he took the heart of Yabon. Yabon city is now at grave peril, and we are no closer to retaking Illith than we were at first thaw. The prince looked close to being frantic. Suddenly Jimmy and Dash were painfully aware of how the absence of their father was being felt. They both glanced at Brian Silden, who stood silently, looking afraid to speak. Patrick finally said, I know, we must get word to Yabon. We must send word to Duke Carl to hold until we can get relief to him. What of L'Oreal? asked Jimmy. It holds, said Patrick, but we don't know for how long. Fadawa has massed a huge number of men outside the walls, and by this report the fighting is fierce. It may have fallen already. And the report says some sort of black magic is being directed at the defenders. Jimmy and Dash exchanged glances. All reports from the previous year's campaigns said the Pantathian serpent priests were gone, but they may have been premature in their assessment, and there was nothing to prevent the magic being the product of human magies. We must get word to my great-grandfather, said Jimmy. The magician, said Patrick. Where is he? He should still be in Elvendar if things are as he planned them. He will return to Stardock in another month's time. Captain Subai, said Patrick, can you get messengers to Yabon? It's difficult, Highness. We may be able to get one through the mountains to the north of L'Oreal. Perhaps reach some of the hillmen from Yabon. One of them could continue on to Elvendar. Patrick said, Subai, leave at first light for Darkmoor. Get whatever help you need and go north. I have no one else to spare for the task. Greylock and Von Darkmoor will press on until they reach the invaders' positions south of Illith. Jimmy, you will go south to Duco and apprise him of what we face. Crondor is now an empty shell and vulnerable. We must show a strong face to everyone. Dash, you must keep this city under control by whatever means. Now, Lord Silden, please stay and help me compose the orders. Gentlemen, the rest of you are dismissed. Outside the prince's quarters, Jimmy said, Captain Subai, if I pen a message to my great-grandfather, would you see he gets it along with the other communications? Of course, said the captain. I expect we'll both be at the city gate at first light tomorrow. Give it to me then, and I will have something for you. Until then, good night. Jimmy and Dash bid the captain good night, and Jimmy said, Well, Sheriff, help me compose a letter to great-grandfather. Dash said, Sheriff? With a sigh, he followed his brother. The dawn was still hours away, but the sky was lightening in the east as Dash stood next to his brother. Upon another horse sat Malar and Ares, the servant from the Vale of Dreams, who had somehow learned of Jimmy's journey. He had prevailed upon Jimmy to allow him to ride south with him, claiming that while work was plentiful in Crondor, payment wasn't and that his former master's business holdings along the Cassian border might still be operating. As the man was harmless company in the main, and often useful, Jimmy agreed. Captain Subai rode up with a company of his pathfinders and handed a canvas-wrapped bundle to Jimmy. This was your father's sword, Jimmy. I took it from him before they prepared his body to return it to Crondor. I knew, as elder son, it was to be yours. Jimmy took the bundle and unwrapped it. The hilt was worn, and the scabbard nicked and scratched, but the blade was immaculate. Jimmy drew the blade and saw the faint outlines of a miniature warhammer seemingly etched into the fort of the blade. He knew that this was where Mokros the Black had empowered the blade with a talisman from the abbot of Sarth Abbey, 
when Prince Arutha had to face the Morodal leader, Mermindamus. The sword had hung in a study in Crondor since the old prince's death, and had been sent by Duke James to his son. Now Jimmy held it. I don't know, said Jimmy. This should go to Patrick, or the king, I think. Subai shook his head. No. Had the prince of Crondor wished the sword to go to the king, it would have. He left it in Crondor for a reason. Jimmy held it reverently for a while, then unbuckled his own belt, handing his sword to Dash. He put his father's sword belt around his waist. Thank you. Dash came to stand next to Captain Subai and said, Would you see the courier who you're sending to Elvendar carries this message to our great-grandfather, please? Subai took the letter and placed it inside his tunic. I am that courier. I personally will lead the pathfinders who travel to Yabon and on to Elvendar. Thank you, said Dash. Subai said, If we don't chance to meet again, young Jimmy, it has been an honor. Jimmy said, Safe travel, Captain. The pathfinders rode out the gate, heading east at a relaxed trot. Jimmy looked at his brother. Stay safe, little brother. Dash reached up to shake Jimmy's hand. You travel safely too, big brother. I don't know how long it will be before we see one another, but... You will be missed. Jimmy nodded. Letters to Mother and the rest of the family are in the pouch bound for Illinon. When I know where I'm likely to be, I'll send word. Dash waved as Jimmy and his company rode out the gate, then turned around to head back into the castle. He had a meeting in an hour with the Prince, Lord Brian, and others in the castle. After that, he had to begin the process of bringing law and order to Crondor, while Jimmy rode south to Port Vicor. Fifteen. Betrayal. Jimmy halted. The escort stopped behind him. The captain of the company of Patrick's Royal Household Guards said, This is as far as we're supposed to go, my lord. He glanced around. Leave it to those... Captain? I mean no disrespect to Lord Duke, my lord, but after all, we were fighting him and those miserable bastards he calls soldiers just last year. He noted Jimmy's disapproving expression and said, Anyway, they should be here making a camp before they start back to their patrol. Maybe they ran into some trouble. Possible, my lord. They were at a fork in the road, the agreed-upon southern limit of Crondorian patrols. Everything to the south was Duco's responsibility. The southwest fork in the road led to Port Vicor, while the southeast fork would start around the edge of Shandon Bay eventually leading toward Land's End. Jimmy said, We'll be fine, Captain. We're halfway to Port Vicor and should be running into Lord Duco's patrols any time now. If they are not here today, they'll be here tomorrow, I'm sure. I'd still feel better if you'd wait here until one shows up, my lord. We could linger here for another half day or so. Thanks, but no, Captain. The sooner I get to Port Vicor, the sooner I can be about the Prince's business. We'll continue along the southwest road until sundown. Then we'll camp. If Duco's patrol doesn't show up to escort us tomorrow, we'll find our way to Port Vicor alone. Very well, my lord. May the gods watch over you. And you too, Captain. They parted company with the Crondorian patrol, who turned northward, while Jimmy and Malar continued southwest. They rode through quiet countryside, scrub grass and what once might have been farmland, but which had known the tread of the conqueror's boot too often... Keshians on their way to the kingdom, and kingdom soldiers on their way to Kesh, had turned these rolling hills and sparse woodlands into a no-man's land in the last hundred years. The rich lands of the Vale of Dreams to the east kept farmers and their families struggling despite the constant threat of war between two nations rolling over them. The lands through which Jimmy and Malar rode offered no such bounty. They might be the only two men for fifty miles in any direction. As the sun sank low in the western sky, Malar asked, What shall we do now, my lord? Jimmy looked around and pointed to a small dell near a clear running stream. Make camp for the night. Tomorrow we'll continue toward Port Vicor. Malar had unsaddled the horses and brushed them down. Jimmy had discovered he was a competent enough groom, along with his other talents. Jimmy said, You feed the horses and I'll gather some firewood. Malar said, Yes, my lord. Jimmy moved around the campsite, finding enough small branches and sticks to make a reasonable fire. 
After the fire was ready, Mallar set about making an acceptable meal. Hot trail biscuits, a mix of dried beef and vegetables chopped and mixed into a pot of rice, to which he added spices, which made it quite flavorful. Mallar produced a ceramic bottle of wine from Darkmoor. He even had a pair of cups. As they ate, Jimmy said, Port Vicor is a bit out of the way for you. If you're up to the risk, you may have that horse and ride on to the east. You're still north of the frontier and should be able to reach the Vale safely. Mallar shrugged. I will reach the Vale eventually, my lord. My master is almost certainly dead. But perhaps his family has conspired to keep his business afloat, and I can be of use to them. But I would rather spend a little more time in your company. The fierceness of your blade makes me more comfortable on the road than I would be alone. You managed well enough for those winter months you wandered in the wilderness. Of necessity, but not by choice. And most of that time was spent starving and hiding. Jimmy nodded. He ate his meal and sipped his wine. Is this off? he asked. Mallar sipped his wine. Not that I can tell you, young lord. Jimmy shrugged. It's odd for this type of wine. Something metallic. Mallar took another sip. Not that I can notice, sir. Perhaps you are just getting an odd aftertaste from the food. Maybe with the next drink it will taste differently. Jimmy sipped again and swallowed. No, it's definitely off. He set the cup aside. I think some water would be better. Mallar started to stand, and Jimmy said, I'll get it. He started walking toward the creek and suddenly felt a wave of dizziness. He turned and looked to where the horses were tied. The horse seemed to be moving away from him, and then he felt as if he stepped into a hole, for he was now a great deal closer to the ground than before. He looked down and saw that he was on his knees, and as he tried to stand, his head swam. He fell hard to the ground and rolled over on his back. The face of Malar and Ares moved into his view and from a great distance said, I believe the wine was off, young Lord James. The features of the man moved out of view and Jimmy tried to follow him. Jimmy rolled over and lying with his head on his arm, he could see Malar move to Jimmy's horse and open the pouches with all his messages to Duke Duco. He glanced at several of them, nodded and put them back into the pouch. Jimmy felt his legs getting cold and felt a distant stab of panic. His thinking was growing foggy, and he couldn't remember what it was he was supposed to do. His throat was tightening, and his breathing was growing labored. Jimmy tried to force open his mouth with his left hand, which now felt as if he were wearing huge gloves. Dull sensations reached his brain, and suddenly he gagged on his own fingers, vomit rushing up through his mouth and nose. He gasped and choked, spat and groaned aloud. His body racked with pain as he felt his stomach heave again. Malar's voice came from a great distance away. It's a pity such a fair young lord has to come to such a messy and undignified end. But such are the necessities of war. Somewhere in a dim evening, Jimmy heard a horse riding away, and then he was hit by another agonizing cramp, and everything faded from view. Dash looked across the faces of the men who had been recruited. Some were ex-soldiers, gray-haired men who remembered how to handle a sword. Others were street tops, men who were just as likely to be brawling in a tavern as trying to keep the peace in the city. A few were mercenaries, looking for steady work, men who were clearly kingdom citizens and who were not known criminals. We're presently under martial law in Crondor which means just about any violation of the law is a hanging offense. The men looked at one another, some nodding. Dash continued, This will start to change as of today. You are the first company of the new City Watch. You will be instructed in what that means in greater detail as we go, but unfortunately we have no time to educate you before we begin. So I will make a few things clear to you all. He held up a red armband, upon which a rough coat of arms, which looked like the prince's, had been sewn. You'll wear this at all times when on duty. It's what marks you as the prince's men. You break ahead while wearing this, you're restoring order. 
You break ahead without it, and you're another thug I'll see behind bars. Is that clear? The men nodded and grunted agreement. I'll make this simple. This armed man doesn't give you the right to bully, to settle old grudges, or to annoy the women in the town. Any man here who is convicted of assault, rape, or theft while wearing this will be hanged. Is that clear? The men were silent a moment, and a few nodded they understood. Is that clear? Dash repeated, and the men were more vocal in acknowledging the question. Now, until we can recruit a full-blown city watch, the routine will be a half day on, then a half day off. One day in five, you'll work around the clock, while the other half will get the day to themselves. If you know any men of arms-bearing age who can be recruited and can be trusted, send them to see me. Using a chopping motion, he split the forty men in the room in half. You, he said to the men on his right, are the day watch. You, he said to the men on his left, are the night watch. Get me another twenty good men and we'll go to three watches. The men nodded. Dash said, Now, headquarters will be here in the palace until we can get the city courts and jail rebuilt. The prison here is the only one we have. We don't have a lot of room, so I don't want it filled with drunks and brawlers. If you have to break up a fight, send them home with a kick in the butt. But if you have to bring them in, don't be shy. I'd assume that if someone is stupid enough to not take a chance to get off with a warning, they need to talk to a judge. We're going to lift curfew at the old town market. People are using it to trade now as the rest of the city rebuilds, and it's starting to be a trouble spot. But if we're going to have trouble, I want it in one place, not all over the city. So, pass the word. The market is open from sunset to midnight now. The rest of the city is still under curfew unless the person is on their way home from the market. And they better have the goods or gold to show they've been trading. Anyone causes you trouble? Deal with it. We don't have enough swords to get you out of trouble if you get in over your head. He looked around the room at the faces of the men he now commanded and said, If you're killed, I promise we'll avenge you. One of the men said, That's comforting. And the others laughed. I'll lead the first of you down to the market. You lot on the night shift, turn in. You're going to patrol the entire city, and if you see anyone outside the market after dark, bring them in for questioning. For today, anyone asks, you tell them you're the prince's law. Let's get the word out that order is returning to Crondor. Now let's go. The twenty men on the day shift rose and followed Dash outside the room. He moved through the large courtyard of the palace to the newly restored drawbridge over the still dry moat. Some of the water system was still under repair, and the palace wouldn't be isolated from the city by the moat again for a few more weeks. As they crossed the drawbridge, Dash said, If no one causes any trouble and forces you to haul them back to the jail, I want you to keep moving. I want you every place you can reasonably reach. I want the citizens seeing lots of those red armbands. Let them think we've got a dozen men for each one of you. If anyone asks, you don't know how many watchmen there are, just lots of them. The men nodded, and as they walked toward the market square, Dash began splitting off pairs of constables and sending them along different routes, directing their activities for the first day of his new responsibility. More than once he silently cursed Patrick for his choice. Dash was down to four men when he reached the market square of Crondor. Shortly after the original keep of the castle had been built, when the first prince of Crondor had declared this city the capital of the western realm of the kingdom of the Isles, the traders and local fishermen and farmers who lived in the region began regularly gathering in this market to trade, barter, and sell their wares. Over the years, the city had grown, developed, and evolved to the point where the vast majority of trade was conducted by businessmen in all quarters of the city. But the ancient market square endured, and it was the first place for the reviving city to find its financial soul. It was thronging with men and women of all stations— Merchants, nobles, fishermen, farmers, traders, peddlers, whores, beggars, thieves, and vagabonds. Several people cast a wary eye at the five men, for while there were swordsmen here or there, the majority of soldiers had departed the city with Duco heading south, or with the armies of the west heading north. Only the prince's royal household guard remained, and they remained in the palace. A short distance from where they had entered... Dash spied a familiar face. Luis de Savona was unloading a wagon, 
helped by a woman who turned out to a surprised Dash to be Rue Avery's wife, Carly. Dash turned to his men and said, Start wandering through the crowd, but unless you see a murder in progress, just keep looking. The men spread out, and Dash crossed to where Luis and Carly were unloading the wagon. A local trader was watching closely as Luis handed down boxes of freight to the trader's boy. Dash said, Mrs. Avery, Luis, how are you? Luis looked over and smiled. Dash, it's good to see you. When did you arrive in Crondor? Very early this morning, replied Luis. They shook hands, and Carly said, I was very sorry to hear about your father. I still remember the day I first met him at our house. She glanced over in the general direction of where their town house had once stood, across the street from Barrett's coffee house, now a burned-out husk of a building. He was very kind to Rue and me. Dash said, Thank you. It's very difficult, but... Well, you've lost your father, so you know. She nodded. Luis fingered the armband and said, What is this? I'm the new sheriff of Crondor, and it falls to me to uphold the prince's peace in the city. Luis smiled. You'd be better off coming back to work for Rue. You'd lose your noble office, but you'd make a great deal more money with far less work. Dash laughed. Probably you're right. But as it is, we're very short-handed, and Prince Patrick needs all of us pulling our weight. He glanced at the freight. Goods from Darkmoor? No, said Luis. We unloaded our cargo from Darkmoor when we got in early this morning. These are from the far coast, actually. The ships still can't get into the harbor, but they're anchoring off of Fishtown, and we're ferrying the goods ashore with fishing boats. Carly asked, How is your brother? He's fine. He's running an errand for Patrick. He should be halfway to Port Vicor about now. Luis finished unloading the cargo and said, Give us a minute, then I'll buy us an ale. That would be welcome, Luis. Carly counted out the gold the merchant gave him under the watchful eye of the merchant's bodyguard, and then said, Luis, we can't get young Dash drunk, so maybe we should get him to share a bite. She looked at Dash. Hungry? Dash said, Actually, I am. They walked across the market to an open-air kitchen, where hot meat pies were being sold. Carly purchased three, then they moved to an ale wagon, where Luis got three jacks of cold brew for them. Like most of those eating in the market, they stood and made do with keeping out of the way of those walking through the aisle. Louis said, I was only partly joking. I could use someone of your talents. Things are beginning to turn around, and men of talent are going to get rich. He motioned with his bad hand while juggling the hot pie with his good one. Since Helen and I married, Rue has made me manager of all Avery and Jacoby business while he's gone. Carly said, It's Avery and de Savon now. Helen insisted. Louis smiled slightly. It wasn't my idea. He put down the pie and picked up the pewter jack of ale. After he took a drink, he said, I am so busy I don't know what I need to do next. The wagon builders in Darkmoor are getting our freight business back to where it was before the destruction of the city, and the orders for cargo are starting to come in. What about the other businesses that Rue held? Louis shrugged. I'm in charge of the Avery and the Savon business. Most of the other was Bitter Sea Company. Rue hasn't said much. I get the feeling most of that is gone with the destruction of the city. I know he had some holdings in the east, but I think he's borrowed a great deal to get this enterprise underway. I know much about his business, but there is more that I don't know. He looked at Carly. Rue has told me most everything about his business interests, said Carly, except some things to do with the crown. I think the kingdom owes Rue a large debt. No doubt, said Dash. My grandfather got several very sizable loans from the Bitter Sea Company. Dash looked around. While I suspect they will eventually be paid, as you can see, the kingdom has a great deal to repair here before debts are settled. He finished his pie. With a long pull, he drained the jack of ale and said, I thank you for the meal. Before he could say more, a shout from the next aisle caused him to turn. Thief! Dash was off, hurrying toward the source of the disturbance. He rounded the corner and saw a man running right at him, looking over his shoulder to see who was behind. Dash braced himself, and as the man turned to look ahead, Dash struck him hard across the chest with an extended arm. 
As Dash expected, the man's feet went right out from under him, and he fell hard upon the ground. Dash knelt his sword across the man's throat before he could regain his wits, and said, "'In a hurry?' The man started to move, but at the gentle pressure of the blade against his neck he relaxed. "'Not any more,' he said with a grimace. Two of Dash's constables appeared, and Dash said, "'Take him to the palace.' Dash stood as they hoisted the thief to his feet and took him away. Dash moved to where Luis and Carly were finishing their meal and said, I'm going to borrow your wagon a moment. He moved to where the Avery and the Savon wagon was tied and mounted it. He stood up on the driver's seat and shouted, My name is Dashel Jameson. I am the new sheriff of Crondor. The men you see wearing red armbands like mine are my constables. Pass the word that the law is returning to Crondor. Several merchants gave a weak cheer, but the majority of those gathered in the quarter seemed indifferent, or openly contemptuous. Dash returned to where Carly and Louise stood. Well, I think that went rather well, don't you? Carly laughed, and Louise said, There are many here in the square who would just as soon not see any return of law to the city. Dash said, and I think I just spotted another of them. Excuse me, he said, darting into the crowd after a youngster he saw stealing a trinket from a distracted merchant. Carly and Luis watched him until after he vanished into the press, and Carly said, I always liked that young man. Luis said, There's a great deal of his grandfather in him. He's a charming rogue. Carly said, Don't call him that. He has far too deep a sense of duty to be a rogue. Luis said, I stand corrected. You are, of course, right. Carly laughed. Helen has you trained well, doesn't she? Louise laughed in return. It was easy. I would never wish to make her unhappy. Scant chance of that, said Carly. Well, we have another load waiting at the docks. Let's go get it. As Louise mounted the wagon, Carly put her hand on her lower back and stretched. I won't be doing this much longer. I hope Rue finished up his business to the north and gets back soon. Luis nodded agreement as she climbed the wagon. Then he flicked the reins, getting the horses headed toward the harbor. Lord Vesarius glanced to his left and said, Have you come to mock me, Avery? Not in the least, my Lord Vesarius. I came out to enjoy the night air, as did you. The defeated Quiggin noble looked at his former business associate and current enemy. Your captain has been almost gracious in allowing me some liberty from that cabin. As is befitting your rank. Had our positions been reversed, I suspect I would be below decks on a Quiggin ship, pulling against an oar. As is befitting your rank, replied Vesarius. Rue laughed. You haven't entirely lost your sense of humor, I see. I wasn't joking, Vesarius answered flatly. Rue's smile faded. Well, as fate would have it, you will enjoy a far less dire fate than I would have, it seems. I would have had you killed, said Vesarius. No doubt, Rue was silent a moment, then said, My prince is almost certain to return you to Quegg by the first free city ship heading there as he has no desire to further antagonize your emperor. It seems to me we have this opportunity to reach an accommodation. Vesarius turned to face Rue. Accommodation? To what purpose? You've won. I am close to ruin. My last copper piece was tied up in those ships and the cargo we sold to Fadawa. It's now at the bottom of the sea, and I can't see how you can be of any help to me, considering you were the one who sank my treasure. Rue shrugged. Strictly speaking, you sank the treasure. I was merely trying to steal it. In any event, that wealth was stripped from the citizens of the kingdom, and perhaps some from those living across the sea. I can't feel much sympathy for you losing that fortune, if you can see my point. Barely. But it's entirely academic now, isn't it? Not necessarily, said Rue. If you're proposing something, propose. I had nothing to do with your greed, Vesarius. If you had been anything near cautious, you wouldn't have dispatched your entire fleet to the Straits of Darkness on the strength of a rumor. Vesarius laughed. Of course it was a rumor you spread. Of course, said Rue. 
But any decent investigation might have made you reconsider the plan. Your Lord James was far too clever by half. I'm sure, had I checked, I would have found more rumors to support the story of a vast treasure fleet coming from across the endless sea. Rue said, There is that. James had the most facile mind I've ever encountered. But that's not the point. The point is, you have something to gain, as do I. And we need to agree to that before we reach Condor. What is that? The price of my life. Vesarius studied Rue for a long moment, then said, Shayon, I was taking that treasure ship of yours to Klondor. I would have sent the ship back to you, for I would not be counted a pirate, but the gold was taken from the kingdom and was to be returned to the kingdom. He smiled. As it happens, the crown is in debt to me, considerable debt, Then I suspect I would have accounted much of that treasure to that debt. So, in a sense... It was more my treasure than yours. Vasaria said, Avery, your logic astonishes me. Thank you. It wasn't a compliment. Besides, the treasure resides below a great deal of ocean at the moment. Ah, but I know how to get it, said Rue. Vasarius's eyes narrowed. He said, And you'll need me to get it? No, actually, I don't need you at all. In fact, unless you have access to certain magicians, you're of no use to me. I can locate members of the Wreckers Guild of Krondor. They're actively clearing the harbor right now. But the prince will let me borrow some for a small commission. So then, why tell me this? Because here's my offer. I will take what I raise from the ocean's floor. I will need to give one part in ten to the Crown for interrupting their clearing of the harbor, and I will be forced to account the rest toward the debt of the Crown, I am certain, and I will have to pay the Guild's fee. But I am willing to divide what remains equally and ship that half to Quegg. In exchange for what? For you not engaging the services of a highly trained assassin as soon as you return to Quegg. That is all. More, a vow that you will never attempt to harm me or my family, nor will you idly allow anyone over whom you have influence in Quegg to trouble us. Vesarius was silent for a very long time, and Rue resisted the impulse to speak. Finally, the Quegg and noble said, If you can do this, and account to me half the money you raise, less the prince's cut and the guild's fee, then I will agree to seek no further reprisals against you or your family. The night air was cooling, and Rue hugged himself. That takes a great load off my mind. Is there anything else? asked Vesarius. One suggestion, said Rue. What? Consider that when this war with Fadawa's invaders is over, there will be many opportunities for profit but not if a war erupts between Quegg and the kingdom. Both sides have suffered from the invaders' intrusion into the bitter sea, and more war would bleed us all white. Agreed, said Vesarius. We are not ready to fight a war. That's not the point. The point is, when you're ready to fight one, it still does neither side any good. That is for us to decide, said the Quiggin. Well, if you don't see it my way, at least consider this. There is going to be a great deal of profit in rebuilding the entire bitter sea after the war with Fatawa is finished, and those who aren't fighting are going to be able to reap most of it. I could use associates in many of the undertakings I'll be contemplating. You have the effrontery to suggest an association, after I made that terrible mistake once already? No, but if you should some day choose to make it, I will listen. Vesarius said, I have heard enough. I will return to my cabin. Think on this, then, my lord, said Rue, as the Quaggan walked away. There will be a great many men needing transport across the sea to Novendus, and there are few ships able to carry them. The fees for such transport will not be trivial. Vesarius paused the briefest instant, 
then continued walking until he disappeared down the ladder to the main deck and the cabins below. Rue turned and looked out at the star-filled night, watching the white caps on the water. I've got him, he whispered to himself. Jimmy felt as if someone had kicked in his ribs. It hurt to breathe, and someone was tugging at his collar. A distant voice said, Drink this. Something wet touched his lips, and he felt cool water fill his mouth, and he drank reflexively. Suddenly his stomach nodded, and he spewed forth the water, convulsing as strong hands held him. His eyes were stuck shut. His head rang, and his back felt as if his spine had been hammered by a mace. His trousers were fouled with his own excrement. Again water was forced between his lips, and a voice in his ear said, Sip slowly. Jimmy let the water trickle slowly down his throat, a few drops at a time, and this time his stomach accepted the bounty. Other hands picked him up and moved him. He passed out. Some time later he woke up again and found that a half-dozen armed men had set up a camp. One sat nearby and said, Do you feel up to drinking some more water? Jimmy nodded, and the man brought him a cup of water. Jimmy drank and suddenly was terribly thirsty. He drank more, and after the third cup, the man took away the water skin, saying, No more. For a while, at least. Jimmy said, Who are you? His voice sounded dry and distant, as if it was being used by a stranger. My name is Captain Zongti. I recognize you. You're the one called Baron James. Jimmy sat up and said, it's Earl James now. I got a new office. He glanced around and saw the sun was rising in the east. How long? We found you an hour after sunset. We had been preparing to make camp a short distance from here, and as is my practice, I had a rider sweep the perimeter. We saw your campfire. When we rode over to investigate, we found you lying there. There was no blood, so we thought you might have sickened on food. I was poisoned, said Jimmy, in wine. I drank little. The captain, a round-faced man with a short beard, said, A fine pallet. It saved your life. Malar wasn't trying very hard to kill me. He could have cut my throat easily enough. Perhaps, said the captain, or he could have fled against our arrival. He may have been gone only minutes before we arrived. He could have heard us before we saw him, I don't know. James nodded, then wished he hadn't. His head swam. My horse? There are no horses here. You, your bedroll, a low-burning fire, and that empty cup you held. That was all that was here. Jimmy held out his hand. Get me to my feet. You should rest. Captain, Jimmy ordered, help me stand. The captain did as he was bid, and when Jimmy stood, he asked, Have you some extra clothing you can spare? Alas, no said the captain. We are but three days from Port Vicor and ready to return. Three days, Jimmy said. He said nothing a moment, then said, Help me walk to the creek. May I inquire why? asked the captain. Because I need to bathe and wash my clothing. The captain said, I understand, but we would do well to return to Port Vicor as quickly as possible, so you may recover in comfort. No because after I bathe, I have other business. Sir? I need to find someone, said Jimmy, as he looked down the southeastern road, and then I need to kill him. Sixteen. Deception. Eric frowned. Owen swore. We were taken like bumpkins at the fair. Subai, still covered with road dirt and exhausted from days of non-stop riding, said, Patrick was correct. They let us have Sarth, and while they were taking Lamut, they built that. That was an impressive series of earthen barricades running from a steep hillside that was impossible to scale by anything less sure-footed than a mountain goat down to the cliffs overlooking the sea. The woods for almost a thousand yards had been cleared, with low stumps left to confound any attempt at organizing a cavalry charge. 
The only break in the structure was a huge wooden gate across the King's Highway, easily as big as the northern city gates in Crondor. The first hundred yards rolled down to a tiny creek which crossed the roadway, and from that point to the barricade the terrain rose steeply. To charge that position would be to invite serious casualties, and any attempt at wheeling a ram would be undercut by the need to force the device uphill. The breastwork was built up to six feet in height, and as Eric could see helmets reflecting the sun behind it, he assumed steps had been built up behind so that archers could fire down upon anyone charging up the slope. Eric counted. I see at least a dozen catapults back there. Subai said, That's a nasty piece of work. Greylock was forced to agree. Let's talk about this. They moved away from the forward position, past the arrayed companies of kingdom soldiers ready to attack if the order was given. In a clearing a hundred yards behind the front lines, they gathered. Owen said, I don't see any easy way through that. Eric said, Agreed. But what has me worried is how many more positions like that we may face as we travel up the coast to Quester's view. Owen said, We might ask our guest. He indicated a position to the rear where General Norton and some other key captains of Fadawa's army were being guarded. Most of the captives from Sarth were still under guard in that town, but the officers were accompanying Greylock's command company. Owen and the others walked over toward a pavilion being erected for the officers and waved the guards near Norton to bring him over. Norton reached the tent just as table and chairs were being placed for Greylock to sit. He did so, letting Eric and the very tired Subai also sit. But he kept Norton standing. Now, Greylock said, how many of these defensive positions can we expect between here and Quester's view? Norton shrugged. I do not know. Fadawa did not see fit to keep me informed of what was occurring behind my lines. He glanced around. If he had, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you, Marshal. I would be over there behind the breastwork. Sold you out, did he? asked Eric. Unless he has some masterful plan to swoop down on the back of a dragon and carry me back to Illith. Apparently. Duco told us Fadawa feared rivals for command of the army. Norton nodded. I was sent to South to watch Duco more than I was to achieve any sort of secondary defense here in the South. He glanced around. May I sit? Owen waved for a chair to be brought over, and when it was, Norden sat. Once the assault on Crondor was underway, I was going to ride down, watch a bit of the battle, ride north, and make a decision on fortifying the town or withdrawing north. You neglected to assault Crondor, so of course I never got to make that decision. Lord Duca thought a change in allegiance seemed propitious, said Subai. Without his cooperation, we never would have taken Sarth so easily. Lord Duca, said Norton, as if weighing the sound of it. He is now a kingdom man, then? That he is. He has command of our southern border with great cash, replied Greylock. Would it be possible, asked Norton, for another such accommodation to be made? Owen laughed. Duco had an army and a city to offer. What do you bring to the table? Norton said, I was afraid it would be something like that. Well, said Eric, if you think those on the other side of the barricade would surrender on your word, we might be able to find sufficient incentive to make your future here more pleasant. Von Darkmoor, isn't it? asked Norton. Eric nodded. You know me? We were looking for you long enough when your Captain Callus took his crimson eagles and turned renegade. We knew of the one who looked like a long-lived, and we knew of the big young blonde sergeant who fought like a demon. The Emerald Queen may have been a servant of darkness, but she had clever men among her officers. Norton grew reflective. Cahil was one of her men, yet he managed to insinuate himself into Fadawa's trust. I am Fadawa's oldest companion. We looked at Eric. You served with us long enough to know how our ways differ from yours. A prince is an employer, no more worthy of loyalty than a merchant. To a hired sword, he is but a merchant with more gold. 
Fadawa and I began as boys from nearby villages in the Westlands. We joined Jamagra's Iron Fists and started fighting. For years we served together, and when Fadawa started his own company, I was his sub-captain. When he became a general, I was his second-in-command. When he met the woman known as the Emerald Queen and swore dark oath to her, I went along. Subai looked at Eric, who nodded, and said, I think we need to know of this man, Kahil. Norden said, He was one of her captains. We met him when she sent for Fadawa and arranged for him to take command of her forces. I thought it strange that she would seek us out when she already had commanders. But the money was good, and she proposed conquests that would do nothing but make us rich beyond imagining. Cahill specialized in sneaking inside of cities before we attacked them, gathering information and sowing discord among the populace. He spent more time with the Emerald Queen than anyone save Fadawa, and those men she called her immortals, the men who willingly died in her bed to feed her hunger. You knew of that? asked Eric. You hear things. You try to ignore anything that distracts you from the task at hand. I was her sworn captain, and until I either was released from duty, captured or killed, I would not betray her. Understood, said Eric. When the chaos around Crondor revealed that we had been somehow tricked by a demonic creature, and that the Emerald Queen was no longer our true mistress, we were left to fend for ourselves. Fatawa is an ambitious man. Cahil is also an ambitious man. I suspect it was he who proposed to Fadawa that my fate be much the same as Duco's. I was led to believe that we would keep a soft center in Sarth, with a thousand men secreted in the lower halls of the abbey. When your army was safely up the road, I was to ride out and strike from behind, while Fadawa was rolling your army south along the coast. Bitterly, he said, I never got the men. I should have known that the third time twenty men showed up when I expected two hundred. Instead, I got a long visit from Cahil, who inspected the abbey and told me all was going according to plan. I got less than four hundred men in total, most of them of questionable skills. Owen said, We'll have to decide what to do with you later, General. For the moment, I have the problem of getting up north and getting the Duchy of Yabon back for my king. Norden stood. I understand, Marshal. I will, by force of circumstances, await your pleasure. Greylock signaled to a guard to return the captive general to the company of the other officers. After he was out of hearing range, Owen said, He said one thing that disturbs me. What? asked Eric. That remark he attributed to this Cahill. All was going according to plan. Subai said, I came up through the basement of the abbey. I saw nothing we need to fear. I don't think he meant the abbey, said Owen. I think he meant some larger scheme that Fadawa is hatching. Eric said, All of which we will learn in due time. Owen pointed his finger at his old friend. That's what has me fearful. He pointed at the tabletop. He motioned for food to be brought, and servants hurried to comply. To one of the junior officers standing nearby, he said, let me know when all the commanders report their units are in place. Eric was silent a moment, then said, We could hit them at night. At night? asked Subai. Eric's tone indicated he didn't strongly advocate the idea, but was rather just speculating. If we could get close to the barricade before they spotted our advance units, perhaps we could force a breach before they started doing too much damage with those catapults and archery fire. Owen was dubious. I think we do this the traditional way. Order camp and tell the men to rest. At first light we assemble, we march out and stand in ranks. I'll ride forward with Eric and ask for surrender, and when they say no, we'll attack. Eric sighed. I wish I could think of something very clever. Sabai, can you see any way to get some of our soldiers around the hillside end of the barricade? A few, maybe, answered the captain, but not enough to do more than get them all killed when they were discovered. If my pathfinders were to do it, 
we could get up there and be in position before we were discovered, I'm certain. But you have to be on your way north carrying messages, said Owen. No, gentlemen, this time we must walk up and kick down the door. See to your men. Eric stood up. I'll inspect the deployment. Owen motioned for Eric to stay, and when the other officers were gone, he said, Can you get some men on the beach below those cliffs? I can get them down to the beach, but I don't know if I can get them up the cliffs, said Eric. Then you'd better get down there and see before you lose the daylight. If you can get a squad up those cliffs and over the top before they see you coming, you could spring that gate from the inside. Eric considered it. It is closer to the cliffside than the hillside by a hundred yards or so, isn't it? Think you can do it? Eric said, Let me go down and take a look. I'll be back as soon as possible. He heaved himself out of the chair and moved to where his crimson eagles were camped. Jono! he shouted. Bring a squad! The large lieutenant and a sergeant named Hudson fell in almost instantly, and by the time Eric had moved to where the horses were picketed, he had a dozen other men hurrying along to catch up. The horses were saddled and ready to ride in minutes, and Eric formed up his squad. He glanced around, astonished at how well the army was being encamped. The move from Sarth northward had been at a forced march, and the quartermasters had been pressed to their limit to get provisions together and underway on short notice. Yet here was the bulk of the armies of the West, nearly 8,000 men under arms in the van, with another 10,000 less than a week behind, moving into locations preselected by Owen's staff. Logistics were still more an abstract concept to Eric than a real one. His time on the road had been in Callus' small companies in Novendus, or in defensive positions in Crondor and Darkmoor. This was his first experience having responsibility for large numbers of men on the march. The dust was almost overwhelming from the thousands of men, wagons, and horses moving along both sides of the road. He knew he could ride freely down the cliffs to the coast, and no enemy spotter would be able to see anything that would give away his inspection of the beach area. He found the path leading down to a cove a mile behind the lines, and led the patrol downward. The road narrowed as it wound down to the beach, so they rode single file. They halted while Eric looked up and down the coast. He turned to the men Jado had gathered and said, Any good swimmers here? Two of the men held up their hands, and Eric grinned at Jado. Oh, no, man. Not since we had to swim that river to get the Mahata. Eric jumped down and began removing his armor. This time we won't have to wear eighty pounds of iron. Jado dismounted and, muttering curses, also started stripping off his armor. The two men who had volunteered were soon standing next to Eric and Jado, all wearing only their under-tunics and leggings. Eric said, We swim in pairs. This current looks rough, and be wary of the rocks. He led the men as far along the beach as they could go before encountering the finger of cliff that extended into the rocks. Wading out into the surf, he turned and said, It's safer to swim, I think, than to risk wading through the surf as it pounds those rocks. The men followed, and Eric led them out until the waves started to break. He dove under a breaking wave and came up behind it. He struck out away from the beach, and when the water was merely surging back and forth, turned on a course that ran along the beach. The water was cold, despite the time of the year, and the going difficult, but after a few minutes Eric saw that he had left his partner behind. He waited and let the man catch up, then started swimming again. They drew even with the first of a series of small coves, and stopped, letting the others catch up and tread water a moment. He said, We need to swim about another mile, then head in. He pointed. The beach seems to open up over there. Jado said, I can't tell. All I see is breaking surf and rocks. Well, avoid the rocks, said Eric, sitting out again with powerful strokes. He led them around a second point of land and toward more rocks. He stopped and pointed. There, a section of open beach. He swam straight in toward the breakers, catching one to ride in, and stood up in knee-deep water. He looked around and saw the other three men also riding waves in, though Jotto seemed to have swallowed a fair amount of water on the way. Eric glanced up to the cliffs. He motioned and said, I think we're between our lines and theirs. Looking up and down the coast, he said, It's difficult to tell. After a moment to catch his breath, he continued, Come on, 
We're going to have our work cut out for us to get back before dark. Jado groaned. What? asked Eric. Man, I just didn't even think. We've got to swim back, don't we? Eric and the other men laughed. Unless you want to stay down here. As Eric started off at a trot up the beach, Jado said, I'm thinking a beach life might be the thing. I could fish, make a hut, you know. Eric grinned. You'd get bored. They hurried along the base of the cliffs. Eric looking up from time to time. They found a long, winding beach, a series of tidal pools, and some large outcroppings of rocks. But Eric was at last convinced they were a safe distance behind the enemy fortification without being seen. He looked upward and asked, Jaro, what do you think about climbing that cliff? Jaro looked upward and finally said, Not much. Can it be done? Possibly, but it's a job for the Pathfinders. They are very good at that sort of thing. The Pathfinders are going around the eastern end of the line, up the hills and north. Subai's got messages to get to Yabon. Well, then, do we have anyone else in camp who might be foolish enough to swim over here and climb those rocks for a little hand-to-hand -hand mayhem? Eric looked at Jado, then said, I think I may have just the lot. Owen said, Let me get this straight. You want me only to hit them with probing attacks tomorrow? Eric pointed along the line of defense freshly drawn on Owen's map. We're going to bleed if we storm that wall. We can put that off a day or two longer. But if I can get up over the cliff, open the gate so you can get inside, we can shorten this attack by days, and we'll save a lot of men's lives. But if you don't get to the gate, you're going to get yourself chopped up, said Owen. Eric said, Last time I looked, no one promised a soldier he would live forever. Owen closed his eyes, then said, Life used to be much easier when you were shoeing horses and I was teaching Otto's other sons how to hold a sword. Eric sat down and said, I won't argue that. Owen said, So, who are you taking with you? Climbing those cliffs will be dangerous, or am I stating the obvious? You are, said Eric with a smile. He took a mug of wine offered him by an orderly, then said, Aki and his Hadatis just showed up this morning. They're the best climbers we have. Owen nodded approval. That they are. And a handy bunch with a sword, as I recall. Very. Well, I was going to send them along the ridge route, but if I give Subai all the pathfinders, he stands a better chance of getting through to Yabon. I haven't read the rolls of the Fallen. How many pathfinders have we left? Too few. We have too few of everyone, said Owen. We lost more men of quality at Darkmoor and Nightmare Ridge than the gods should fairly ask of us. We are moving with the heart of the Army of the West, and if we fall, there's nothing left. He sighed. Subai has fourteen pathfinders left in his entire command. Fourteen? Eric shook his head, and his expression was one of regret. He had over a hundred before the war. Those trackers and scouts are rare men, said Owen. You don't train them overnight like your band of cutthroats. Eric smiled. My cutthroats have proven themselves more times than any other unit in this army. And we've lost more of the eagles than I care to think about. For a moment he reflected on the men whom he had served with during two voyages to Novendus, Louis and Rue, Nacor and Chopi, and those fallen at the battles along the way. Billy Goodwin, who fell off his horse and broke his head. Bigo, the pious brawler, and Harper, who was twice the sergeant Eric had ever been, among many others. And most of all, one man. As much as I wish Callus was still leading this bunch instead of myself, he said to Owen, more than any other I'd give half my remaining years to have Bobby de Longville back. Owen raised his wine cup. Amen to that, my boy. Amen to that. He drank. But he'd be proud of you, no doubt. Eric said, when this is over and we start taking men down to Navendus, I want to find that ice cave and bring Bobby home. No one said, men have done crazier things before. But dead is dead and buried is buried, Eric. Of all the men who fell, why Bobby? Because he was Bobby? Most of us wouldn't be alive today, save for what he taught us, we and the eagles. 
Callus was our captain, but Bobby was our soul. Well, if you can get the prince to release you from duty for a time, maybe you can do it. Me, I'll be asking him to promote you again to take some weight off my shoulders. Thanks, but I'll refuse. Owen said, why? You've got a wife, and I expect someday children, and a promotion means more money as well as rank. I'm not worried about money. I mean, I have enough, even if the investments that Ruse made for me don't work out. I'll take care of Kitty and any children. But I just don't want to become a staff officer. Greylock said, There won't be much need for captains once the war is over, Eric. The nobility will again come to the fore and start taking care of keeping the peace. Eric shook his head. I don't think that's wise. I think the Rift War and this war show we need a larger standing army. With Kesh again making moves along the south and with as many casualties as we've taken... I think the prince needs more men under arms at all times than we've had before here in the West. You're not the first to say that, said Owen. But the politics, the nobles will never stand for it. They will if the king orders it, said Eric. And someday Patrick will be king. Now there's a chilling thought, joked Owen. Eric said, he'll grow up. No one laughed. Listen to you, you're the same age. Eric shrugged. I feel older than my years. Well, you are, said Owen, and that's a fact. Now, get out and find those Hadati and ask them if they're crazy enough to do as you ask. If they say no, I will not be surprised, as they strike me as being a smarter-than-average bunch. Eric rose, saluted casually, and departed. When he was gone, Owen looked at the map and said to the orderly, Send for Captain Sabai, please. Jimmy pointed. Up there. He had commandeered a horse and sent two men back to Port Vicor, riding double. He had ordered the other ten men to accompany him in his pursuit of Malar, and he knew the spy had only one possible destination. Jimmy was certain now that Malar Anaris was a Cassian spy. A simple thief would have taken Jimmy's weapons and gold. He only took Jimmy's horse to have a spare as he fled to Cassian lines. The fact he had first taken the prince's orders to Lord Duco was the single most indicting evidence. Captain Song Ti and the other men looked uncertain about the young noble's orders, but they obeyed. As they stopped to rest their horses, Song Ti said, Lord James. Jimmy, my grandfather was Lord James. Lord Jimmy, amended Song Ti. Just Jimmy. With a shrug, Song Ti said, Jimmy, you move with certain purpose and don't seem to be following tracks. Can I assume you know where this fugitive is heading? Yes, said Jimmy. There are few places a man can safely travel between Kesh and the kingdom, and there is only one crossing point near enough where he stands a chance of finding a Keshian patrol before running into ours. It's up there, he pointed to a distant range of low mountains, in the high desert. It's Dulcer Pass. It's a very narrow little defile that empties out at the oasis of Ocateo. Very popular with smugglers. And spies, suggested Song Ti. Yes, said Jimmy. If you know of this place, sir, why not keep a garrison there? Jimmy shrugged. Because we find it as useful to keep open as the Cassians do. I don't think I'll ever understand the society of yours, sir. Well, when the war is over, you may return to Navindus, should you wish. Song Ti said, I am a soldier, and I have served Lord Duco most of my life. I wouldn't know what to do back in Novendus. None of us would. Jimmy motioned it was time to resume writing. Well, as sure as the sun rises in the east, there are those down in Novendus building their own little empires as much as Padawa is here. Some of the younger men might wish to return, said Song Di as he remounted, but most of us who have been with Duco for a while will make lives here, in your kingdom. Then it's time for you to begin thinking of it as our kingdom. So my lord Duco instructs, admitted Song Ti as he motioned the patrol forward. They rode up a dusty trail into plateau country, long rolling vistas of dust, tough dry plants, and sun-bleached rock. A dry wind struck, and grit collected in a man's eyes, nose, and threatened to peel skin from bone. Even water tasted gritty when drunk, as the fine powdery sand got everywhere. They reached a high plateau, and Jimmy pointed upward. The oasis is at the top of that. He pointed at another plateau, easily a thousand feet higher than the one upon which they stood. Looking backward, they could see the lowlands, leading down to Shandon Bay. 
Songti said, From here on a clear day, you can see the bay, I think. More, said Jimmy. On a very clear day, I have been told, you can see the peaks of the Calastius Mountains to the north. He urged his horse forward, and they continued moving upward. Night found them resting in a large pass, sheltered from the wind and sand. They sat on the rocks, their saddles behind them or under their feet. The horses were staked out a short way away. Jimmy ordered a cold camp against the possibilities others were nearby, or that Malar was looking over his shoulder. Jimmy knew that he stood a fair chance of overtaking the spy if he didn't know his way through these hills as well as Jimmy. He might have been a boy in far Illinois, but his grandfather made sure he and his brother knew every weakness along the border with Kesh, smugglers' coves, trails, goat paths, creeks, and gaps in the mountains. And Lord James's knowledge had been encyclopedic, Jimmy remembered. He had made sure his grandsons knew of every potential attack of Corridor into the kingdom. Chewing jerked beef, Captain Songti said, Are you certain we'll catch this spy? We must. He stole orders to Duco and knows too much about the lack of defenses in Crondor. The orders also detail our plan for dealing with the threat to Land's End. We have encountered a few of these Keshians. They are determined fighters. Keshian dog soldiers are not known for cowardice. Occasionally their leaders are, but if they're ordered to fight to the last man, they will. If we catch this man, we avoid a big fight? Yes, said Jimmy. Then we shall have to catch this man. At first light we leave, said Jimmy. He gathered his cloak about him and said, Wake me just before. Aki and his men spread out along the base of the cliff. Eric said, What's the best way to proceed? They had carried bundles of weapons and dry clothing wrapped in oil-treated canvas swimming the route Eric had previously discovered. The plan was to get to the top of the cliff in the darkness, and just before dawn, Subai's pathfinders, as well as a few dozen Crondorian regulars, would make as much noise as possible at the far end of the defender's wall, hoping to make them think the kingdom forces were attempting to circle the barricades on the hillside. They would retreat as soon as engaged, with Subai and his pathfinders climbing the steep hillside and up into the mountains. Once past this barrier, they'd start their journey along the western slopes of the mountains, making their way to Yabon. The Crondorians would retreat with a lot of noise, apparently in disorder. The hope was this would allow the Hadati and Eric to slip in behind the defenders and reach the gate. If they could get it open, Greylock promised they only had to hold it for two minutes. He had two companies of cavalry, light bowmen who could cross the gap in less than two minutes, and a company of one hundred heavy lancers who could sweep behind the line and clear the wall of defenders. From above the cliffs came the sounds of men shouting as Greylock's probing attacks were withdrawn. The defenders had been dealing with them since noon, and as the sun set, Owen was quitting the attacks. Eric prayed the attacks had kept the defenders busy enough not to peer over the cliffs. Otherwise there might be a very nasty reception waiting for them at the top. Aki looked upward and said, Bashan is our best climber. He goes first and carries a cord. If he reaches the top, we will tie the cord to a rope and he will pull it up. With a slight smile, Aki added, Even you should be able to reach the top of the cliffs with a rope to hang on to, Captain. Eric said, I am flattered by your confidence in me. The man named Pashan took off his weapons, the long blade most Hadati carried over their backs, and the short blade carried at the belt. He was short, compact, and his arms and legs looked powerful. He stripped off his soft buckskin boots and handed everything to a companion. He took the light cord and carefully coiled it around his chest and shoulder. So he wore it like the plaid most Hadati wore when sporting clan dress. The bulk of it trailed behind him to a coil resting on the sand. Aki had instructed the men to be careful it uncoiled without any hitch, lest Pashan be pulled off balance by unexpected resistance. Pashan adjusted his kilt and started to climb. Eric glanced to the west. The sun had set a few minutes earlier, and now they were watching a brave man carefully scale a cliff face in failing light. It would be dark before he safely reached the top. The minutes dragged by, and upward the man climbed. Each hand and foot moved carefully, testing the grip or footing. Like a fly on a wall, he moved slowly upward, slightly to the right of his starting point. Eric was amazed. At first he was twenty feet above, then thirty, then forty. At fifty feet he was a third of the way to the top. 
He did not stop to rest, and Eric decided that hanging on the face of the rocks was no more rest than climbing would be. At no time did Pashan's rhythm change. A step, a grip, a shift of weight, and up he would move. As darkness descended, it became more difficult to see him moving among the rocks. Eric lost sight of him in the inky shadows between the rocks. Then he caught sight of movement. Pashan was now two-thirds of the way to the top of the cliffs. Again he vanished into the gloom, and the minutes dragged by. As the night deepened into darkness, no moons would rise until near dawn this night. Finally the cord began to jerk up and down. Tie the rope, instructed Aki. The remaining cord was cut and tied tightly around the end of a much heavier rope. When it was secured, they tugged three times firmly on the cord. Pashan rapidly pulled the rope upward. The rope continued to pay out, then jerked up and down again. The first jerks had been the signal Pashan had reached the top of the cliffs and to tie the rope. The second signal indicated either he had tied off the rope or he was now digging in to hold it. The second man up the rope would be the smallest remaining. He would join with Pashan and hold the end. Each man after would add his strength as the larger men climbed. The second man had his weapons tied in a bundle slung over his back and started up hand over hand, using his feet to boost him along the surface of the rocks. Eric was amazed at how fast he climbed. Then the third man went up. The night's silence was cut by the distant sounds from the enemy's camp, but not alarms or the sounds of fighting. Slowly the squad of fifty Hadati hillmen reached the summit, and at last Eric and Aki were alone on the beach. I'll go after you, said Eric. Aki nodded and was up the rope without a word. Eric waited, then gripped the rope. He was never a good climber, so he wanted to be last in case he slipped. If he was going to fall to his death, he wasn't about to knock a key off the rope behind him. Eric found his feet to be of little aid to him as he struggled up the rope. He was a powerful man, with a huge upper body, yet he was also a heavy man. His arms were burning and his back cramping with pain as he reached a point near the summit. Suddenly the rope began to move, and for an instant Eric felt a stab of panic before he realized he was being pulled up. Aki reached over the edge of the cliff, took Eric by the wrist, and with a yank hauled him up to safety. With a whisper he said, Someone comes. Eric nodded, pulling his belt knife out and looking around. They were in a sparse stand of trees, pines and aspens, and as far as he could tell, he and Aki were alone. The other Hadati had somehow managed to vanish into the woods. Aki quickly moved to cut off the rope tied to a tree nearby and cast the remnants off the cliff. Then he pulled Eric away and they slipped off into the woods. From a short distance he heard men walking and one spoke in the language of Novendus. I don't hear nothing. I tell you I thought I heard something like someone moving around. There's no one here, came the first voice. Eric hugged the side of a small oak, glancing through the lower branches of a pair of star pines as two figures emerged from the other side of the clearing. One carried a torch. This is a fool's errand. And you're just the man for the job, said the other. Very funny. They reached the clearing before the cliffs, and the first man said, That's a long way down, so don't get too close. Don't need to tell me, lad. I have no love for heights. Then how did you get up the wall at Crondor? Didn't, said the second man. I waited for them to blow up the walls and walked in. You were lucky, said the first man. See, no one here. What did you think? Someone was sending monkeys climbing them cliffs or some sort of magic thing? I've seen enough weird magic things to last me my lifetime, that's a fact, said the second man as they turned to retrace their steps to the camp. What about that demon thing and the queen and them snake priests? If I never see magic again in this life, it's fine by me. Did I tell you the time I met that dancer in Hamsa? Now that was magic. Only six or seven times, so spare me. The voices faded off into the night. From behind Eric heard a voice say, They think the wood's empty. Good, said Eric to Aki. Then we can wait until just before first light to make our move. Eric said, spread the word. Have the men stay where they are, out of sight. We gather an hour before dawn. Aki vanished into the gloom without a word. 17. Assaults Jimmy pointed. Captain Songti said, 
I see them. They were scouting out the well at Okatillo Oasis, and lounging in the shade of the desert willows was a patrol of Keshian soldiers. Those are imperial borderers, whispered Jimmy. See those long lances? Leaning against the rocks near where the horses were staked out, rested twenty long, slender spears with banners attached. Songti said, Looks like we want to get in close, fast. Yes, said Jimmy. No archers. Is that your man? asked Songti, pointing at a figure on the far side of the campfire. That's him, said Jimmy. Malar was sitting next to a Keshian officer, who was examining the bundle of dispatches Jimmy had been carrying to Duko. We've got to kill them all before they leave in the morning. Songti said, They're pretty lax at camp. They're arrogant bastards, but they've earned it. They're among the best light cavalry the world has seen. Those fellows with the long hair, they pile up under their helmets when they ride? He pointed to six men who were slightly apart, relaxing around a large pot of food, speaking quietly. Are Ashunta horsemen from deep within the empire. Man for man, they are the best riders in the world. Some of my lads might take exception to that, said Songti. Jimmy grinned. The best horsemen in Triasia? Not since we got here, said Songti. He turned and signaled. His men were hanging back down the trail. They slowly moved forward. Jimmy said, As soon as you attack, Malar is going to jump on the nearest horse and ride that way. He pointed to a pass to the south, leading down into the borderlands of Kesh. Let me get over there, and if he does, I'll jump him from those rocks. Songti said, I'll go with you. He might bring a friend. Ignore the friend unless it's that officer looking at those documents. First thing we must do is get them back and kill any man who reads them. That makes it easy, said Song Ti. We'll just have to kill them all. Jimmy admired the man's confidence. There was a full patrol of twenty Keshian borderers taking their ease around the well, and only ten kingdom soldiers with Jimmy. Jimmy said, Hit them fast. He got up and in a crouching run skirted the rocks above the oasis until he was poised above the point he had indicated. Song Ti communicated with his men using hand signals, then came and stood beside Jimmy. Suddenly chaos erupted at the oasis, and men shouted. While outnumbered, the kingdom soldiers were given the advantage of surprise. Without looking, Jimmy knew men were dying before they reached their weapons. The sound of bows was reassuring, as only Song Ti's men had them. As he predicted, Jimmy heard a shout and a rider coming fast through the defile. He readied himself. Malar rounded the bend, riding bareback, having taken time only to slip a bridle on his horse, and carrying only the bundle of messages. As he passed, Jimmy leaped out, sweeping the man from his horse. The bundle went flying, and Jimmy tucked his shoulder, rolling on the ground and coming to his feet with a grunt of pain. He had struck a rock outcropping and could feel his left arm going numb. He knew instantly he had dislocated his shoulder. Another horse appeared, and Songti jumped out, sweeping a rider from his saddle, and Jimmy barely dodged the second horse as it raced by. He turned, trying to find Malar, and saw the spy attempting to flee down the trail after the horse. Clutching his sword in his right hand, his left dangling limply at his side, Jimmy ran after him, past Songti, who was sitting astride the chest of a Keshian, choking the life from him. Malar reached a bend in the trail, and Jimmy lost sight of him. He hurried after, and as he rounded the bend... Pain exploded in his left shoulder. Malar had climbed aboard a boulder and had kicked him hard, aiming for his head, but striking his shoulder instead. The effect was nearly the same, for the pain in Jimmy's left shoulder nearly rendered him unconscious. An involuntary cry escaped his lips as he staggered to his right. Jimmy managed to keep enough wits to put his sword up, and Malar almost impaled himself on its point as he jumped off the boulder. Instead, he hit the ground and backed away a step. The spy said, well, young lord, it appears I should have used a stronger poison. Jimmy shook his head to clear it and said, But then you wouldn't have been able to drink any. Malar grinned. Building up a resistance was a most unpleasant process, but over the years I've discovered it was worth it. I would love to continue our discussion, but I hold no confidence that your men will be delayed much longer. So I must leave. He was holding only a dagger but he advanced as if confident Jimmy and his sword would be no match. Years of training, back to when he was a boy learning at the knee of his grandfather, took over, and Jimmy leaped to his right, just as Malar let loose an underhand cast, lightning swift with his left hand, and a previously unseen dagger glanced off the rocks where Jimmy had stood a moment before. 
and Jimmy knew this man would have several blades secreted upon his person. As Jimmy expected, when he turned to confront Valar, the spy was already hurling himself at Jimmy, daggers in both hands. Jimmy fell over backward, enduring further steering agony in his left shoulder as he avoided Malar's assault. Jimmy kicked out with his right leg as Malar closed on him, knocking him off balance. The spy's leg was rock-hard, and Jimmy was certain he'd find the man's slender build had been misleading. This was not a skinny weakling, he thought. Wasting no time, Jimmy rolled upright and struck hard with his sword. Malar barely avoided the blow and rolled away, ignoring the sharp rocks that littered the trail. Jimmy pressed on, not allowing this dangerous foe the chance to collect himself, not while Jimmy had only one good arm. He swung down again with a sword, almost cutting the Keshian spy. Malar scrambled backward, halfway up a rock face. Then, rather than retreat, he used the momentum to hurl himself forward, inside of Jimmy's sword. Jimmy felt a blade slide across his ribs, and he gasped in pain, but he twisted enough that the point didn't dig in. He contracted with his chest and stomach, striking Malar's face with a vicious headbutt. Malar staggered backward, blood streaming from his broken nose, and Jimmy's vision swam a moment. Suddenly a horse almost ran Jimmy down, hooves flying, as it raced by. Jimmy got up as quickly as he could and realized he no longer held a sword. The bleeding Keshian spy grinned like a crazed wolf as he crouched low, holding his remaining dagger in his right hand. Don't move, young noble, and I'll make this quick and painless. He took a step toward Jimmy, who countered with a handful of dirt to Malar's eyes. Malar turned away, blinded by the dust, and Jimmy leaped to grip Malar's wrist with his good right hand. Summoning as much strength as he could, he tried to crush Malar's wrist by sheer willpower. Malar grunted in pain, but didn't let go of the dagger. As Jimmy had suspected, the Keshian's slight build hid steel-like strength, and nothing as trivial as a broken wrist would distract him. Malar pulled back, Jimmy still holding his right wrist in his own right hand. With his left fist, Malar struck a backhanded blow to Jimmy's shoulder. Jimmy cried out in pain and felt his knees buckle. He nearly lost consciousness as Malar struck him in the left shoulder again and felt the strength draining out of him. Malar drew back and wrenched his wrist free of Jimmy's grasp, and in one motion deftly tossed his dagger from left to right hand. For an instant, Jimmy looked up as Malar stood above him, poised to deliver a death blow, a vicious backhand stab with his left hand. Malar's eyes widened in shock, and he looked down. The dagger fell from his fingers, and his hand went around behind his back, and he turned as if to get a better angle on something. Jimmy saw an arrow protruding out of the spy's right shoulder, and suddenly a second struck him with a loud thud. Malar went to his knees, then his eyes rolled up into his head as blood flowed from his nose and mouth, and he fell face forward onto the stones before Jimmy. Jimmy turned to see Song Ti and one of his men, armed with a bow, hurrying toward him. Jimmy sat back on his heels, then fell over backward, banging himself against the rocks. Song Ti knelt and said, Are you hurt? I'll live, Jimmy croaked. My shoulder's dislocated. Let me see, said the captain. He gently touched the shoulder, and pain shot through Jimmy's body from waist to jaw. Just a moment, said the captain. Then, with a sure move, he gripped the upper portion of Jimmy's arm and clamped his other hand down on the shoulder and shoved the arm back into position. Jimmy's eyes widened and watered, and he could barely catch his breath. Then the pain passed. Song Ti said, Better to do it soon, before things swell and you can't get it back in. Then you need a healer or priest, or a great deal of brandy. You'll be better tomorrow. If you say so. Jimmy replied weakly. I got the second rider, but there was a third. He almost ran me down, said Jimmy, as Song Ti helped him to his feet. It was the officer. Jimmy swore. Are the messages to Duco still over there? The archer looked around and saw the leather pouch, reached down and held it up. It's here. Jimmy waved the man over, and he handed the bundle to the captain. Song Ti pulled out the documents and said, There are seven papers here. That's all of them, said Jimmy. He looked down at the dead spy and said, That was too close. Song Ti motioned for the archer to give Jimmy a steadying hand. We must bury the dead. If there's another patrol nearby and they see vultures circling, they might come to investigate in the morning. Jimmy shook his head. It doesn't matter. Before first light, we're down that trail back across the border. We may kill horses, but we've got to get back to Port Vicor, and I've got to get up to Crondor as fast as possible. 
Because that officer escaped? Timmy nodded yes. I don't know how closely he read these or what Malar told him, but he'll carry word back to his masters that Crondor is being held by a handful of palace guards and every fighting man not tied up at Land's End or in the Vale is up north facing Fadawa. These Cassians would press the advantage? Timmy said, indeed they would. One quick strike up to the city and they hold Prince Patrick. The king would grant them much to reclaim his son. Song Ti said, it was simpler when we lived in Novindus. Jimmy laughed, though it hurt him to do so. No doubt, he said, as he leaned on the archer and hobbled back to the oasis. Eric heard the Hadati moving before he saw him appear out of the gloom. Aki said, It's almost time. They had remained hidden through the night in the woods behind the barricade blocking the highway. Twice mercenaries had wandered close to where Eric waited, but none bothered to check the woods on the cliffs. Eric nodded. The sky to the east was getting lighter. Soon, if all went according to plan, a feint at the far end of the barricade would give Eric his opportunity to strike from behind and open the gate. Let's look around a little, said Eric. He crouched low and moved through the trees until he reached the clearing south of the highway. He gauged the distance to the gate at over a hundred yards and counted a dozen low-burning campfires between his current position and the gate. And another score, just the other side of the road, he felt a key at his shoulder and whispered, I expected more men here. I as well. If we can get through the gate, this battle will be over quickly. He left unsaid what would be the result of not getting the gate open. Eric said, I have an idea. Pass word that no man is to move when the alarm sounds. Tell them to wait until I signal you. Where will you be? Eric pointed. I'll be somewhere out there. Eric wore his black uniform, but without his crimson eagle tabard. To any casual observer, he might pass as a mercenary given to wearing black. Glancing at a key, he noticed a blue band around the warrior's brow. Is that something I might borrow from you? he asked, not knowing if it might have some sort of tribal significance. A key didn't answer. He reached up and untied the band, then stepped behind Eric and tied the headband in place. Now Eric looked even less like a kingdom regular. Eric cautiously stepped out between two campfires, walking carefully so as not to wake sleeping men. Soft voices from the barricade told him the guards on duty were gossiping or telling stories to keep awake. Eric reached the edge of the road, and his manner changed. He walked briskly as if he was about important business. He moved boldly down the road and reached the gate. As he approached, he noted the construction of the gate. It was simple, but effective. The gates each had one large iron bracket affixed to them by huge iron bolts. Through those brackets, an oak bar had been passed, and that was braced in turn by long poles driven into the ground. It should be easy to knock aside the poles and run the bar out of the brackets, but it would take a sizable ram to knock it open from the other side. Hey, he said, before he could be challenged. He kept his voice deep, hopefully disguising his accent as he spoke the invader's dialect. What? asked the man in charge of the gate, a sergeant or captain by the look of him. We're just down from the north, and I've got to find whoever's in charge. Captain Rostov is over there, said the man, pointing at a large tent barely visible in the pre-dawn gloom. What news? Eric growled. Your name, Rostov? No, said the man in return, bristling a bit. Then my message isn't for you, is it? Eric turned and walked away before the man could respond. He made his way slowly but purposefully toward the command tent. Then, just before approaching too closely, he veered away and walked between camps. Most of the men were sleeping. A few were rousing and stirring cooking fires, heading to nearby slit trenches to relieve themselves or already eating. He absently nodded or gave a slight wave of greeting to a few he passed, Furthering the illusion, he was a familiar figure known to someone in the camp. If not the person looking at him, perhaps the man across the way to whom he was waving. Eric reached a particularly quiet camp, where only one man stirred, one who was brewing up coffee by the smell of it. Crossing over, he said, I have an extra cup to spur. The man looked up and nodded, motioning Eric over. Eric came over and knelt beside the warrior. I've got a few minutes before I report to the gate and can't find a hot cup anywhere. I know what you mean, said the soldier, handing an earthen mug filled with the black hot liquid to Eric. 
You with Gaja? Eric recognized the name, a captain he had heard of before. But he knew nothing about the man. No, said Eric. We just got here. My captain is over there. He indicated the command tent. Talking with Rostov. And I thought I'd sneak off and grab this. He stood. Thanks. I'll bring back the mug with my duties over. The soldier waved off the remark. Keep it. We've looted enough crockery. I'm thinking of opening a store. Eric strolled along, drinking his coffee, which wasn't too bad for camp fare, and inspected the area. There were no more than a thousand men behind the wall, and from the look of what he could see along the barricade, no more than twelve hundred total at this position. Another mystery. From the other side, it looked like half of Adawa's army waited. Yet from this side, Eric knew that if he could get the gate open, this battle would be won in minutes, not hours. When he was halfway back to the gate area, Eric heard a shout raised up at the eastern end of the barricade. Then more shouts as an alarm was raised. Eric paused and counted slowly to ten until he heard a horn sounded, a call to arms. Men sprang up from where they slept, and Eric tossed aside his cup and hurried along. In his most commanding voice, he started shouting, They're hitting the east flank! Get to the east! Men who were half asleep started hurrying off toward the far end of the line. As he neared the gate, a man hurried over and said, What is this? Eric knew at once this was a sergeant or captain of some company, one not used to obeying mindlessly. Rostov's orders. Are you Captain Gaja? The man blinked and said, No, I'm Tulma. Gaja is due to relieve me in an hour. Then get two men in three off the gate and rush them to the eastern end of the line. The enemy is breaking through over there. Eric hurried along and kept shouting, Get to the east! Hurry up! Men saw other soldiers rushing off to where they were ordered and hastened to obey. Eric ran back to where he could be seen by Aki and signaled. Instantly, the Hadati hillmen were running from the trees. Eric ran to the gate and shouted, Orders! Open the gate! Get ready to sally! What? said a man. Who are you? Eric had his sword out and killed the man before he could react. My luck couldn't run forever, he said to Aki as the Hadati reached his side. The Hadati killed every man standing before the gate before anyone more than twenty-five yards away noticed. The supporting poles were kicked aside, and before they hit the ground, Eric and Aki, along with two other men, were lifting the heavy oaken bar out of the brackets that held it in place. As they carried the bar aside, others opened the gate. Two minutes, Eric cried. We have to keep it open for two minutes. Seconds slipped by slowly as shouts up and down the line demanded answers, and suddenly it was clear to Eric that those to the north of him on the defender's side of the barricade knew something was amiss. Suddenly men were charging at the Hadati, who were, to a man, armed with long swords and short swords, held in right and left hands respectively. They moved out to keep enough room between each that they could do a maximum of damage. Eric hesitated only a moment, then ran and leaped atop a pile of grain sacks, and pulled himself up on the ramparts behind the breastwork. He could not afford for bowmen to get above the Hadati. If he did, the fight would be over. Eric glanced to the south and saw the kingdom cavalry was already on its way. One more minute, and the day would be won. Eric charged along the ramparts, and the first man he encountered looked confused, still trying to see what was occurring to the east. Eric grabbed him and threw him off the rampart. He landed on top of a pair of men running along, and those behind stopped. A crossbow bolt sped past Eric's head, and he ducked. He retreated, weapons ready, and when he saw soldiers heading toward him, he halted. The first man to face him slowed, uncertain of what was before him. Eric was happy to wait and let the kingdom cavalry reach the gate. Abruptly, a sense of alarm passed through those near the gate as if they finally realized what had happened. They charged the waiting Hadati, and the man opposite Eric let out a howl of rage and charged him. Eric took a step back when the man swung, letting him overbalance himself, and with a swift kick, Eric sent the man tumbling over the side of the rampart. The second man approached a little more cautiously, if just as intently, and struck out. Eric took the blow on his sword and parried. Then, unexpectedly, he stepped into the man, slamming him in the face with his sword hilt. The man stumbled backward into another man behind him, and both fell back. Eric glanced over the wall and saw the first pair of kingdom horsemen was near, lowering their lances as they started up the last part of the incline toward the gate. Eric had a sudden impulse and shouted at the top of his lungs, Throw down your swords! It's over! The man opposite him on the barricade hesitated, and Eric shouted, this is your last chance. Throw down your sword. The man looked at the huge, blond man before him as lancers raced through the gate behind the Hadati hillmen whose whirling blades were inflicting terrible injury on any who closed on them. 
With a look of disgust, he threw down his blade. A band of horsemen rode up from behind the line and were charged by Crondorian lancers as the second unit of cavalry swept in. A scaling ladder slammed against the wall near Eric, and he realized that Greylock had hedged his bet by getting men close under cover of darkness. He glanced to his right and saw footmen racing across the open ground ahead. Eric leaned out over the edge of the wall and almost got his head split open as thanks. Hey! he shouted down to a kingdom soldier halfway up the ladder, who had just swung his sword at Eric. Slow down! You might fall off and hurt yourself! It was not what the soldier expected. He stopped, and the man behind him on the ladder shouted, Keep moving! Eric said, You can climb back down and walk through the gate. The man on the top of the ladder shouted, Sorry, Captain von Dockmore! Eric looked to the left and saw mercenaries throwing down their swords and backing away as a line of lancers slowly advanced on them, the points of their heavy weapons pointed at chest height. Eric saw the light cavalry entering behind the lancers and recognized Jado and Duga. He signaled to get their attention. Jado rode closer, and Eric shouted, Get things organized, and send word back to Greylock to move up, quickly. Jado signaled that he understood, and turned to carry word to Owen himself. Duga jumped down from his horse and boldly walked past the line of lancers, and started separating mercenaries from their weapons. Eric glanced at the rear of the enemy camp, where a running fight had erupted between the lancers and the invaders' cavalry units, and realized the enemy didn't know they'd lost yet. Given what he knew of enemy horsemen, he knew a few heads would be broken before word reached them if he didn't intervene. He shouted for messengers to carry the word to the fight before men died needlessly. Eric jumped off the wall as the first kingdom foot soldiers entered the gate. He pushed through the press of prisoners and sought out the senior lieutenant of the light cavalry. Go give the lancers a hand with that lot at the rear. Then I want a sweep of the woods on both sides of the road for the next five miles. If anyone's cut and running north to tell Fadawa this position has fallen, I want them overtaken. The rider saluted, gave orders, and rode off. Then Eric sought out a key. How are your men? I have some injuries, but no one dead, said the leader of the hillmen. Had they a few more minutes to get organized, I think we would have seen otherwise. I think you are correct, said Eric. He left the hillmen and turned as Jado and Owen rode through the gate, and as he approached he turned to a passing soldier and said, Find a captain among the prisoners, a man named Rostov, and bring him here. Owen looked around and said, Another illusion? Eric said, Almost. If we hadn't gotten the gate open, we would have bled, but not as badly as we thought. Owen glanced northward, as if to see over the horizon. What is he doing? Eric said, I wish I knew. Eric looked to the south. And I wish I knew what was going on down there, too. Owen said, that's Duco and Patrick's problem, not ours. Now, let's get things here under control, then start moving north again. Eric saluted, then turned and began organizing the chaos behind the barricade. Dash could barely contain his rage. A dozen of his constables were standing around the room, looking from one to another, a few openly frightened. Two of his men lay dead before him. Sometime during the night they had been waylaid and killed their throats cut and their bodies deposited before the door of the new market jail. Whispering Dash said, Someone's going to bleed for this. The men were two recent recruits, Nolan and Riggs, and they had just finished their training. The last month had been difficult for Dash, but as order returned to Crondor, he found that larger portions of the city were slowly getting back to a rhythm not unlike that known before the war. The prince had authorized the purchase of a building just off the market square, and the cells had just been installed by an ironmonger. A near riot, down near the docks the night before, had taken the jail to its limit, and Dash had been busy dragging malefactors off to the city court, established by the prince the week before. Two eastern nobles were serving as judges, and a lot of drunks were finding themselves sentenced to the labor gangs in a hurry. Most got a year, but a few were pulling five- and ten-year sentences and the citizens of the more unruly areas of the city were loudly protesting. So far, the protest had been vocal, with insults hurled at watchmen as they made their rounds, until last night. Where were they scheduled to patrol? asked Dash. Gustav, the former prisoner, had turned up looking for work a few days before, and Dash had made him a corporal. Gustav had the duty roster. They were working down near the old poor quarter. Damn, said Dash. The old poor quarter of the city was now a shanty town of huts and tents, 
and people living in the lees of partial walls. Every vice imaginable was available there, and, predictably, the Thieves' Guild was establishing its power there faster than the Crown. Now all bets are off. Since taking the office of Sheriff of Crondor, Dash had managed to keep hanging to a minimum. Two murderers had been publicly hanged five days before, but the majority of crimes had been relatively petty. "'What were these two doing down there, anyway?' asked Dash. "'They were both new to the job.' Gustav said, "'The draw just came up that way.' Lowering his voice, he said, "'There's no one here with what you might call a great deal of experience, Dash.' Dash nodded. The two dead men weren't downy-cheeked youths by any stretch of imagination. Four to a squad down there, starting tomorrow. What about tonight? asked Gustav. I'll take care of tonight, said Dash, leaving the small squad room. He hurried down the street and made his way through the open market, heading toward what had been the poor quarter. He kept his wits about him and his eyes open. Even in the daylight he could count on nothing but trouble in this part of the city. Reaching a burned-out two-story building, he ducked inside. Quickly he removed his red armband and ducked out the back of the building. He hurried down a narrow alley and climbed a wooden fence that was still somehow standing between two stone walls, while everything nearby had been reduced to ash. Ducking under a low-hanging arch of stone, he reached his goal. He crept through an open building, a small former business on the edge of the poor quarter. He hung inside, staying hidden in shadow, while watching the view out in the quarter. Men and women moved through the tents and shacks, dealing trade goods and food, as well as illicit goods. Dash was looking for a certain face and would be content to wait until he saw it. Near sundown, a small man came hurrying toward the building, intent on some errand, lost in thought. As he passed the open door, Dash reached out and grabbed him by the collar of his dingy shirt, hauling him inside. The man yelped in terror and started to beg, Don't kill me! I didn't do it! Dash put his hand over the little man's mouth and said, Didn't do what, Kirby? When he saw he wasn't going to be instantly killed, the little man relaxed. Dash removed his hand. Whatever it was you think I did, said the little man. Kirby Dawkins, said Dash. The only thing you do is trade and information. If you weren't so useful, I'd squash you like the bug you are. The vile-smelling little man grinned. His face was a patchwork of scars and blemishes. He was a beggar by trade, and an informant when opportunity presented itself. Like the cockroach he was, he had crawled into a crack in the stones and survived the destruction of the city. But you have use of me, don't you? For the moment, conceded Dash. Two of my men were dumped on the jail steps last night, their throats cut. I want those who did it. No one's bragging. See what you can find out, but at midnight tonight I'll be here, and you better be as well, with names. That might prove difficult, said the snitch. Make it happen, said Dash, hauling the little man up so that Dash's nose almost touched Kirby's. I don't need to make up crimes to get you hung. Keep me happy. I live to keep you happy, sir. Exactly. He let go of the little man's shirt. And pass word back to that old man. What old man? asked Kirby, feigning ignorance. I don't have to tell you who said Dash. Tell him if this murder lands at his feet, any faint affection I might feel toward his merry band of mummers will be gone forever. If they're his pranksters cutting throats, he'd better serve them up to me, or the mockers will be crushed root and branch. Kirby swallowed hard. I'll pass that along, if it becomes appropriate. Dash pushed the little man outside the door. Go. Midnight, he ordered. Dash saw that he still had an hour of daylight and imagined there were many tasks waiting for him back at headquarters. He turned to retrace his steps back to the Newmarket jail and cursed Patrick for giving him this thankless task of beating obedience into his subjects. But as long as it was his job, vowed a Dash, he would do it properly. And that started with keeping his constables alive. Dash hurried through the failing light into the shadows of Crondor. Eighteen. Revelations. Owen squirmed. He didn't seem able to find a comfortable position in his camp chair, and yet the situation demanded he sit for hours reviewing reports and communiques. 
Eric approached, looming up out of the evening darkness against the campfires burning in every direction. He saluted. We've interrogated the captains, and they're as ignorant as the swordsmen they've hired. There's a pattern here, somewhere, said Owen. I'm just too stupid to see it. He indicated that Eric should sit. Not stupid, said Eric, sitting next to his commander. Just tired. Not that tired, said Owen. His old, leathery face wrinkled in a smile. I've gotten three good nights' sleep, truth to tell, since you opened the gates. In fact, it's been too good. He leaned forward, looking at the map as if there was something in there to see, if he just stared at it long enough. Companies of regular soldiers were arriving from the south. The prisoners were being kept in a makeshift compound, fashioned of freshly felled trees. Eric said, The best I can come up with is Fadawa has some men he wasn't really happy with, so he thought he'd turn them over to us to feed. Well, if you hadn't opened that gate, we would have bled a bit getting over that wall, said Owen, hiking his thumb over his shoulder at the large earthen breastwork behind his command pavilion. True, but we would have taken it in a day or two. I'm wondering why Fadawa is going to all the trouble of making us think he's down here and then letting us discover he isn't. I'm guessing, said Eric, but if he's taken Lamut, he might be moving south of Ilvath right now, getting ready for a counterattack. He can't ignore Yabon, said Owen. As long as Duke Carl is up there with his army, Fadawa has to keep a strong face northward. Carl can get men in and out of there if Fadawa doesn't keep the pressure on. Even so, there are Hadati hillmen still up there who can probably sneak through his lines at will. And I'm sure the dwarves and elves aren't proving hospitable neighbors if his patrols wander too far from their current position. No, he must take all of Yabon before he turns south. Well, he can't hope to slow us down with these little sham positions. Owen's face showed concern. I don't know if these are shams as much as they're just irritations to make us proceed slowly. Eric's eyes narrowed. Or maybe they're designed to make us go fast. What do you mean? Say we find one or two more of these lightly defended positions. Okay, so we do. Eric pointed to the map. Let's say we hit Quester's view and find another fortification like this. We get all excited and strike out toward Illith. And run into a meat grinder. Eric nodded. He pointed to details on the map. There's this line of unforgiving ridges north of the road from Quester's view to Hawk's Hollow. He holds both ends of the road, and if he keeps us off the ridge, he can dig in here. Eric's finger showed a particularly narrow point in the road, about twenty miles south of Illith. Let's say he sets up a series of fortifications, tunnels, catapults, arrow towers, the entire bag of tricks. We stick a boot into that mess too fast, and we may draw back a bloody stump. His finger traced a line from that point up to the dot on the map representing Illith. He's got thirty-foot-high walls and a single weak point, an eastern gate by the docks. That he can fortify, and if he sinks ships in the harbor mouth, he can sit inside the city like a turtle in its shell. The more he spoke, the more Eric was certain of his analysis. We can't land on the western shore. That's Free City's land. And if we try it, Patrick risks alienating the only neutral party left on the bitter sea. Besides, to get there, we'd probably run up against whatever warships Quegg has in the area. Owen sighed. More to the point, our fleet needs to support the army on its western flank to make sure we're supplied and to carry the wounded south to Sarth and Crondor. Eric scratched at his chin. I'm willing to bet if we had the eyes of a bird, we'd see a very heavy set of fortifications being built along that stretch right now. It all makes sense, said Owen. But then I've seen too many things in war that make no sense to count too heavily on theory. We'll have to wait to see what Subai says when he gets word back to us. If he gets word back, said Eric. Let's cover our bet, said Owen. What? asked Eric. I'm going to send an order to Admiral Reeves to send a fast cutter up the coast from Sarth. I want to see how far north he can get before someone tries to discourage him. Eric sat forward. Care to bet it's about there, he said, his finger stabbing at a point on the coast due west of Custer's view. No bet, said Owen. 
I have come to appreciate your instincts. Eric sat back in the chair. I actually hope I'm wrong, and Fadawa's all tied up outside of Yabon. I can imagine what I would do if I was building defensive fortifications along that route. No one said, You have too much imagination. Did anyone ever tell you that? Eric looked at his old friend and said, Not often enough. He stood and said, I have things to see to. I'll report in when I've done talking to the rest of the prisoners. Supper is ready. Get back here before it's all gone. Owen added, I'll be here, and went back to his reports as Eric walked off. Dash waited, and as the darkness deepened, he began to fume. It was already a quarter hour past midnight, and Kirby hadn't put in an appearance. He was about to start looking for him when he sensed someone was behind him. He slipped his hand over the hilt of his dagger and moved with a feigned, casual motion, walking back toward the rear entrance of the burned-out building. As soon as he slipped through the door, he stepped sideways, reaching toward an exposed roof beam with both hands, pulling himself up with a single fluid motion. Out came the dagger, and he waited. A moment later, a figure emerged from the door and glanced around. Dash waited. The cloaked figure below him took a step forward, and Dash dropped to the ground, his dagger going to the lurker's throat. From beneath the hood, a voice said, Going to bite me, puppy? Dash spun the figure around. Trina! The young woman smiled. It's nice to be remembered. What are you doing here? Put down that toothpick, and I'll tell you. Dash grinned. Sorry, but I'll bet you're as dangerous as you are beautiful. The woman pouted theatrically. You flatterer. Dash lost his smile. I've got dead men and I want some answers. Where's Kirby Dokins? Dead, said the woman. Dash put away his dagger. Am I suddenly less dangerous? No, said Dash, pulling the woman back inside the building. But you wouldn't have been sent to tell me the mockers killed my snitch. And? That means you didn't kill my men. Very good, puppy. Who did? An old acquaintance of yours thinks there's a new gang moving into the city. Smugglers, maybe, though there doesn't seem to be a lot of new goods in the market, if you know what I mean. I do, said Dash. The woman meant there wasn't a noticeable increase in drugs, stolen goods, or other contraband. Another crawler? You know your history, puppy. That sheriff puppy to you, said Dash. She laughed. It was the first time he had heard her laugh without mockery. It was a sweet sound. She said, We're left alone, so if someone is planning on moving into our territory, they're not ready to try yet. Our old friend said to tell you we don't know who killed your two lads, but you should know they weren't older boys from the Temple of Sung. Find out who Nolan and Riggs were working for before they joined your gang, and you might have a clue. Dash was silent, then said, So the upright man thinks these two knew their killers? Maybe. Or maybe they just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. But either way, once the deed was done, someone wanted you to think was done it to defy your authority. That's why they were dumped on your doorstep. Had the mockers killed those men? They would have been dumped in the harbor. Who killed Kirby? We don't know, said Trina. He was snooping around, being his usually pesky self. Then suddenly, about two hours ago, he turns up floating in the sewer. Where? Five points, near the big outfall below Stinky Street. Stinky Street was poor quarters slang for Tanner's Road, where many odorous businesses had resided before the war. Five points was the name of a large confluence of sewers, three big ones, two small ones. Dash had never been there, but he knew where it was. You working five points? We're not up there, but don't ask me where we're working. Dash grinned in the darkness. Not yet, anyway. Not ever, Sheriff Puppy. Not ever. Dash said, anything else? No, said Trina. Tell the old man thanks. Trina said, he didn't do it from love, Sheriff Puppy. We're just not ready to take on the crown. But he did tell me one other thing to tell you. What? Don't make threats. The day you declare war on the mockers, take your sword to bed with you. Dash said, Then tell my uncle. That advice works both ways. 
then good night. Lovely to see you again, Trina. Always a pleasure, Sheriff Puppy, said the woman thief. Then she ducked through the door and was gone. Dash allowed her the courtesy of not leaving for five minutes, so she could be sure she wasn't being followed. Besides, he could find her any time he wanted, and more to the point, his mind was wrestling with a question, who killed his men? He slipped into the darkness, heading back to his headquarters. Rue chuckled at the sight before him. Nacor was jumping around like a grasshopper, shouting orders at the workers as they tried to wrestle the statue upright. Rue moved his own wagon over to the side of the road and let those carts and wagons behind him pass. He jumped down and crossed the road to where Nacor's wagon was parked. What are you doing? he asked with a laugh. Nacor said, These fools are determined to destroy this work of art. Rue said, I think they'll get it where you want it, but why do you want it out here? He made a sweeping motion with his hand, indicating a vacant field outside the gates of Crondor. A small farm had occupied this plot of land, but the house had been destroyed, and now only a charred square of foundation stones marked its passing. "'I want everyone entering the city to see this,' said Nacor, as the workers got the statue upright. Rue paused. There was something about the woman's expression that captivated the eye. He studied it for a long moment, then said, that's really very lovely, Nacor. Is that your goddess? That's the lady, said Nacor, with a nod. But why not put her in the center of your temple? Because I don't yet have a temple, said Nacor, as he motioned for the workers to return to the wagon. I have to find a place to build one. Rue laughed. Don't look at me. I already sprang for one warehouse in Darkmoor. Besides, I don't own any buildings near Temple Square. A gleam entered Nacor's eyes. Yes, Temple Square. That's where we need to build. Builders I have, said Rue. Then he fixed Nacor with a narrow gaze. But I'm a little short on charity these days. Ah, huh? said Nacor with a laugh. Then you must have money. You're only penurious when you have gold. When you're broke, you're very generous. Rue laughed. You are the most amazing man, they call. Yes, I am, he agreed. Now, I have some gold, so you won't have to build me a temple. But I would like some, shall we call it, discounts? I'll see what I can do. He looked around so as not to be overheard. There is a lot of confusion in the city still. Many landowners are dead, and the Crown hasn't established a policy yet on who owns what. You mean Patrick hasn't seized unclaimed land yet? You catch on, said Rue. Squatters seem to have a certain advantage if the real owner doesn't press a claim. I happen to know that the empty lot on the northwest corner of Temple Square, over by the Temple of Lim's Kragma, was owned by a former associate of mine. It was always a difficult piece of land to dispose of, being located between the Death Goddess's Temple and the Temple of Giswa, Old Crowley tried to sell it to me once, and I declined. As Crowley is now among those who didn't survive the war, that land is unclaimed. Rue whispered, he left no survivors. So it's you, some other squatter, or the Crown who's going to get it. Nacor grinned. Being between the Death Goddess and the Red-Jawed Hunter doesn't bother me, so I'm certain it won't bother the lady. I'll go check it out. Rue glanced back at the statue. That's really quite good. Nacor laughed. The sculptor was inspired. I can believe it. Who modeled for it? One of my students. She's special. I can see that, said Rue. As Nacor climbed back on his wagon, motioning for the workers to climb into the back, he said, Where are you bound? Back to Ravensburg. I'm rebuilding the end of the pintail for Milo. With his daughter living in Darkmoor now, he's going to sell me half-interest. You? An innkeeper? asked Nacor with a disbelieving laugh. Any business that can make a profit, Nacor. Nacor laughed, waved, and urged his wagon on into the press of traffic heading into the city. Rue climbed aboard his own wagon and looked again at the statue. He saw there were people who were stopping to look at it, or glancing at it as they drove past. One woman reached out and touched it reverently. 
Andrew admitted to himself that the sculptor must have indeed been inspired. He flicked the reins and urged his horses into the traffic on the road, heading east. Things were still difficult, but since capturing Vesarius, life had taken a turn for the better. He had discovered he really enjoyed his children, and Carly was quite a bit better company than he imagined when he married her. While no gold had been forthcoming from the crown since the winter, he knew that eventually he could use that debt to his own advantage. He needed a good base of liquid wealth, then he could turn the debt into licenses and concessions from the crown. Eventually peace between the kingdom and Kesh would be achieved, and when that happened, the profitable luxury trade would again be open. And now with Jacob Estabrook dead, there would be no stranglehold on trade with the South. Yes, Rue said softly to himself as he drove his wagon back to his boyhood home. Things were certainly taking a turn for the better. Jimmy said, If it gets much worse, we're going to lose everything. Duke Duco nodded. Here, yeah, we're locked up at Land's End, he pointed to the map. It's as if they don't want to take the place, but they're reluctant to leave. They occupy the largest room of the biggest inn in Port Vicor, a town that didn't exist five years before. Upon seeing the settlement, Jimmy was of the opinion that had the first Prince of Crondor wandered a little farther south those many years ago, this would be the site for the capital of the Western Realm, not Crondor. The harbor was commodious, opening into a calm bay that was relatively safe for shipping during the worst weather in the bitter sea. The docks could be extended as needed, for miles if necessary, and a broad highway to the northeast provided easy access from land. Already traders were making their way to the military encampment, and businesses were springing up around the wooden stockade erected around the port. In a dozen years there would be a city here, thought Jimmy. He had ridden to the town as fast as he could drive his horse, and had gotten to Duco with his dispatches two days prior. He had rested for an entire day, sleeping most of the time. Duco had dispatched more patrols, and now messengers were returning with the latest intelligence. Jimmy had a very sore left shoulder, with a huge purple and blue bruise that was now turning green and yellow as it started to fade. Several small cuts had been dressed, and while feeling worse for the wear, he was on the mend and knew that in a few days he'd be fit once more. He had come to appreciate the former enemy general. Lord Duca was a thoughtful man, who, had he been born in the kingdom to a noble family, would have risen high, perhaps as high as to the very office in which a capricious fate had placed him. Somehow that reassured Jimmy, knowing that a very important position in the kingdom was being occupied by men of talent and intelligence. Jimmy had not asked Duca what had been contained in the orders sent by Prince Patrick. He knew the Duke would inform him of what Jimmy needed to know, and nothing more. Duca motioned Jimmy to another table, one which had been set with food and wine. Hungry? Jimmy smiled. Yes, he said, rising from his seat at the campaign table and moving to where the food was. I have no servants, said Duca. The ease with which your Keshian insinuated himself into the palace at Crondor makes me dubious of anyone here I do not know. I'm afraid that has not endeared me to those officers who previously held posts here. Those that weren't called north, I have moved to posts at the harbor or down in Land's End. Jimmy nodded. Not very politic, but very smart. The old general smiled. Thank you. My lord, said Jimmy, I am at your disposal. Prince Patrick wishes me to serve you here in any capacity you see fit, as well as serve as a liaison between your grace and the crown. So you're to be Patrick's spy in my court? Jimmy laughed. Well, you can appreciate his being somewhat dubious and a little cautious in dealing with as prodigious a former enemy as yourself, my lord. I understand, even if I'm not terribly happy. I think you'll find me useful, sir. You are going to discover yourself subject to some scrutiny for the foreseeable future, and not all of it from the crown. Many eastern nobles have sons and brothers whom they will wish to insert into vacant offices here in the West. Several will no doubt show up here unannounced. Some will be honest volunteers, younger brothers or sons looking to gain glory fighting cash, as did their ancestors. Others, however, will be seeking anything that can be used to discredit you, or another lord who is a rival to their lord, 
or simply to find such information to sell to interested parties. The politics of the Eastern Court is inherently lethal and complex. I can be of service in deflecting a great deal of such nonsense. I believe you, said Duco. I am first a soldier. But you don't become one of the top generals in my homeland without some facility at dealing with princes and rulers. They are in the main more concerned with their own vanity than in truly finding solutions to problems, and as often as not I had to guard against those who would work against my own interests within the court of my employer. We may not be all that unlike after all. Well, anyone who looks at the history of the kingdom, Your Grace, and thinks that for every victor there wasn't a vanquished, or that all the lands of the West embraced the kingdom with open arms, is a fool. It was the king's scribes who wrote history, and should you wish a slightly different perspective of our annexation of the West, I could recommend one or two histories published in the free cities that don't cast too kind a light on our rulers. History is written by victors, said Duco, but I have little use for history. It is the future with which I am concerned. Probably a wise attitude, given the present circumstances. Right now I am very concerned about that Kessian officer and what his escape may portend. Jimmy nodded. Malar was showing him the documents when we found them. He may have just been beginning to explain the significance of your orders. If it's nothing more than Krondor is vulnerable and the Kessians think will reinforce due to the discovery of the spy, we may avoid any problems up there. If he has any of the details of those messages memorized, he'll be able to tell his masters we can't reinforce Condor. Duco said, If I could chase the Kessians out of Land's End, that would help. Jimmy said, Yes, it would, but without additional soldiers, I can't see how you can accomplish that. Enduring a siege is one thing, but mounting an effective counteroffensive? He shrugged. With all that desert at their rear, I'm impressed how well the Kessians are resupplying the army facing Land's End, admitted Duco. If we could get part of the fleet down to intercept their shipping out of Durban, we might shake them loose. But short of that, I have no idea how we're going to dig them out. I've asked the prince for permission to dispatch Reeves and a squadron to raid off of Durban. He shrugged. The prince seems reluctant. Compared to previous wars with Cash, this is still a misunderstanding. Patrick is understandably reluctant to expand it, Jimmy said. I'm fresh out of ideas, my lord, he stood. If you'll excuse me, I think I'm going to take a walk and clear my head a bit. Otherwise I might find myself asleep at your table. Sleep, Heels, said Duco. If you feel the need of a nap, you'll not hear me say no. I've seen those marks the Cashian left on you. If I still feel the need after my walk, my lord, I'll speak a bit before supper. Duco waved his permission to withdraw, and Jimmy left. The inn converted to headquarters was busy, with many clerks supporting the demands of a headquarters command. Jimmy was amused at how the clerks and functionaries were rapidly overwhelming the far more casual approach traditional to the mercenaries from across the sea. At most, a captain from Novendus had to worry about organization and logistics on the same level as a baron, a few hundred men at most. A general such as Duco rarely had more than a few thousand men under his command. Now, suddenly, these disorganized swords for hire were being forced into acting like a tradition-bound, massively organized army. Jimmy suspected more than one clerk would earn a black eye or broken head from a frustrated soldier from Navindus before this campaign was through. If this campaign was ever through, thought Jimmy as he left the building to get a good look at Port Vicor. A crack of whips echoed through the evening air. Subai recognized the sound, even at a distance. He had heard it often enough as a child, living in the hills outside of Durban. His grandfather had been a member of the nearly legendary Imperial Keshian Guides, the finest scouts and trackers in the Empire. He had taught his grandson every trick and skill he could, and when the slavers raided the villages for boys and girls to take to the slave blocks, Subai had used those skills to hide. Then, one time, after a raid, he had returned to find his entire family dead, his father and grandfather's bodies hacked to pieces, his mother and sister missing. Only eleven years of age, he had taken his few possessions and set out after the men who had done this. 
By the time he had reached the Durban docks, Subai had killed three men. He had never found those who had taken his mother and sister, and Durban was, if anything, more lethal an environment than the hills nearby. He stowed away on a ship bound for Crondor, and had stayed hidden for the entire voyage. Knowing nothing else, he had found his way to a village outside the city, where he worked as a servant for a family who fed him and clothed him in exchange for work. At sixteen he returned to Crondor and enlisted in the prince's army. By the time he was twenty-five, Subai was the leader of the Pathfinders. But now, ten years later, he still remembered the sound of the slaver's whip as it cracked through the air. There were still five Pathfinders with him as they reached the area east of Quester's view. Two had been dispatched south already, carrying back intelligence to Marshal Greylock. There had been no fortifications like the one halfway between Sarth and Quester's view. There had been two observation towers, with relay riders ready to carry word when the kingdom forces reached a certain point in their journey north. Subai had drawn detailed maps showing them, and Eric's best avenue of approach was to take them out before they could send warning north. Subai had faith in Von Darkmoor, and knew his Crimson Eagles would take those positions quickly. Subai had left four of his pathfinders high in the hills above, where he and his companion worked their way down steep hillsides to oversee the sounds coming from the highway. Their horses were far enough above them now that they didn't worry about being discovered, unless the two men blundered into a sentry. Given the treacherous footing on the hills as they made their way down toward the coast, Subai doubted there even was a guard up here. Each step was made slowly, so as not to dislodge stones and send a man rolling down the mountain to his death. The trees were thick enough, there were ample handholds, but the going was difficult. When they reached the edge of a high ridge, with a veritable cliff below them to another steep slope fifty feet below, Subai knew the effort had been worth it. Without speaking, he withdrew a roll of fine parchment from within his tunic and removed a tiny box, along with some writing sticks. With economy, he sketched what he saw before him and added a few notes. At the bottom he wrote a short commentary, then he put away his writing implements. To his companion he said, Study what you see below. They remained for a full hour, watching as slave gangs of kingdom citizens dug deep trenches along the route Greylock's army would have to take. Walls were being built, but unlike the earthen barricade down south, these were huge constructions of stone and iron. A forge had been constructed near the front, and its hellish glow cast a reddish light over hundreds of poor wretches laboring for the invaders. Guards walked along, many carrying whips which they used to keep the miserable workers hard at their labor. The sound of sawing also reached them, and they saw a lumber mill had also been constructed near the coast. Riders came down the road, and wagons pulled by oxen slowly made their way toward the construction. As night fell, Subai said, We must be back up the hill, else we're stuck here through the night. He stood, and as he took a step, heard his companion say, Captain, look! Subai looked where the man pointed and swore. Along the road, as far as the eye could trace in the evening gloom, other lights burned brightly. More forges and torches and tantalizing hints that told to buy one cold fact. The kingdom could not win this war fighting the way it was. He started up the hill, knowing that he would have to wait until first light, then begin a long report to Greylock. Then he would have to race north and reach Yabon before it fell. With Lamut, Zun, and Illith in enemy hands, Subai realized the king and prince of Crondor did not realize how close they were to losing Yabon province forever. And should Yabon be lost, it would only be a matter of time before the invaders turned south again and attempted to retake Crondor and the west. 19. Decisions Wind swept the beach. Pug walked hand in hand with Miranda as the sun rose in the east. They had been walking and talking all night, and were close to agreement about several critical issues facing them. But I don't see why you have to do anything now, said Miranda. I thought after relaxing in Elvendar for those weeks and getting rid of all that anger you had directed at the prince, well, I thought you could just ignore Patrick's stupidity. 
Pug grinned. Ignoring stupidity in a merchant or servant is one thing. Ignoring it in a prince is quite a different thing. It's not the simple question of the sa'hour. That's merely a symptom. It's the entire issue of who is, at the end, responsible for my power. Me or the crown? I understand, she said. But why rush this decision? Why not wait until it's clear that you're being told to act against your conscience? Because I want to avoid a situation where I'm faced with two evils and must act to prevent the greater evil by embracing the lesser. Miranda said, Well, I still think you may be rushing things. I'm not about to fly to Crondor and explain my stance to Patrick until I've taken care of a few other things, Pug said. They climbed over some rocks and picked their way among some tidal pools. Pug said, When I was a boy in Crydee, I used to beg Tomas's father to let me go to the pools south of town, where I looked for rock claws and crabs. He made the best shellfish stew. Miranda said, Seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Pug turned, a youthful grin on his face, and said, Sometimes it seems like ages, but other times it's as fresh in my mind as yesterday. What about the Sa'awar? asked Miranda. That problem won't go away by dwelling in the past. For several nights, my love, I have been spending some time with one of the oldest toys in my collection. That crystal you inherited from Kulgan? The very one, fashioned by Athelfane of Kars. I have been scouring the globe, and think I may have found a place to which we can move the Sa'awar. Care to show me? Pug extended his hand and said, I need to practice that transport spell anyway. Put a protective shell around us, please. Miranda did so, and suddenly a bluish, transparent globe surrounded them. Don't materialize us inside a mountain again, and we won't need this. Pug said, I'm trying. He put his arm around her waist and said, Let's try this. Instantly the scene around them swirled, resolving itself into a vast, grassy plain. Where are we? asked Miranda. The Ethel Duath, in the local tongue, said Pug. The blue globe vanished, and they were struck by a hot summer wind. That sounds like Lower Delkian, said Miranda. The Duathian plain, said Pug. Come here. He walked her a few hundred yards south, and suddenly they were peering down the face of a towering cliff. Pug said, Sometime ages ago, this part of the continent rose up, while that down there fell. There's no portion of this cliff face less than six hundred feet high. There are two or three places you might climb, but I wouldn't recommend it. Miranda stepped off into the air and continued walking. She turned and looked down. That's quite a drop. Show off, said Pug. The lower portion of the continent was settled by refugees from Triasia during the purging of the Ishapian temple of the heretics of Almoral. That's the same bunch that settled down in Ovindus, said Miranda, walking back to solid ground. No people up here? No people, said Pug. Just a million or so square miles of grassland, rolling hills, rivers, and lakes, with mountains to the north and west and cliffs to the south and east. So you want to put the Sa'awar here? Until I come up with a better solution, said Pug. This place is large enough. They can live here for several hundred years, if need be. Eventually, I'll go back to Shiloh and rid that place of the remaining demons. But even then, it will take centuries to get enough life back on the planet to support the Sa'awar. Miranda said, What if they don't want to live here? I may not be able to afford them the luxury of a choice, said Pug. Miranda put her arms about Pug's waist. Hugging him, she said, just getting the feel of how much these choices are going to cost, aren't you? I never told you the story about the Imperial Games, did I? He asked. No, she said. He held her, and suddenly they were back on the beach on Sorcerer's Island. Now who's being a show-off? She demanded, halfway between amusement and anger. I think I have the hang of it now, he said with a wry smile. She playfully punched him in the arm. 
You're not allowed to think you have the hang of it. You damn well better know, unless you want to see how quickly you can erect a protective spell when you're materializing inside of rock. Sorry, he said, his expression clearly showing he wasn't. Let's get back to the house. I could use some sleep, she said. We've been talking all night. Lots of important things to discuss, he said, putting his arm back around her waist. They walked quietly for a short distance up to the path that led over the hill and back to the villa. I was a new great one, Pug began, and Hotcher Pippa, my mentor in the assembly, persuaded me to attend a great festival the warlord was orchestrating to honor the emperor, and to announce a great victory over the kingdom. He fell silent in remembrance. After a moment, he continued, Kingdom soldiers were pitted against soldiers of the Thruel, my wife's people. I became enraged. I can understand that, said Miranda. They continued to walk the path upward. I used my power to tear apart the Imperial Arena. I caused the winds to blow, fire to fall from the sky, rain, earthquakes, the whole bag of tricks. Must have been impressive. It was. It scared hell out of many thousands of people, Miranda. And you saved the men condemned to fight and die? Yes, replied Pug. But what? But to save two score of soldiers wrongly condemned, I ended up killing hundreds of people whose only crime was to be born on Kelawan and choose to attend a festival for their emperor. Miranda said, I think I understand. It was a temper tantrum, said Pug, nothing more. I could have found a better way to deal with it had I remained calm, but I let my anger consume me. It's understandable, she said. It may be understandable, replied Pug, but it is no more forgivable for being understandable. He paused at the top of the ridge that separated the beach from the interior of the island and looked out at the vista. Look at the sea. It doesn't care. It endures. This world endures. Shiloh will eventually endure. When the last demon starves to death, something will happen. A bit of life will fall from the sky in a meteor or on the winds of magic or by means I don't understand. Maybe it will be a single blade of grass hidden behind a rock the demons missed. Or some other tiny life that lingers at the bottom of the oceans will emerge and eventually that world will again see life thrive, even if I never return to it. What are you saying, my love? It's tempting to think of yourself as powerful when those around you are far less so. But compared to the simple fact of existence, to the power of life and how it hangs on, we are nothing. He looked at his wife. The gods are nothing. He looked toward their home. Despite my years, I am nothing more than a child when it comes to understanding these things. I know now why your father was always so driven to seek out new knowledge. I know why Nacor revels in each new thing he encounters. We are the same as children encountering a tiny bauble. He fell quiet. And Miranda said, Talking of children makes you sad. They walked down the sloping path, through a glade of trees, and approached the outer garden of their estate. They could see students gathered round in a circle, practicing an exercise Pug had given them the day before. When I felt my children die, it took all my willpower to keep from flying to confront the demon again, said Pug. Miranda lowered her eyes. I'm glad you didn't, my love. She still blamed herself for goading him into attacking the demon prematurely and almost losing his life in the process. Well, perhaps my injuries taught me something. Had I challenged J. Khan when he was still in Krondor, I might not have survived to defeat him at Sathanon. Is that why you avoid helping remove this General Fadawa from Illith? Patrick would be pleased for me to simply show up and burn the entire province of Yabon to the ground. He'd happily move settlers in from the east and replant trees, claiming a great victory. I doubt the people living there would agree, and neither would the elves or the dwarves who live nearby. Besides, most of those men are no more evil than those serving Patrick. 
I find matters of politics are of less interest to me every day. Wise, said Miranda. You are a force, as am I, and between the two of us we could probably conquer a small nation. Yes, said Pug with a grin, his first smile since telling of the arena. What would you do with it? Ask for Dawa, suggested Miranda. He obviously has plans. Entering the main building of the estate, Pug said, I have larger concerns. I know, she replied. There is something out there, said Pug, something I haven't encountered for years. What? I'm not sure, said Pug. When I know, I will tell you. Pug said nothing more. Both knew of the existence out in the cosmos of a great evil, the nameless one, who was at the root of all the troubles they had been facing for the previous century. And that evil had human agents, men whom Pug had encountered more than once in the past. Pug kept his thoughts to himself. But there had been one agent of Nalar, a mad magician named Sidi, who had created havoc fifty years before. Pug thought the man dead, but now he wasn't sure. If it wasn't Sidi he sensed out there, it was another like him, and either possibility left Pug feeling dread and fear. Dealing with these forces was a task beyond any Pug had imagined while he was a great one of the assembly, or during his early days of creating Stardock. It was a task that more than once left Pug feeling defeated before he had even begun. He thanked the gods that he had Miranda, for without her he would long before have given himself up to despair. Dash looked up and saw a face he knew. Tolwyn? The former prisoner walked past the two constables sitting at the table drinking coffee and getting ready for their next patrol. Can I speak to you in private? asked the man who had vanished right after Dash escaped from Condor. Sure, said Dash, standing up and waving the man to a far corner of the converted inn. When they were out of earshot of the constables, Dash said, I wondered what happened to you. I left you and Gustav outside a tent when I went in to report, and when I came back out I found only Gustav. Tallwyn reached inside his tunic and pulled out a faded parchment, obviously old. Dash read, To whoever reads this. The bearer of this document will be identified by a mole on his neck and a scar on the back of his left arm. He is a servant of the Crown, and I request all aid and assistance asked to be given to him without question. Signed, James, Duke of Crondor. Dash's eyebrows rose. He glanced at Tolwyn and saw the man pointing to the mole on his neck, then rolling up his left sleeve to show the scar on his arm. Who are you? Dash asked quietly. I was your grandfather's agent, and your father's after him. Agent? asked Dash. One of his spies, you mean? Among other things, said Tallwyn. And I don't suppose Tallwyn is your real name, said Dash. It serves, said Tallwyn. Lowering his voice, he said, As Sheriff of Crondor, you need to know that I am responsible for intelligence within the Western realm now. Dash nodded. Knowing my grandfather, he didn't hand out a lot of carte blanche. So that makes you a very important spy. Why didn't you show this to me before? I don't carry it on me. I had to go dig it out of its hiding place. If I'm searched and it's found on me by the wrong people, I'm dead. So why now? This city is barely intact, and while it appears to be crawling back from oblivion, it's very vulnerable. Your job is to ensure order, and my job is to ferret out enemy agents. Dash was silent for a moment. Very well. What is it you need? Cooperation between us. Until the palace staff is restored and I can work out of there unseen, I need to work someplace where I can be seen poking around in all parts of the city without people asking too many questions. You need a job as a constable, supplied Dash. Yes. When the present danger is over and the city more secure than it is, I'll move back to the palace and get out of your hair. Right now I need to be a constable. Do you report to me? asked Dash. No, said Tallwyn. I report to the Duke of Crondor. 
There is no Duke of Crondor, said Dash. Not at present, but until there is, I report to Duke Brian. Dash inclined his head to show that made sense. Have you alerted him to your existence? Not yet, said Tolwyn. The fewer people who know of me, the better. Rumor has it the king is sending Rufio, Earl Delamo, from Rhodes to take the office. If true, I'll let him know who I am as soon as he arrives. Dash said, I'm not happy with having a constable here under false colors. But I know the business. Just to make sure if there's anything going on out there I should know about, you tell me. I'll do that, said Tolman. Now, what else do you need from me? I need to know who killed your two men. Suddenly Dash had an insight. You mean who killed your two agents, don't you? Tolwyn nodded. How did you guess? The mockers. Someone told me I needed to find out what Nolan and Riggs did before joining up. They spent a lot of time working the docks for your grandfather and your father. We kept low during the fall of the city and managed to stay alive. I was captured and stuck on the damn work gang until you showed up. I couldn't risk showing anyone I knew the way out, and I couldn't get free of guards and other prisoners. But when you organized that break, it was a godsend. Getting us past the mockers was a bonus. Glad to be of service, Dash said dryly. Nolan and Riggs were also in work gangs, and they got sprung when Duco made his deal with the prince. I put them into your service because I need to get my network reestablished. He looked pained as he said, they were my last two agents in this city. So you have to start from scratch? Yes, said Torwin. It's the only reason you're being told all this. Dash said, I understand. Look, circumstances say we must work together. Someone killed one of my better snitches when I started asking about who murdered your men. Someone in Crondor doesn't want us too close, said Torwin. Anyway, we don't have enough warm bodies to do all the jobs that need to be done. Sniff around, and I won't bother you with a regular beat. If anyone asks, you're my deputy, and on errands for me. I think we'd better quickly get another man in on this. Oh, Gustav is as rock-solid as he can be. Not my idea of an agent, said Tolwyn dubiously. Not mine either, admitted Dash. But we can't all be sneaky bastards. I want a third person knowing what's going on, so if we both end up dead, he can run off to Brian Silden and let him know why. I don't think we want him crawling through the sewers. Agreed, but we need some people crawling through the sewers. Dash grinned. Not really. We just need to make a deal with the right people. Mockers? They think another gang is trying to move in, but you and I know better. Tolwyn nodded. Agents from Kesh or from Quegg? Or both? But whoever they are, we have to root them out and quickly, because if word gets out to either of those nations that we're sitting here with less than five hundred men under arms in the entire city, we could all be dead before the snows fall next winter. I'll take care of the mockers, said Dash. You find yourself some agents. I don't want to know who they are unless you stick them in here as constables. Agreed? I assume you're using intermediaries. Safe assumption. Make a list and give it to me. I'll hide it in my room in the palace. He grinned. I actually manage to get back there once a week to change clothes and bathe. I'll leave a sealed message with Lord Brian and open upon my death message telling where the list is. Tolwyn said, When the network is reestablished, I'll want the list destroyed. Gladly, said Dash. But what good are agents out there going to do if you and I are both gone and there's no one to get the information to the Crown? I understand, said Tolwyn. Come with me, said Dash. He took Tolwyn back to the center of the room. To the two resting constables, he said, This is Tolwyn. He's been appointed the new deputy. He'll work the desk when I'm not here. You two, take him around and show him what things are like, then do what he tells you. Tolwyn nodded, and Dash fetched him a red armband. When the agent left, Dash sat down and returned to work. He idly wondered how many other little surprises were out there, left in place by his grandfather and father. Jimmy said, 
The fancy fellow on the very hot stallion is a gentleman named Marcel Duval, squire of the king's court, and a very close friend to the eldest son of the Duke of Bastyra. Hot stallion appeared to be correct, for the black stud snorted and pawed the ground and appeared to be ready to dump his rider at any moment. The squire didn't attempt to get off until an orderly ran over and took the animal's bridle. Then he dismounted quickly, putting distance between himself and the horse. Duco laughed. Why did he pick that fractious creature? Vanity, said Jimmy. You see a lot of that east of Malak's Cross. And what company is that? asked Duco. His own private guard. Many nobles in the east indulge themselves with such companies. They're very pretty on parade. Looking at the company of soldiers that accompanied the squire, it was obvious it was a unit designed for parade, not combat. Each man sat astride a black horse, nearly identical in size, and all without a marking. Each soldier wore buckskin-colored leggings tucked into knee-high black cavalier boots, the large knee-flaps of which were rimmed in scarlet cord. The color was an exact match to their red tunics, which were trimmed in black whipcord at shoulders, sleeve, and collar. Their polished steel breastplates appeared to be trimmed in brass, and each man had a short yellow cape slung over the left shoulder. Atop their heads they endured steel round helms, trimmed in white fur, with polished steel neck chains. Each man carried a long lance of lacquered black wood, tipped with brilliantly polished steel. Duco couldn't resist laughing. They're going to get dirty. Suddenly Jimmy started to laugh, and he could barely contain himself as the squire walked up the steps of the inn to the front door. As the door opened, one of Duco's old soldiers said, a gentleman to see you, my lord. Duco walked over to Duval, his hand extended, saying, Squire Marcel, your reputation precedes you. It was protocol for the squire to introduce himself to the duke, and Duval was taken completely off guard. He stood there, unsure of whether to take the duke's proffered hand or bow, so he gave a rapid and awkward bow and reached out to take the duke's hand just as it was being withdrawn. Jimmy almost hurt himself, trying not to laugh. Uh, "'Your Grace,' said the flustered squire from Bostyra, "'I've come to place my sword at your disposal.' He saw Jimmy standing off to one side and said, "'James?' "'Marcel,' Jimmy said with a slight bow. "'I didn't know you were here, squire.' "'It's Earl now, actually,' said Duco. Marcel's eyes widened, which heightened his comic appearance. For while he was dressed exactly like his men, he had elected to wear a larger helm with stylized wings on each side. He had a round face with a large waxed mustache that stuck out on either side. Congratulations, said Marcel. Jimmy couldn't resist. I received the office upon my father's death, he said seriously. Marcel Duval had the decency to blush a furious red color, stammer, and appear close to tears over the gaff. I'm so sorry, my lord, he said, with a tone so apologetic it bordered on the comical. Jimmy swallowed a laugh and said, Glad to see you, Marcel. Duval ignored the remark, totally defeated socially. He turned to Duco and, mustering as military a manner as he could, said, I have fifty lancers at your disposal, my lord. Duco said, I'll have my sergeant get your men billeted, squire. As long as you're in my command, you'll carry the rank of lieutenant. Join us for supper. Duco shouted, Martak! The old soldier who opened the door said, Yes? Show this officer and his men a place they can pitch their tents? Yes, my lord, said the old soldier, holding open the door to allow Duval to flee. When he was gone, Jimmy laughed, and Duco said, I take it you didn't get along with him before? Oh, Marcel is harmless of a bore, said Jimmy. When we were boys in Milanon, he was always trying to intrude into social situations to which he had not been invited. I think he was trying to get on Patrick's good side. Jimmy sighed. It was Patrick who couldn't stand him, actually. Francie, Dash, and I got along well enough with him. Francie? asked Duco. Jimmy's expression clouded over, as memory of her suddenly inserted itself in his consciousness. The Duke of Silden's daughter, Jimmy supplied. 
Well, he has fifty men. We'll get them into shape, and if nothing else, they'll be very obvious on patrol, so the Keshians will know they're around. And they'll be hard to miss in those scarlet tunics, said Jimmy. A knock came at the door, and it opened, and a messenger hurried in. Handing a packet to Jimmy, he said, Messages from Land's End, my lords. Jimmy took them, opened the packet, and Duco waved the messenger outside. Jimmy quickly sorted out those messages that were urgent and other communiques that could wait, then opened the first. Damn, he said as he skimmed the letter. The Duke was learning to read the King's tongue, but it was more efficient to let Jimmy read and sum up for him. Another raid, and this time two villages south of Land's End were sacked. Captain Kuvak is withdrawing from patrolling there, as the villagers have fled and they no longer require the Earl's protection. Duco shook his head. Some protection? Had he been protecting those villages, they wouldn't be sacked. Jimmy knew the static front was wearing on everyone's nerves, especially the Duke's. Kuvak had been one of Duco's most trusted officers, which is why he had been selected to oversee the defense of the castle at Land's End. Jimmy jumped to the end of the report. They still give the castle wide berth, and he's routed two other raids in the area. Duco walked back to the window and looked out at his rapidly growing town. I know Kuvak's doing the best he can down there. It's not his fault. He looked at the map. When will they come? The Cassians? They're not going to do this forever. There's a reason behind the raids and the probes. They will eventually show us what their intent is, but it may be too late. Jimmy was silent. While ambassadors were negotiating at Stardock, men from both nations were dying. Jimmy knew that the strike would come if and when the Cassians decided they could strengthen their negotiating position by doing so. A strike at the Vale of Dreams, an attempt to seize the western coast from Land's End to Port Vicor, or a strike directly at Crondor, all were possible. And they were only able to defend two of those three locations, so they had a one in three chance of being wrong, tragically wrong. And lingering in the back of his mind was that escaped Cassian officer, and what he knew. Up here, said Dash. Turning and looking up, Trina smiled, and Dash was again struck with how attractive she could be should she ever decide to play up her looks. You are getting better, Sheriff Puppy. Dash leaped down from the roof beam upon which he had rested, landing lightly on his feet. I found out who Nolan and Riggs worked for, said Dash. And? So I know whoever killed them is neither friend to the Crown nor the Mockers. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Dash grinned. I wouldn't go that far. Let's say that it suits our mutual interest to cooperate in discovering who else is using the sewers as a highway, besides the thieves. Trina leaned back against the wall and looked Dash up and down in a praising fashion. When we were told you were to be in charge of the city's security, we thought it a bit of a joke. I guess not. You're more like your grandfather than not. You knew my grandfather? asked Dash. Only by reputation. Our old friend held your grandfather in awe. Dash laughed. I have always understood how special my grandfather was, but I never thought of him that way. Think on it, Sheriff Puppy. A thief who became the most powerful noble in the kingdom? That's a tale. I guess, said Dash. But to me he was always grandfather, and those stories were always just wonderful stories. What do you propose? asked Trina, changing the topic. I need to know if you catch sight of any of these strangers in a sewer, especially if you discover where they're hiding. Trina said, You know who they are? I have my suspicions, said Dash. Care to share them? Would you, in my place? She laughed. No, I wouldn't. What is in it for the mockers? Dash said, I should think you'd just want them gone if they're causing you problems. They are causing us no problems whatsoever. Nolan and Riggs we knew because they've bought information from us before, and they've set up a few deals. We always suspected they were working for some businessmen in the city, like Avery and his bunch, who didn't wish to conduct business in the usual fashion, or a noble who wasn't entirely above board in paying taxes, that sort of thing. Dash realized she was fishing for information. 
Whoever Nolan and Riggs were working for prior to the war, they were my men when they got their throats cut. I don't care if it was over some old grudge or because they happened to wander into the wrong place at the wrong time. I cannot afford to have people running around this city thinking they can kill my constables. It's that simple. If you say so, Sheriff Puppy. But there's still the matter of price. Dash had no illusions. It was a waste of his time to make any sort of warfare. Ask the old man what he wants, but I won't compromise the city's security. I'll look the other way about a capital crime. I'll get what I want without your help. I'll ask him, said Trina. She started to leave. Trina, said Dash. She stopped and smiled. You want something else? Dash ignored the double entendre. How is he? Trina lost her smile. Not well. Is there anything I can do? Her smile returned, this time a small one, without any hint of mockery. No, I don't think so. But it's good of you to ask. Dash said, well, he is family. Trina was silent for a long minute. Then she reached out and touched Dash's cheek. Yes, more than I thought. Then, with a sudden turn, she was out the door and down the street into the darkness. Dash waited a few minutes, then ducked out the back of the old building. He felt an odd sensation inside. He didn't know how much of it was concern for the old man's health, worry over the possible infiltration of Keshian agents into the city, or the woman's touch on his cheek. Muttering to himself, Dash said, If only she wasn't so damned attractive. Putting aside the distractions of a beautiful woman, he turned his mind back to the problems of protecting the city of Crondor. 20. Clash Men shouted. Eric motioned the third element of the infantry forward, and they marched out into the killing zone. The heavy ram had breached the door, and the first and second waves had swarmed the gates and were now inside the barricade. Resistance had been heavier this time, but as with the first two barricades they had encountered, the defense was more for show than for real resistance. The messages from Subai had Eric and Greylock worried, for his picture of the defenses ahead had Eric concerned that they simply were not equal to the task of breaking through in time to rescue Yabon. The summer was nearly half over, with the festival of Banifis only a week away. If there were heavy fall rains or an early winter snow, they could lose Yabon province for good. And if they lost Yabon this year, it was possible they would lose Crondor again the next. If not sooner. Eric could not escape the feeling that Crondor lay naked and ready for the taking, if Kesh should simply realize that fact. He hoped the negotiations at Stardock were proceeding well. He pushed aside his worry and looked at Owen. The night marshal of Crondor nodded, and Eric spurred his own horse forward. For whatever reasons, Owen had ordered Eric to remain behind at the headquarters tent, rather than lead the first assault as was Eric's desire. The fighting was fierce for an hour, then suddenly the defense collapsed. Eric moved his horse through the gate and realized that, once again, they were facing an enemy that lacked the resources for a sustained defense. Eric rode around and saw that everything was now under control. As before, he dispatched light cavalry to ride up the road, seeking those fleeing northward, preventing any from reaching their own lines. Greylock appeared at the gate of the barricade, and Eric rode toward him. This is pointless, he said. If what Subai says is true, we should have sat outside the wall and starved them out. Owen shrugged. The prince's orders didn't give us leave to tarry. He looked about the scene unfolding around them and said, Though if you put a dagger to my throat, I'd be forced to agree with you. He stood up in his stirrups. My backside longs for a comfortable chair by the fire at the inn of the pintail, a jack of ale in my hand, and your mother's stew in front of me. Eric grinned. I'll mention that to mother when next I see her. She'll be fluttered. Owen returned to the smile, then seemed to leap out of his saddle, backward, spinning over the rear of his horse and landing hard on his back. His horse sprang forward. Eric looked in all directions, and all he could see were mercenaries throwing down their swords, putting their hands in the air, and being herded to rear positions. A few signs of struggle could still be seen, and there was sporadic combat in the distance, 
But whoever shot the crossbow bolt that had felled Greylock was nowhere to be seen. Damn! Eric leaped from his horse and raced to where Greylock lay. Before Eric's knee touched the ground next to his old friend, he knew the dreadful truth. A crossbow bolt protruded from above the breastplate Owen wore, and it had smashed the upper portion of his chest and lower throat to pulp. Blood flowed everywhere, and Owen's eyes stared lifelessly at the sky above. Eric felt a cold stab of anger and hopelessness. He felt like screaming, but resisted the impulse. Owen had always been a friend, even before Eric had become a soldier, and they had shared a love for horses, an appreciation of the great wines from the Darkmoor region, and the fruits of honest labor. Looking down at the lifeless form of his old friend, Eric's mind was awash with images, laughter over jokes, losses endured together, and the approval of an old teacher who was generous in his praise and frugal in his criticism. Eric turned, and his eyes sought out Owen's killer. A short distance away, he spied two kingdom soldiers arguing. One held a crossbow, and the other pointed in his direction. Eric leaped to his feet and ran to face them. What happened? Both men looked as if the killer god Giswa had appeared before them. One of them looked as if he was ready to vomit. Perspiration appeared on his brow as he said, Captain, I was... What? demanded Eric. The man appeared close to tears as he said, I was about to shoot when the order to hold was called out. I put the crossbow over my shoulder, and it went off. That's true, said the other man. He fired it backward. It was an accident. Eric closed his eyes. He felt a shaking in his body start at his feet and run up his legs to his groin and up through his chest. Of all the jokes he had endured in his short life, this was the most cruel. Owen had died at the hands of one of his own men, by accident because the man had been lazy and sloppy. With a hard swallow, Eric forced back his frustration and rage. He knew there were other officers in the army who would hang this man for not unloading his crossbow and costing the kingdom the life of their commander in the West. He looked at the two men involved in the accidental shooting and said, Go away. They didn't hesitate, but ran as if wishing to be as far away from the giant young captain as possible when his rage finally erupted. Eric stood motionless a moment, then turned back to see soldiers gathered around the body of Owen Greylock, Knight Marshal of Crondor. Eric calmly moved through them, gently but firmly pushing them aside until he was once again beside his old friend. He knelt next to Owen and scooped him up in his arms, as if carrying a child, and turned toward the gates. The battle was not quite over, but the situation was well in hand, and Eric felt a need, a duty, to carry his old friend back to his command pavilion. He would not trust the task to another. Slowly he walked back down the road, holding his dear friend. The officers had assembled, and the silence was awkward. Eric stood beside Owen's empty chair of command. He glanced around the room. There were a dozen captains senior to him, but none holding the unique position of captain of the Prince's Crimson Eagles. The nobility in the tent was also senior to him but none of them were part of Patrick's command structure. Eric self-consciously cleared his throat, then said, My lords, we are faced with a dilemma. The night marshal has fallen, and we are in need of a commander. Until Prince Patrick appoints one, we need to be united in our duty. He looked around the tent. Many eyes regarded him suspiciously. If Captain Supai were here, I would easily accept him as leader, given his years of service to the Principality. Or if Captain Callus, my predecessor, were here, he also would easily ascend to the office of commander. But we have a situation both dangerous and awkward. Eric looked at one old soldier, the Earl of Makurlich, and said, My Lord Richard. Captain? Of those here, you are senior in service and age. I would be honored to follow your command. The minor earl, from a small corner of the kingdom located outside Deep Taunton, appeared both surprised and pleased. He glanced around the tent, and when no one seemed to object, he said, I will serve as interim commander until the prince names another, Captain. There seemed an almost palpable sigh of relief in the tent, as the conflict between the prince's hand-picked captain and the more traditional nobles was avoided for the time being. 
the Earl of McCurlich said, Let us get the Knight Marshal on his way back to Crondor. Then I want a meeting of all senior staff immediately after. Eric von Darkmore saluted and said, Sir, and left the tent before anyone could say another word. He hurried in search of Jod O'Shotty, for he needed to make sure his own men knew what they must do before any other officer could find them and send them off on another mission. He might give public acknowledgment to the new commander, but he wasn't about to turn his own men over to the whim of a man who a year before had been hosting parties at his peaceful seaside estate a half-continent away. Save those soldiers guarding prisoners, the entirety of the kingdom's army of the West stood at attention as the wagon carrying Greylock's body rolled south. Men who barely knew the Knight Marshal of Crondor stood side by side with men who had served every step of the way with Owen. Despite the previous day's victory, there was a grim mood in camp, as if everyone sensed that the easy victories were behind them now, and that the future held only more loss and suffering. Drummers beat a slow tattoo, and a single horn blew farewell, and as the wagon passed each company on parade, they dipped their banners and the men saluted, fist over heart, head bowed, until the wagon moved on. When the last company on parade was left behind, a company of Crondorian lancers, twenty hand-picked men, fell in, ten on each side of the wagon, to escort the leader of their army back to the capital. Each company commander dismissed his men, and Richard, Earl of McCurlich, sounded an officer's call. Eric hurried to the command tent, putting aside his discomfort at seeing someone else sitting in Owen's old chair. Earl Richard was an old man, gray hair and blue eyes, his dominant features. His long face seemed worn by years of duty, but his voice was strong and without hesitation when he spoke. I am appointing Captain von Darkmoor, my second in command, gentlemen to keep as much continuity as possible. For that reason, I'm asking all of you to return to your previous assignments and to funnel all communications through Captain von Darkmoor. I will instruct my son, Leland, to assume command of our cavalry units from McCurlich. That will be all. The nobles and other officers departed, and Richard said, Eric, stay a moment. Sir? asked Eric when they were alone. I know why you chose me, son, said the old officer. You've a fair grasp of politics. I appreciate that. What I don't appreciate is any thought you might have of using me for your own gains. Eric stiffened. Sir, I will follow your orders and offer you the best counsel of which I am capable. Should you find my service lacking, you may remove me at your pleasure, and I will not voice objection even to the prince. Well said, replied the earl. But now I need to know your heart. I've seen you lead men in the field, von Darkmoor, and the reports of your actions last year at Nightmare Ridge do you credit. But I need to know I can depend on you. My lord, said Eric, I have no ambitions in this. I am a reluctant captain, but I serve to my utmost. If you wish to replace me and have me serve at the van of my men, I will acknowledge your orders and depart immediately to fulfill whatever mission you name. The old man studied Eric a while longer, then said, That won't be necessary, Eric. Just tell me what's going on. Eric nodded. He outlined his fears and Greylocks, that they were being lulled by a series of modest defenses to have them charge foolishly into Fadawa's real southern position. Eric pointed to a stack of parchments. Subai's messages are there, sir, and I suggest you read them. Eric pointed to the map on the table before Earl Richard. We're here, and about here, his finger jumped up the map about sixty miles, we should hit the first serious defensive position. If what Subai writes is accurate, it's going to be hell to pay getting to Illith. I assume you've considered all the alternatives, landing on Free City's soil and attacking from the west, attempting to land outside the harbor and the rest? Eric nodded. I'll want you to cover those discarded options for me later, just in case I might think of something you and Owen missed. But I'm certain you didn't miss anything. Assuming that's true, what do we do next? Eric said, 
I want to take a patrol and go north and see how far I can get before things get nasty. I want to see what Subai saw, my lord. Richard, Earl of McCurlidge, said nothing for a long moment, his mind weighing options. Then he said, I sent a letter to Prince Patrick asking him to relieve me of this command, but until he does, I suppose I should act like a commander. Here's what you do. Send those Hadati Hill men ahead up the right flank. They can move through the hills better than anyone we have. Have them leave at once. Then send a company of your Crimson Eagles up the left flank, along the coast, but out of sight. Then at first light tomorrow, I want you and my son to lead a patrol of cavalry up the highway. Be as loud and careless as you wish. Eric nodded. That should flush out anyone looking to lay an ambush. If the guards were kinder, you'd all ride into Illith at the same time and hoist an ale. The guards, however, have been short on kindness toward the kingdom of late. He looked up and saw Eric still standing there. Well, go. Dismissed. Whatever it is, I'm supposed to say. Eric grinned at the old man. Yes, sir, he said with a salute, and he was off. Tallwind signaled from outside the building, and Dash waved a reply through the open front door. He then motioned with his hand, indicating Tallwin and the men next to him should circle around the next block of buildings and come up behind the men they stalked. Their targets, four men who had been waiting for a fifth for the last half hour, were gathered together in a workyard behind an abandoned shop in the poor quarter. Tallwin vanished into the night with his men. It had taken Dash, with the help of the mockers, a week to discover this meeting place. Tallwin had identified three men who were very likely to be Keshian agents, and the fourth was either another agent or their employee. Dash had overheard enough snippets of conversation to know they were getting restless, waiting for someone, and would soon leave if that person didn't show up. Dash wanted Tallwin and the two constables with him, ready to come in from the other side of the yard, through a broken-down fence next to an alley. Dash and his men were in an old shop, hiding by hanging above the main floor in the rafters. A glance into the murk of the shop's ceiling showed his three men crouched uncomfortably on the roof beam. He'd better get them down soon, he thought, or they'd be too stiff to move. Dash motioned, and the three men hung from their fingers, then dropped quietly to the floor. Dash crouched low so as not to alert the men out back, as he was closest to the open door. "'Is not coming,' said one of the four men, a muscular man dressed like a common laborer. We should split up and meet somewhere else tomorrow. Maybe they got him, a second man said. He was thin and dangerous looking, and bore a sword and dagger at his belt. Who? asked the first man. Who do you think? offered the first man. The prince's men. They'd have to be quicker than they've been so far, came the voice of a man ducking into view from the next building. You almost got nicked, he said. What do you mean? asked the first man. I saw constables hurrying away from just in front of this building. They looked like they was looking through the door. They must have just missed you all. Dash decided it was time. He pulled his sword and ran from his hiding place, his three constables behind him. The first man turned and fled, running right into Tallwin as he climbed through a large hole in the fence. Put down your weapons, Dash commanded. Four of the men put down weapons, but the one slender man, the one Dash had judged dangerous, pulled his. Run! he shouted to his companions, and as if to buy them time, he launched a two-weapon attack on Dash. Dash had practiced against this style of fighting before, but this man was very good at it. One of his constables tried to come to his aid, but only managed to almost get Dash killed. Back off, Dash commanded after he slipped aside of a thrust, while his constable moved away. Tolwyn walked up behind the slender man and slammed him in the back of the head with a hilt of his sword. Dash, frustrated at the long wait, turned to his constable and shouted, That's how you do it! You hit them from behind! You don't leap in and almost get someone killed! Got it? The constable nodded, looking embarrassed, and Dash turned to inspect the other prisoners. The fifth man, the one who arrived last, looked familiar to Dash. Dash studied him for a moment, then his eyes widened. I know you! You're a clerk from the palace! The man said nothing, looking terrified. Tallwin said, Let's get this bunch to the palace for some questioning, if you agree, Sheriff. Good idea, deputy, said Dash. 
The other members of the constabulary knew something odd was going on with Tolwyn, but no one had voiced any concerns, or at least not within Dash's hearing. Dash, Tolwyn, and the other five constables ordered two of the prisoners to pick up their unconscious comrade and started them on their way to the palace. They're not Keshian, said Tolwyn, as he closed the door behind them. Then who are they working for? asked Dash. They were in Dash's room, unused since he had been given the office of sheriff. I think they're working for the Keshians, but they may not know that. Dash had appropriated five rooms in the palace in which each of the prisoners was isolated. He didn't want them talking to one another before questioning each in turn. Tolwyn had briefly spoken to each man before beginning intensive questioning. He said, We've got one interesting case. Pickney, a clerk from the prince's office. The rest of them are... odd. One vagabond swordsman, one baker, a stable hand, and a journeyman mason. Dash said, Hardly the lot I'd pick for conspiracy. Tolwyn said, I think they're dupes. Not one of them has the wits of a bug. Pickney worries me. I'd worry a little about that swordsman. Des Garden, supplied Tolwyn, is the happy blade who tried to kill you. Des Garden, repeated Dash. He was willing to try to fight his way out rather than be captured. Either he has an inflated sense of his own ability with a sword, or he's just as stupid as I think he is. Stupid he may be, said Dash. But unlike the other three, he's not what I would consider a stand-up citizen. He has the look of someone who knows his way around the back alleys and sewers. He may be part of those who are causing some troubles in the poor quarter. Tallwin nodded. Well, let me squeeze them and see what I can find out. Dash said, Good. I think I'm going to sleep in my own bed tonight. It's been a month. Tallwin said, By the way, I should be leaving your service at the end of the week. Oh, said Dash, with a slight smile. Have I been that difficult an employer? Duke Rufio arrives. It's been confirmed he's to be Duke of Cronto? Not publicly, said Tallwin. You didn't hear that from me. Dash waved away the man, who closed the door while Dash took off his boots. He lay back on his own bed and marveled at how soft his heavy down mattress was compared to that straw thing in the back of the jail. He was wondering if he should take this one back with him when he fell asleep. He came awake suddenly when someone pounded on his door. What? he said sleepily, opening his door. Tallwind said, We need to talk. Dash waved him inside. How long was I asleep? A few hours. It wasn't long enough said Dash. We have a grave problem. What? asked Dash, coming awake. Those five are dupes, as I suspected, but they were working for someone inside the palace, and from what I can tell, he's an agent for cash. Inside the palace? Tarwin nodded. The clerk believes him to be someone connected with a business concern. He thinks it might be your old employer, Rupert Avery. Hardly said Dash. Whatever Rue needs to know, he simply asks. The Crown owes him so much gold, we usually tell him. I know. He's well connected with you, Von Darkmoor, and others. But that's what Pickney believed. Desgarden, on the other hand, thinks he's working for a band of smugglers from Durban. Cut to it. What's going on? These five and others, I'll warrant, were gathering information on the deployment of resources... Soldiers, the condition of defenses, every potentially valuable bit of information an enemy might want. They were feeding it to someone here in the palace. Now I'm confused. I could see someone in the palace feeding the information to someone outside. But from outside in? That's what had me puzzled for a bit. But the fact is the person inside the castle they were reporting to wasn't part of Patrick's staff. Who was it? Tallwin said, A man who was working here when Patrick arrived, but who stayed on when Duco left. A man who seemed to be everywhere when someone needed help with documents or messages. A man named Malar Anaris. Dash said, God! He's that servant we met out in the woods last winter. He claimed to be from the Vale. Tallwin shook his head. 
If we had access to your grandfather's documents, I bet we'd find his name amongst those on a list of agents of great cash. Suddenly, Dash was concerned about his brother. I need to see if there are any messages in from Duco down at Port Vicor in the last few days. And R.S. left with your brother, right? Right, said Dash. If he's a Cashian agent, he's either already left for Cash to let them know how bad things are in the city, or he's down in Port Vicor doing more harm. Send word to Duco, and if your brother has arrived there safely, let me know. Are you quitting the constabulary today? asked Dash as he pulled on his boots and moved to the door. I think so. Once the new Duke is in his office, I need to repair the damage done during the war. There are agents who reported to me who don't know I'm still alive. There are agents I don't know are dead yet. Your grandfather had a marvelously devious mind and created a thing of beauty. It may take me the rest of my life, but eventually I'll get the intelligence network he made back in place. Well, as long as I'm the sheriff of Crondor, if you need help, let me know. I will, said Talwyn, following Dash through the door. Talwyn turned without another word and moved back toward the rooms in which the prisoners were kept, while Dash hurried toward the night marshal's office, where all incoming military messages would be logged before being sent to Prince Patrick or north to Lord Greylock. If Jimmy had sent word, it would be there. Dash picked up the pace and was almost running when he reached the door. The sleepy-looking clerk looked up and said, Yes, Sheriff. Has there been a message from Port Vicor in the last day or two? The clerk looked over a long scroll upon which the most recent messages were logged. No, sir. None in the last five days. Dash said, If one arrives any time soon, inform me at once. Thank you. He turned around and started back toward his room. Then he glanced outside and saw the sun was rising. Putting aside fatigue, he turned and started toward the door to the courtyard and the way back to the new market jail. He had a great deal of work to do, and it couldn't wait on worrying about his brother. Sheriff Puppy, came the voice through the window. Dash came awake. He had spent a long day keeping the city under control and had retired to the little room in the rear of the old inn he used for sleeping. Trina? he asked as he stood up to look through the shutters. Opening them, he saw the young woman's face illuminated by moonlight. Grinning, he stood there in his under-trousers. His shirt, trousers, and boots lay in a heap beside his straw mattress. Why do I doubt you came to my window because you couldn't bear to be away from me? She smiled back and took a moment to look him up and down, then said, You're a pretty enough boy, Sheriff Puppy, but I like my men with a little more experience. Dash started getting dressed. I feel like I've got enough experience for a man three times my age, he said. As much as I enjoy bantering with you, why did you wake me? We've got a problem. Dash grabbed his sword, handed it to Trina, then with a single vault grabbed the upper sill of the window and hauled himself through. Landing on the ground next to her, he said, We, as in you and me, or as in the mockers, as he took back his sword and buckled it around his waist. As in the entire city of Crondor, she replied. Suddenly, and apparently impulsively, she leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. I wasn't mocking you about being pretty. Dash reached out and put his hand behind her head, drawing her to him. He kissed her deeply and lingeringly. When he let her go, he said, I've known a lot of women despite my youth, but you're unique. He looked into her eyes a moment, then said, Let me know when I've got enough experience. Softly, she said, I'm a thief, and you're the sheriff of Crandor. Wouldn't that be a match? Dash grinned. Have I ever told you about my grandfather? She shook her head in irritation. We don't have time for this. What's the problem? We found that bunch who've been using the sewers and who probably killed your men. Where? Near that point where Kirby was found over by five points. There's a big tannery that was burned to the ground during the battle, but it's got a sub-basement, a big one and a long water entrance to the bay, as well as the usual sewer dumps. I want to see this. I thought you would. He started walking away when Trina said, Dash. He stopped and turned around. What? The old man. How is he? She shook her head slightly. Not much longer. Damn, said Dash, and he surprised himself at how sad knowing that his grandfather's brother was dying made him. Where is he? 
Someplace safe. He won't see you. Why? He won't see anybody but me and one or two others. Dash paused, then said, Who's going to take over? The girl grinned. I would tell the sheriff. Seriously, Dash said, You will if you get into enough trouble. I'll think on this, said Trina. They hurried through the night, and when they reached the abandoned northern quarter of the city nearest to the old tanneries and slaughterhouses, Trina led Dash through a series of back alleys and abandoned buildings. Dash memorized the route and realized that it had been cleared by the mockers so they would have a fast avenue of escape. They reached a burned-out row of shanties, barely more than a few charred walls and portions of roofs, bordering a large watercourse, a stone-lined channel that would flood during the rainy season, or that could be fed by water gates off the river that bordered the northeast corner of the city. In summer, with the gate destroyed, only a little water ran through the very center of the man-made stream. Trina jumped over it nimbly, and Dash followed her, marveling at just how lithe she was. She wore her usual man's shirt and black leather vest, tight leggings, and high boots. Dash could see she was both strong and fast. She headed straight toward a large open pipe in the far bank. It was old, fire-hardened clay, circled by a heavy iron band. Pieces of the clay had fallen away over the years where the pipe extended from the bank, and a three-foot length of metal could be seen to the upper lip of the pipe. With a prodigious leap, she vaulted to where she could grip the bar and swung herself into the pipe, vanishing from view. Dash waited a moment to let her get clear, then duplicated her leap. He discovered why as he swung over broken crockery, glass, and jagged metal. Landing behind Trina, he said, Not the normal garbage one expects. It discourages the idly curious. She moved on without another word, and Dash followed her. They moved deeper into the sewer network, the woman leading the way surely, though there was almost no light filtering down through the burned-out buildings above. At the first turn right, she turned and stopped, felt around, and produced a lamp. Dash smiled, but remained silent. The system still hadn't changed. She lit it and shuttered it. The tiny bit of light that was allowed to escape would provide ample illumination for their purposes, and someone more than a dozen feet away would have to be looking directly at the light source to notice it. Trina led Dash deep into the sewer system until they reached a confluence of two large pipes entering a third, with two smaller, though big enough for a person to crab walk through, emptying into the large circular cavern. This was five points. Trina pointed at the upper left of the two smaller pipes. As he poised to jump, she whispered, Trip wire. Dash pulled himself up and moved slowly and quietly in the dark, feeling around before him in case there might have been any additional alarms added. Trina would have warned him had there been one she knew about, but Dash's grandfather had impressed on him that people who took things for granted in these situations were called corpses. As he inched along, he found himself thinking of Trina. He had known many women since the age of fifteen, being handsome, noble, and the grandson of the most powerful man after the king in the nation. Twice he had been infatuated to the point of thinking he might be in love, but both times the notion had quickly passed. But something about this woman thief, with her mannish clothing, unkempt hair, and piercing stare, caught his imagination. It had been quite some time since he had known a woman, and that was part of it, but there was something more, and he wondered if circumstances would ever permit more than a casual flirtation. Dash froze. He was alone in the dark, looking for traps, and he was daydreaming about a woman. He scolded himself and heard his grandfather's voice in his mind. The old man would have had a great deal to say about this sort of inattention. Dash took a deep breath and began moving again. After a few minutes, he heard a sound ahead. It was little more than a whisper, but Dash waited. It came again, and with effort he made out what appeared to be a low conversation. He inched forward again. Suddenly he halted. Ahead of him he sensed something. He put his hand out and felt a line. He didn't move when his palm came into contact with it. He waited listening for an alarm, a sound, a voice, anything that would tell him he had alerted whoever had placed this line across the duct. When silence continued unbroken for a long while, he moved his hand back, waiting again. He touched it again as gently as possible and ran his finger to the right. 
he encountered a metal eye driven into the side of the duct, and there the line was tied. He moved his finger to the left and found another eyelet, but this time the line was threaded through and ran forward in the direction he was heading. He felt over and under the line to make sure there wasn't a second, and when he was satisfied this was the only line across the way, he moved back. With a little squirming he got on his back and crawled under the line. When he was past the line he again got up into his kneeling position and continued his careful progress. Soon he saw a dim light ahead, and he worked toward it. Again he heard voices, and again the conversation was just below his ability to hear it. He moved slowly forward. He reached a large catch basin, with a big grating overhead, and above him he could hear boots on the stone. From the stench at this end of the pipe, it was obvious the men had been using the catch basin to relieve themselves, and didn't have enough water to flush the pipe easily. What is that? came a voice from above, and Dash froze. It's a baked meat roll. It's got spices and onions baked into a bread crust. I got it at the market. What kind of meat? Dash moved closer. Beef, what do you think? Looks like horse to me. How could you tell by looking at it? You better let me taste it. Then I can tell. Dash moved around and craned his neck. He could see movement and a pair of boots. Much of his view was cut off by a chair near the catch basin grate and the man who sat on it. Cow, horse, what does it matter? You just want some because you didn't bring anything to eat. I didn't know we'd be spending our lives waiting here. Maybe the others ran into some trouble. Could be, but orders are clear enough. Wait here. Did you at least bring some cards? Dash settled in. Near dawn, Dash lowered himself out of the large pipe at five points. He found himself disappointed that Trina wasn't waiting. He knew she probably left a moment after he entered the pipe, but he still wished she had lingered. He found that feeling irrational alongside the distress he was experiencing over what he had found. Not wishing to stay too long, he hurried through the pipes and back toward the Newmarket jail. He knew that as soon as he got there, he was going to have to change clothing, then hurry to the palace. This wasn't a matter for the sheriff and his constables, but Brian Silden and the army. Dash forced himself to calmness, but if what he had overheard was any indication, someone was readying a staging area. Inside the city itself, a nest of soldiers was being prepared, soldiers who would appear within the walls of Crondor at some future date, and Dash was certain that date was not far off. 21. Mysteries The door opened. Nacor entered, shaking his head as he said, no, 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 this won't do. Rupert Avery looked up from the plans unrolled before him. He was standing on the newly refinished floor of what had once been Barrett's coffee house, watching workers repair the walls and roof above. What won't do, Nacor? he asked. Nacor looked up, surprised at being addressed. What? What won't do? Rue laughed. You were the one muttering that something wouldn't do. Was I? asked Nacor, looking surprised. How odd. Rue shook his head in amusement. You, odd, perish the thought, Nacor said. Never mind. I need something. What? asked Rue. I need to get a message to someone. Who? Oh, pug. Rue motioned Nacor away from the workers and said, I think you need to start at the beginning. I had a dream last night, said Nacor. I don't have many of them, so when I do, I try to pay attention. All right, said Rue. I'm with you so far. Nacor grinned. I don't think so. But that's all right. There's something going on. There are three pieces here, all seemingly separate, but they're all the same thing. And they all look to be about one thing, but they're about another. And after the odd thing that happened, I need to talk to Pug. Rue said, I am no longer with you. That's all right, said Nacor, squeezing Rue's upper arm in a reassuring fashion. Anyway, do you know where Pug is? No, but I can ask at the palace. Someone there might. Don't you have some sort of magic trick you can do that would get Pug's attention? Maybe. 
But I don't know if the damage would be worth it. I don't want to know, said Rue. No, you don't, agreed Nacor. He looked around as if noticing the work for the first time. What is this, then? No one's seen the old owner since the fall of the city, so either he's dead or not coming back. Even if he shows up, we'll work out a deal. Rue waved his hand around in an arc. I'm trying to restore this exactly as it was before the war. I'm very fond of this place. As you should be, said Nacor with a grin. You made a great deal of wealth here. Rue shrugged. That's part of it, but more importantly, this is where I made myself. You've come a long way, said Nacor. More than I could have imagined, said the one-time death cell prisoner. How is your wife? Getting large, he said, motioning with his hands as he grinned. I heard a rumor that you arrived in town with Lord Vesarius of Quegg as a prisoner. Rue said, He wasn't my prisoner. Is it a good story? Rue said, That's a very good story. Good, then you can tell me sometime. But first I need to ask about Pug. Rue put down his plans and said, Tell you what, I could do with a bit of a stretch, so let's walk over to the new market jail and visit with Dash Jameson. Fine, said Nacor, and they left the coffee house. Everywhere they looked, the city was slowly returning to the life they had known before the war. Each day another building was restored and another shop opened. More goods were coming into the city via the ferry outside of Fishtown or over the caravan routes. Rumor had it a large caravan from Kesh would arrive within the week, the first since before the fighting. As war hadn't formally been declared, trade between the kingdom and Kesh was resuming. If the Wreckers' Guild could continue raising ships, the harbor would be navigable the following spring, and fully restored within a year after that. Moving through the crowd, Nacor said, This city is like a person, don't you see? It was beat up pretty badly, agreed Rue, but it's coming back. More, said Nacor. There are cities that have no... I don't know what to call it. An identity, perhaps. A sense of being someplace different. Lots of those in the Empire. Very old cities with lots of history, but one day is much like the next. Crondor is a very lively place in comparison. Rue laughed, in a manner of speaking. They reached the market and saw the new market jail, now sporting a fresh coat of paint and bars on all the visible windows. Entering the door, they found a harried-looking clerk who looked up and said, Yes? We're looking for the sheriff, said Nacor. He's out in the market somewhere, and we'll be back here some time. Sorry, he said, returning to his paperwork. Rue motioned for Nacor to move outside. They stood on the porch looking at the press of people in the market. Vendors had organized themselves into a rough series of aisles, with the outer edge of the market a sort of random pattern of blankets with goods laid atop, carts overloaded with produce, men carrying boards covered with trinkets, and the furtive denizens who offered less than legitimate wares. Rue said, It could be anywhere. Nacor grinned. I know how to get his attention. Before Nacor could step down from the porch, Rue put a restraining hand on his shoulder. Wait. What? I know you, my friend, and if you think you're helping out by starting a riot so that every constable in the market comes running, think again. Well, it would be effective, wouldn't it? Do you remember an old proverb? Several. Which one do you have in mind? The one about not using an axe to remove a fly from a friend's nose? Nacor's grin broadened, and he laughed. I like that one. Anyway, the point is, we should be able to find Dash without starting a riot. Very well, said Nacor. Lead on. Rue and Nacor entered the press of humanity in the market. Rue knew that Crondor still had less than half its former population, yet it seemed even more crowded than before, mostly due to the largest portion of that population thronging to the market. While work was underway throughout the city in every neighborhood, the business of daily life was confined for the most part to the market. Rue and Nacor made their way past wagon after wagon with late spring and early summer harvest, squash, corn, grain in sacks, and even some rice up from above land's end. Fruit was offered, and so was wine and ale. A number of prepared food vendors filled the air with aromas both savory and pungent. Nacor sneezed as they passed one vendor of pakashka, 
a bread pocket filled with meats, onions, peppers, and pods. That man has so much spice on that meat, my eyes want to pop, he said, hurrying by. Rue laughed. Some people like their meats hot. I learned a long time ago, said Nacor, that too much spice often masks bad meat. As my father said, returned Rue, if there's enough spice on it, it doesn't matter if the meat's bad. Nacor laughed. They turned the corner and saw a group of men standing before a large wagon being used as makeshift tavern. Two barrels had been set up at each end of the wagon, and a board was set atop them to serve as a bar. Two dozen men idly stood around, drinking and laughing. As Nacor and Rue drew near, they quieted down and watched the two men pass. After they had moved down the street, Nacor said, That's odd. What is? He motioned over his shoulder. Those men? What about them? Nacor stopped and said, Turn around and tell me what you see. Rue did as he was asked and said, I see a bunch of workmen drinking. Nacor said, Look closer. Rue said, I don't see... What? Rue scratched his chin. There's something strange, but I can't quite tell what it is. Nacor said, Come with me, and led Rue off the way they had been heading. First of all, those aren't workers. What do you mean? They're dressed like workers, but they're not. They're soldiers. Soldiers? said Rue. I don't understand. You have more work than you have workers, correct? Yes, said Rue. That's true. So what are workmen doing standing around at this hour of the day drinking ale? I... Rue stopped. After a moment he said, Tim, I thought they were simply having their midday meal. That's the second thing. The midday meal isn't for another hour, Rue. And did you see how they stopped talking when we got too close? And how everyone around them gives them a wide berth? Rue said, Yes, now that you point it out. So the question is, what are soldiers doing standing around dressed like workmen getting drunk in the morning? Nacor said, No, that's not the question. They're standing around dressed like workmen getting drunk in the morning so that people will think they're workmen getting drunk in the morning. The question is, why are they trying to make people think they're workmen? I get the point, interrupted Rue. Let's find a dash. It took them only a half hour to spy a band of men wearing the red armbands, and when they overtook them, they found Dash leading them. Dash told his men to continue their patrol and said, Nacor, Rue, what can I do for you? Nacor said, Tell your great-grandfather I need to talk to him. But before that, there are men at a wagon bar over there, he pointed to the general area where they had passed the wagon, dressed like workmen, but they aren't. Dash nodded. I know. They are one of several bands like that throughout the market. Oh, said Rue. You know? Dash said, What sort of sheriff would I be if I didn't? The usual sort, said Nacor. Anyway, if you know about those men, we can talk about Pug. What about him? I need to see him. Dash's eyes narrowed. And you want me to do what? You're his great-grandson. How do you contact him? Dash shook his head. I don't. If father had means, he never told me. Or Jimmy, else I'd know. Grandmother merely had to close her eyes. Nacor nodded. I know that. Gamina could talk to him across the world at times. Dash said, I thought you'd have the means. Nacor said, I don't see him that much, except when we're both on the island. Maybe he's there. Nacor turned toward Rue. Can I borrow a ship to go to Sorcerer's Island? Rue said, If you haven't noticed, there's a full-blown war going on out there. He pointed toward the ocean. A free city ship might sail out there without being accosted. But a kingdom ship is either going to run into Quagan pirates, Keshian pirates, or Fadawa's pirates, unless you have a fleet. I might be tempted to lend you a ship, but I'm not lending you a fleet. Nacor said, I don't need a fleet. One ship will be fine. And the pirates? Not to worry, said Nacor with a grin. I have tricks. Very well, said Rowe. But what's the problem? Oh, I didn't tell you? No, said Rowe. He looked at Dash, who shrugged. You have to see this, said Nacor, setting off without bothering to see who was following. Rue looked at Dash, who said, 
We better see what this is all about. They hurried after Nacor so as not to lose sight of him, and the little man walked briskly through the city all the way to the eastern gate, the one which opened on the king's highway. By the time they got to this destination, Rue was almost out of breath. We should have ridden. I don't have a horse, said Nacor. I had a horse once, a beautiful black stallion, but he died. That's when I was Nacor the Blue Rider. Dash said, What did you want to show us? That, said Nacor, pointing to the statue he had erected a week earlier. A dozen people were gathered before the statue, looking and gesturing. Dash and Rue left the road and moved to where they could see what the travelers were looking at. Rue asked, What is that? Down the face of the statue, two red streaks could be seen below the eyes, marring the otherwise perfect face. Dash pushed his way past the onlookers and said, It looks like blood. It is, said Acor. The statue of the lady is crying blood. Rue hurried over and said, It's a trick, right? No, said Acor. I wouldn't stoop to cheap tricks, at least not where the lady is concerned. She's the goddess of good, and, well, I just wouldn't. All right, said Dash. I'll take your word for that, but what's causing this? I don't know, said Nacor, but that's nothing. You've got to see the other thing. He hurried off again. Dash and Rue exchanged glances, and Dash said, I can't wait to see what this other thing is. Again they followed the hurrying little man. Once more they entered the city gates, crossed through the eastern quarter of the city, and back across the city toward the market. Only this time they skirted the market to the south and headed over toward Temple Square. Rue was laughing as he struggled to keep up with Nacor. Why couldn't he have two marvels across the street from one another? Dash said, I have no idea. They reached the empty lot between the temples of Lim's Kragma and Giswa. Clerics from several other temples were gathered nearby, peering at the crowd gathered before a tent that was erected there. Where Nacor had found the tent, Dash had no idea. One day it wasn't there, the next day it was. A huge pavilion with enough room under it to comfortably accommodate a couple of hundred people. Dash firmly shoved his way through the crowd. Some people began to object until they saw the red armband. When they got to the entrance, Nacor and Rue a step behind, Dash stopped, and his mouth fell open. Gods! said Rue. Directly before them, his back toward them in a meditative position, sat Shopi and a half-dozen other acolytes of this new temple. In the center of the tent was the young woman, Alita. Only she was neither standing nor sitting. She was in a position identical to Shopi's, legs crossed, hands in her lap. And she was bathed in a nimbus of pure white light, which seemed to emanate from within her, suffusing the tent with light. But she floated six feet above the ground. Rue put his hand on Nacor's shoulder and said, I'll give you a ship. Dash whispered, Why my great-grandfather? Why not ask the other temple clerics? Because of that, said Nacor. Directly below the woman something hovered. Dash and Rue hadn't noticed it when they first entered, because of the startling sight of the young woman afloat. But now they could see there was a blackness hanging in the air, a cloud of something vile and terrifying. A clear certainty struck both Dash and Rue at the same time. The light from the young woman was confining that black presence, keeping it penned up. What is it? whispered Dash. Nacor said, Something very bad, something I didn't think I would see in my lifetime, and it's something Pug must know about as soon as possible. The temple clerics will know about it soon enough, and they have an important part, but Pug must know about this. He looked at Dash in the eyes. He must know soon. Rue grabbed Nacor by the arm. I'll take you out to Fishtown myself, right now. I'll put you aboard a ship, and you just tell the captain where you want to go. Thank you. To show P, Nacor shouted, Take care of things, and tell Dominic he's in charge until I get back. If show P heard Nacor, he said nothing. As they left the tent, Rue said, I didn't think you went anywhere without Shopi going with you. Nacor gave a slight shrug. That used to be true, but I am no longer his master. Rue dodged along the street. When did that happen? Using his walking stick to point over his shoulder, Nacor said, 
when she started floating in the air a couple of hours ago. I see, said Rue. And that's what I meant. What is what you meant? When you asked me what I was talking about, Rue said, When? I seem to be asking you what are you talking about nearly every time we meet. When I first walked into the coffee house and I said, This won't do, that's what I was talking about, that blackness. Rue said, I don't know what it is, and I don't think I want to know what it is, but it won't do is a rather mild way of putting things. Just looking at it scares me. We'll fix it, said Nacor, as soon as I reach Pug. They got to the docks, and Rue only had to wait a few minutes to commandeer one of his boats. He had them row Nacor out to one of his fastest ships. What do you do if Pug's not on the island? Nacor said, don't worry. Gathis will find him for me. Someone on the island will. Nacor climbed a net ladder, and Rue shouted, Captain, shove off as soon as you can and take him where he wants to go. A disbelieving captain said, Mr. Avery, we're only half unloaded. That will have to do, Captain. Have you supplies for two more weeks at sea? Aye, sir, we do. Then you have your orders, Captain. Aye, sir, said the captain. He shouted, Get ready to cast off. Secure the cargo. Men started scrambling, and Rue instructed the boat crew to turn around and take him back to shore. As he reached the docks, he saw the sails unfurling on his ship, and he bid Nacor a fair voyage. With good winds, he'd reach Sorcerer's Island in a week or less, and knowing Nacor's tricks, he was certain Nacor would see good winds on this voyage. Reaching the docks, Rue couldn't shake the feeling that whatever was occurring in Crondor, it was now something far beyond his plans for wealth and power. The game that was about to unfold would be beyond the powers of even the richest man in the Western realm, and that frightened him. He decided to let the workers leave early tonight and return to his estates. Carly was overseeing the rebuilding there, and Rue had a powerful desire to spend the night with his wife and children. Jimmy reviewed the reports until his eyes couldn't focus. He stood up and said, I have to get some air. Duco looked up and said, I understand. You've been reading since dawn. Duco's own command of the written king's tongue was improving, so he could now read along with Jimmy or someone else reading aloud, but the messages they were getting were too critical for him to trust he wasn't making a mistake. The net effect of this was twofold. First, Jimmy didn't think he could see anything more than two feet away right now, and... Second, he was starting to develop an overall appreciation of the strategic situation along the kingdom's southern frontier. Kesh had a plan. Jimmy wasn't sure what it was, but he was almost certain that it required a large commitment of kingdom forces in two places, in Land's End and near Shamara to the east. At times he almost felt as if he understood what Kesh was going to do next, but he just couldn't quite make it come together in his mind. A rider came galloping toward the headquarters building and reined in his lathered horse. Sir, he said, messages from Shamata. Jimmy stepped off the porch and took the packet. He brought it inside, and Duco said, That wasn't much time. Messages from Shamata. Duco said, More messages. You'd better read them. The messenger was in a hurry, said Jimmy as he unwrapped the package. He read the single paper that was in the packet and said, Gods! One of our patrols caught sight of a fast-moving Keshian column moving rapidly northeast to Tahupset Pass. What's the significance? asked Duco. Damned if I know, said Jimmy. He motioned for one of the orderlies in the room to bring over a particular map and spread it out before the Duke. That's a pass that runs along the western shore of the Sea of Dreams. It's part of the old caravan route from Shimada to Landreth. Why would the Keshians threaten Landreth when we have a garrison in Shimada that can take them from behind? Jimmy stared into space, and for a moment he didn't answer. Then he said, Because they're not going to Landreth. They just want us to think they are. Where are they going? Jimmy studied the map. They're too far east to support any move at Land's End. His finger traced a line, and he said, if they cut west here, they could come straight at us. But we're too well defended with all the support units for Land's End here. Unless they want to draw us off before they push at Land's End? 
Jimmy rubbed his tired eyes. Maybe, Duco said. Isolating us from Land's End would make sense. If they could, but they need more than a single cavalry column. Maybe if they were sneaking other units through, Jimmy said. I have a hunch, my lord, and I don't like it. What? His finger traced lines across the map. What if the column doesn't go northeast to Landreth, but goes due north instead? That would bring them here, said Duco. You said you didn't think they were trying to draw us off. They aren't. If they go straight north from here, his finger marked a spot on the map, they're fifty miles east of our usual patrol route. There's nothing out there, observed the Duke. There's nothing out there to defend, replied Jimmy. But if they keep moving north, they intercept a trail here that runs through the foothills. It's part of an old caravan route from the dwarven mines at Dwargen that runs to here. His finger stabbed at the map. Crondor? Yes, said Jimmy. What if they've been slipping columns and soldiers through there for weeks? We just caught a glimpse of this one. He re-examined the communique. No word of banners or markings. The soldiers could be from anywhere within the Empire. They hold us static with units we're used to facing, then bring up units from farther down in the Empire. And they take Crondor and a flash attack. Duco was on his feet. He headed to the door of the headquarters and was shouting orders just as the old soldier, Matak, got the door open. I want every unit ready to move in an hour, he turned to Jimmy. My orders instruct me to defend and protect the southern marches, so I'm keeping the garrison intact. But if you're correct, the prince will need every soldier we can spare back in Crondor. With efficiency born of experience, he had the entire garrison moving within minutes. Jimmy, you will lead the column, and I hope you're in time. For if you are correct, Kesh will strike at Crondor any time now, and if they take it... Jimmy knew probably better than Duco what that would mean. It would leave the kingdom split in half. Greylock's army would be locked in struggle south of Illith. Duco's army would be forced to hold against the aggressors at Land's End, and the garrison at Shimata would be forced to hold a defensive position to prevent a strike past them at Landreth. If Kesh held Crondor, Greylock would lose all support by land from the south, as well as any chance of retreat. He would be caught between two hostile armies. And if the armies of the West were lost, Jimmy said, I'll have them on the road within the hour. Duco said, Good, for if Crondor falls, the West is indeed lost. If that observation from one of the men attempting to overthrow the West just a year prior struck Jimmy as ironic, he was too busy to register it. He hurried back inside the headquarters and shouted to the nearest orderly, Get all my things together and get my horse out of the stable. He grabbed a parchment and leaned over the writing desk. He almost pushed the scribe out of his seat. Jimmy couldn't very well order the Knight Marshal of Crondor to do anything, nor could Lord Duco. But he could make a suggestion, a strongly worded suggestion. He wrote, Reports indicate a strong likelihood of a major offensive against Crondor by Kesh, striking along old Dorgan Mine Road. Urge you detach whatever units can be spared and send them south by fastest means. James Earl of Vincar. He grabbed a stick of sealing wax, heated it, and affixed his ring seal to it. He folded the parchment and inserted it into a message pouch. The scribe, whom he had displaced, was sitting in his chair, watching the entire thing. Jimmy turned and said, What's your name? Herbert, sir. Herbert of Rutherwood. Come with me. The scribe glanced around the room at the other orderlies and scribes, but all returned only astonished or blank expressions. He hurried past Duco, who was still watching over the unfolding spectacle of his entire command, save the resident garrison, getting ready to mobilize. Jimmy led the scribe down to the docks and hurried to the far end, where a kingdom cutter lay at anchor. He hurried up the gangplank, and when he reached the top, shouted, Captain! From the quarterdeck, a voice replied, Here, sir! Orders! shouted Jimmy. Take this man north! The scribe stood on the plank behind Jimmy. Jimmy reached around and grabbed him by the front of his tunic, hauling him forward and depositing him on the deck. Jimmy said, Herbert, take this pouch. Sail north, find our army, and give this to Lord Greylock or Captain Von Darkmore. Do you understand? The scribe's eyes were round, and he couldn't speak, but he nodded. Captain, get this man to Lord Greylock. He's somewhere south of Quester's view. Sir, replied the captain, who turned and shouted, Make ready to get underway. 
Jimmy left the stunned Herbert standing on the deck and ran from the docks back to the town of Port Vicor toward where he hoped his gear was ready. He was impatient to leave and impatient to reach Grondor. His only brother was still in Grondor, and unless Greylock could get units south faster than Jimmy could go north, all that stood between dash and destruction was a few palace guards, the city militia, and a barely repaired city wall. Eric shouted, Get into that breach! Catapults on both sides of the line fired rocks and bundles of burning hay. Large ballista bolts flew overhead, and men lay screaming and dying. The fighting had been underway since dawn the previous day, and night turned the scene hellish. The enemy had dug a series of trenches backed by a high wall, upon which platforms held war engines. Thousands had died building these fortifications, and the dead had been left outside the wall unburied. The stench could be smelled miles before the first trench could be seen. The trenches had been filled with water, atop which oil had been floated. The oil had been fired and was sending a black blanket of smoke across the ground. Earl Richard had reviewed the defensive position and had been forced to agree that the only approach was a direct one. Eric had supervised the construction of a set of massive wooden bridges set up to roll over logs cut from the nearby woods. The first set of trenches had been difficult because of the bow fire from the wall above, but once he got his men underway, the trenches were quickly bridged. Soldiers frantically shoveled dirt across the top of the oil, banking the fires as the bridges were run across. Fortunately for the kingdom forces, when they reached the wall, they found a wooden stockade. It was brilliantly fashioned and as stout as could be imagined, but being wood, it could be cut. Men had died wielding axes at key locations, and when finally their work was done, chains with large iron bars had been thrown through the gaps. The iron bars snapped sideways when pulled back, and the chains were tied to draft horses. They had pulled down a twelve-foot-wide section of the wall, and the kingdom forces were now pouring through. Eric waited for the huge gates across the highway to be opened so he could lead his cavalry through. The gates suddenly shuddered, then swung open, and Eric ordered the advance. He kicked his horse, and the large chestnut gelding leaped forward and was up to a comfortable canter immediately. Eric's eyes watered from smoke and the stench of blood and death, but he could clearly see what lay on the other side of the gates. He frantically shouted for a halt. Moving slowly forward, he saw his footmen were upon the battlements and locked in hand-to-hand fighting. Dismount, he shouted to his men. They did, and Eric said, follow me. He ran through the gate, and the men behind him saw what had made him stop the advance. Just behind the gate lay a pit, ten feet deep, with sharpened wooden stakes. The gate was only six feet wider than the pit, three on each side, so men could move around the pit, but a horse could not pass. Eric urged his men through the smoke and blinked tears from his eyes. Where is all that smoke coming from? he shouted. Over there, came the familiar voice of Jado Shati. Eric looked where his old friend pointed and said, Damn. Yes, man, damn and damn again. Four hundred yards up the highway, thousands of men were lined up in ranks, with officers and cavalry mounted to the flanks and rear. More catapults, mangonels, and ballistae were apparent. This was not a defensive position. This army was making ready to attack. Suddenly Eric saw what was about to happen. He glanced at the wall through which he had fought and realized that if it were knocked down from behind, it provided a massive bridge over the trenches on either side of the pit. Back! shouted Eric and the order was passed. "'Get back and get ready!' shouted Jado. Eric raced back to where his horse was waiting, and he leaped into the saddle. The sound of horns and the shout of men up the highway told him that at last he was going to join battle in the field with General Fadawa. And Eric's only thought now wasn't on victory, but rather on survival. 22. Realization Men stalked the woods. Subai moved quietly, but with purpose, following the river. Most of his men were dead, though two might have gotten over the ridge to make their way along the eastern face of the mountains down to Dockmoor. He prayed it was so. He had made it through a murderous journey, lasting weeks. His pathfinders had skills unmatched by any on Midkemia, save the elves and the rangers of Natal. But Fadawa's defenses were bolstered by something far more terrible than mere human ability. They were aided by dark magic Subai did not understand. It became noticeable when they passed the first of the true southern defenses. 
Besides the death and destruction, there had been a feeling of despair everywhere, as if a miasma of pain and hopelessness hung in the air. The farther north they traveled, the worse the feeling became. They saw little of the coastal defenses for a while as they moved north while the road to Quester's View turned northwest. When they reached the road from Quester's View to Hawk's Hollow, they encountered more indications of dark powers. Not only had the northern ridge above that road been fortified, the southern ridge had been decorated with a grisly set of corpses. Wooden X's had been erected along the ridge line, with a human prisoner nailed to each. All had expressions of horror on their faces, showing they died from wounds rather than exposure and crucifixion. Most had their throats cut, but a few had their hearts removed, their chests showing gaping wounds. And the dead were not just men. Women and children had also been murdered for this hideous display. Two of his men had died an hour later, as terrible-looking men, wearing scars upon their cheeks and seemingly possessed of inhuman strength and determination, had chanced upon Subai's camp. From what intelligence Subai had read on the Emerald Queen's army, he knew these men were most likely immortals. Originally the honor guard of the priest-king of Lanada, they were ordinary soldiers turned into murderous fiends by black rites and a diet of drugs. The Emerald Queen had further degenerated them, using one a knight in death rites to continue her eternal youth. It had been thought they had fallen out of favor with Fadawa, but they seemed very evident on the approaches to Yabon. For the next week they had been hunted, and two more men had died, leaving it to Subai to order to his two remaining companions to turn east and find their way to L'Oreal, which was still held by the kingdom. He hoped they would lead away the pursuing warriors. Subai had effectively isolated himself in the hope that one man might slip by where two would be noticed. For a week he had journeyed past patrols and encampments, and each time he saw another enemy band, his confidence in the kingdom's chances of regaining Yabon was eroded. The theory that only a corps of twenty or twenty-five thousand soldiers remained under Fadawa's command was in error. Given the numbers he knew to be deployed down near Sarth, and estimates of what it would have taken to overrun Lamut, Subai was now convinced Fadawa had at least 35,000 soldiers under his command. Subai knew that if it were true, and if Kesh continued to probe the southern border, freezing soldiers along the frontier, Greylock did not have enough men to dislodge Fadawa. It might be possible to retake Illith, but the price would be grim. Subai had failed to reach Yabon. The city was besieged, and there was no way he could get close enough to attempt to sneak in. He had considered trying for a Tirsog, but found himself behind the enemy's lines and realized his best bet was to strike for the Lake of the Sky and around the northern tip of the Grey Towers and down into the Elven forests. Subai had no illusions. He had been chased for two days since almost reaching the Lake of the Sky. He didn't know if the men who were behind him were fanatics of Fadawas or renegades, but either way he knew he needed to find a place to rest and something to eat. He had had no provisions since a week after leaving the vicinity of Yabon City. He had foraged and found nuts and berries, as well as snaring a rabbit, but he hadn't eaten in the last two days since being spotted by his pursuers. He was losing weight and energy, and was in no condition to fight more than one or two men. If five or six were after him, to be caught was to die. He was following the southern bank of the river Crydy, which began at the Lake of the Sky. He knew that soon he would be opposite woods that were claimed by the elves, and that to enter them he would need permission. He also knew that it was his only chance of safety. There was no way he could continue to follow the rift down to the castle at Crydy, or risk moving south through the Green Heart to the general garrison. Subai stopped and looked back. Cresting some rocks a mile back, he saw dark figures moving. He looked ahead and saw a ford. It was never going to be a better time, he told himself. Subai entered the water and found it rose to his knees. At the height of summer the water level was lowest, and he knew that at thaw, or after fall thunder showers, he could not cross here. He was halfway across when he heard shouts behind and knew his pursuers had sighted him. That renewed his determination, and he forced himself to move faster. He was ashore when the men following him reached the ford, he didn't look back, but dodged into the woods, wishing he still had a bow. 
He had watched it fall into a rocky crevasse when he was still in the mountains two weeks before. With a bow he could have stopped those after him. He ran on. The light was falling and Subai was disoriented, but he knew he was moving generally toward the west. Suddenly a voice from ahead challenged him. What do you seek in Elvandar, human? Subai halted. I seek refuge, and I bring messages, he said, leaning over with his hands on his knees as fatigue swept up over him. Who are you? I am Captain Subai of the Royal Krondorian Pathfinders, and I bring messages from Owen Greylock, Knight Marshal of Krondor. Enter, Subai, said an elf who seemed to step out of nowhere. There are men following me, said Subai, agents of the invader, and I fear they will be upon us in minutes. The elf shook his head. None may enter Elvendar unbidden. Already they are being led away from us, and should they finally escape the woods, they will be miles from here. Else they may wander until they starve. Subai said, Thank you for inviting me in. The elf smiled and said, I am called Adeline. I will guide you. Thanks, replied Subai. I am almost done. The elf reached into his belt pouch, removed a piece of food, and said, Eat this. It will restore you. Subai took the offering, a square piece of what looked to be a thick, hard bread. He bit into it, and his mouth filled with flavors, nuts, berries, grains, and honey. He chewed it greedily. Adeline said, We still have far to go. He led the pathfinder to the west, toward Elvendar. Eric washed the blood from his face and hands, while outside the tent trumpets blew and horses rode by. Richard, Earl of McCurlich, looked at the map and said, We're holding. Eric said, We're losing. The counteroffensive had rolled the kingdom army back in confusion, until Eric could order up reserves to blunt the assault. Now they were five miles south of the original point of contact, and night was falling. Leland, Richard's son, entered the tent and said, We're routing them. He was a likable young man, nineteen years old, with a shock of blondish brown hair and wide-set blue eyes. Eric said, Hardly. They're withdrawing to their own lines until morning. They'll hit us again. The young soldier was eager, and Eric had been pleased to discover he kept his wits about him in the midst of battle. He officially was a junior officer attached to a company of soldiers from Deep Taunton, left to bolster the Army of the West when the Army of the East withdrew. But with his father in command of the army, he was acting in an unofficial capacity as Lord Richard's adjutant, and had picked up the responsibility of relaying orders to outlying units. "'What do we do next?' asked Richard. Eric wiped his face with a towel and came over to look down at the map. "'We dig in. Jado! he shouted over his shoulder. A moment later, Jado Shotty appeared and said, "'Eric?' Seeing the Earl sitting there, he changed that to... Captain, hello, my lord. Eric waved him over. I want three diamonds dug in, here, here, and here, he said, pointing to three points across the front. Jado didn't wait for further explanation, turning and leaving without even bothering to salute. Diamonds? asked Leland. Richard looked on in curiosity, too. Eric explained. It's an old Cassian formation. We build up three breastworks, each with two hundred men inside, but rather than try and build a huge one across the road, which we wouldn't be able to finish by sunrise, we build three small diamond-shaped ones across the front. Inside we place pikemen and build up the berm with shields and let them form defensive positions. The enemy's horsemen can't overrun them easily, and the tendency will be for men to move around the points of the diamond. Richard said, That funnels them in into these two constricted areas between the center and the sides. Yes, said Eric. With luck, they get jammed up in those constriction points, and our archers here, he drew a line with his finger across the map behind the diamonds, can wither any of the enemy who get trapped there. We'll put a wall of swordsmen with shields in front of them in case the enemy gets past the diamonds in quantity. What about our horse? asked Leland. They hold to each side of the outer diamonds. If we're lucky, they can prevent any flanking, and if the enemy retreats, we can unleash them to harry the enemy. Then what? asked Richard. Then we lick our wounds, reorganize, and see if we can do something about that mess up the road. Reports were filtering back from men who had been cut off and lost for a while behind enemy lines, and who returned to fill in gaps in Eric's knowledge of what was ahead of them. 
Along with Subai's reports carried back by his first two couriers, Eric wasn't optimistic. The fact that no more pathfinders had returned from Subai's journey was also a part of that pessimism. With no firm picture of what lay closer to Illith, Eric's cautious nature turned his imagination to the darkest possibilities. As best as they could determine, not only was there a vast network of fortifications at the crest of each hill and rise, but tunnels had been dug, so that reinforcements could be rushed from one location to another without being exposed to enemy attack. Eric recognized the trap inherent in the design. To attempt to bypass the fortifications left an unknown number of enemies at his back, and to stop and dig them out one at a time meant no hope of relieving the siege of Yabon. Eric shook his head. I'm too tired to think. At this point it seems possible that our only choice is in the manner of our defeat. Either ride home and dig in at Crondor, or get butchered as we continue to push north. Can we not get support from the sea? asked Lord Richard. Eric said, Perhaps up here, if we get past Quester's view. There are a number of coves and beaches where we could land, men. But we lack enough ships to get them in there. Don't have the proper boats for a landing. And if Fadawa positions men on the bluffs above, none of our men would reach the road. Leland said, You make it sound hopeless. Eric said, Right now, that's how I feel. So I'm sleeping a meal, and we'll see how I feel in the morning. But either way, I'm not going to conclude anything on the basis of my feelings. Richard said, For one so young, you've seen a great deal of war, haven't you? Eric nodded. I'm not yet twenty-six years of age, my lord, yet I feel old in my bones. Get some rest, suggested Richard. Eric nodded as he left the tent. He saw a soldier in the black tunic of the Crimson Eagles and said, Sean, where is our camp? Over there, Captain, answered the soldier as he hurried past. Eric moved in the indicated direction and found a dozen members of his old command setting up their tents. Bless you, Charo, he said, when he saw his own tent already up. Eric flung himself down on the bedroll waiting for him and was asleep within seconds. Bring the alarm, said Dash. What? asked Patrick, a look of incredulity on his face. I said ring the alarm. Spread word that a Cassian army is advancing on the city, and those soldiers hidden within the city will leap to attack the positions they're supposed to. Only instead of taking our soldiers from behind, our soldiers will be waiting for them. Isn't that extreme? asked Duke Rufio, recently arrived from Rhodes. Dash knew him slightly from his time at the King's Court in Milanon, and knew him to be a no-nonsense sort of fellow. He was a competent administrator, an adequate military adviser, and a fair rider and swordsman. Exactly the wrong man for Crondor on the brink of a crisis. Rufio would prove a fine administrator for a talented monarch, served by a brilliant general, thought Dash. Unfortunately, he had only Patrick and Dash to depend on, and Dash was now certain he would have to improvise and be dazzling, else Crondor would be lost. Yes, Your Grace, it is extreme, answered Dash, but it's better to flush them out when we're ready for them than to have them appear behind us at the height of an attack. I've seen enough proof there are weapons and food caches in the sewers so that armed insurrection inside the city can commence with any attack from outside. If there is any attack, said Patrick. He remained dubious about the entire possibility. He was convinced that negotiations underway at Stardock would eventually yield a solution. Even the revelation that Malar Anaris had been a Keshian spy, and the lack of response to an inquiry about Jimmy's arrival at Port Vicor, didn't persuade him there was the risk of a surprise attack against the capital of the Western Realm. Dash had never been close to Patrick. More of an age with Jimmy and Fancy, Dash had always been the tag-along as children, and during the period when Dash and Jimmy had been tossed out of the palace to learn in the rough and tumble of the docks at Villanon, Patrick had been visiting the eastern courts, learning diplomacy. Even as young men, Dash and Patrick had felt little affinity for one another. Dash was sure Patrick had redeeming qualities, but at this moment he couldn't begin to think what they were. If you know who these men are, suggested Patrick, the ones who are secreting all these weapons and food, why don't you just arrest them? because presently I have less than one hundred constables, and I believe there are close to a thousand enemy soldiers scattered throughout the city. As soon as I arrest the first bunch, the rest will go to ground. And I don't know who all of them are. I think I've got some lying low aboard ships off the coast, 
and there may be some in the caravansary outside the gate, and who knows how many are lurking down in the sewers. But if I ring the alarm bell, and you have the soldiers in the city placed at key locations, between them and my constables we can eliminate this threat. Duke Rufio said, I have two hundred soldiers en route from Rhodes who should be arriving here within the week. Perhaps when they arrive? Dash tried mightily to hide his aggravation. He almost succeeded. At least let me employ more men, Dash pleaded. Patrick said, The treasury is low. You'll have to make do with what you have. And what about volunteers? asked Dash. If anyone volunteers to serve, swear them to duty. Do whatever you have to. Perhaps after the war we might pay them. Patrick looked as if he had run out of patience. That will be all, Sheriff, said Patrick. Dash bowed and removed himself from the office. Stalking down the hall, he was lost in thought when he turned a corner and almost ran into Francie. Dash, she said, sounding pleased to see him. It's been so long. I've been busy, he said, still feeling nettled over Patrick's dismissal of his idea. Everyone has. Father tells me your job is probably as thankless as anyone's in the palace, yet he thinks you're doing it well. Thanks, said Dash. Are you staying here in Crondor, now that Duke Rufio has assumed office? Father and I leave for Villanon in a week, said Francie. We have to make plans. For the wedding? Francie nodded. No one is supposed to know. The king will announce it after things calm down. She looked troubled. What is it? Lowering her voice, she said, Have you heard anything from Jimmy? No, he said. I'm worried about him, said Francie. He left in such a hurry, and we really had little chance to talk about things. Dash had no time for this. Francie, he's fine, and as for talking about things, well, perhaps after the wedding, when Patrick's returned and you're Princess of Crondor, you can order him to come to a garden party. Dash, said Francie, looking hurt. Why are you being so mean? Dash sighed. Because I'm tired, angry, frustrated, and because your future husband is being... Well, he's being Patrick. And if you want to know, I'm worried about Jimmy, too. Francie nodded. Is he really upset by my marrying Patrick? Dash shrugged. I don't know. I think in a way, yes. But in another way, he knows things have to be what they are. He's confused. Like the rest of us. Francie sighed. I just want him to be my friend. Dash tried to force a smile. You shouldn't worry about that. Jimmy's very loyal. He'll always be your friend. He bowed slightly. Well, my lady, I must be off. There's too much to do, and I'm already late. Goodbye, Dash, she said. And Dash detected a note of sadness in her voice, as if they were parting forever. Goodbye, Francie he said as he turned and walked off. Here he was, trying to keep the city intact, and she was concerned with hurt feelings. Dash knew he was in a bad mood, but he also knew it was well-earned, and he knew he was likely to be in a worse one if he didn't come up with some way to neutralize those forces hostile to the crown already secreted inside the city. Subai was astonished, as was every human upon first viewing Elvendar. He had been led through the glades to the large clearing surrounding the heart of the elven forests, and when he had spied the giant trees of luminous colors, he had been moved to his most expressive exclamation in years. Killian! What joy! he had whispered. Adeline said, Of those beings you humans worship, we revere Killian most. He led the tired and hungry captain to the queen's court, and by the time Subai reached it, he felt far better than he had any reason to expect. He suspected it had something to do with the magic associated with the place, according to legend. He bowed before the two beings sitting upon the dais, a woman of stunning, if alien, beauty, and a tall, powerfully built, but young-looking man. "'Your Majesty,' he said to the Queen. "'My Lord,' he said to the man. "'Welcome.' said the elf queen, and her voice was soft and musical. You have come a great distance and a great peril. Take your ease and tell us of your message from your prince. Subai looked around the queen's council. 
Three elderly-looking, gray-haired elves stood to her right hand, one wearing rich-looking robes, the second an impressive-looking suit of armor with a sword at his side, and the third a simple blue robe with a corded belt. Next to Tomas, Prince Consort of Elvendar, stood a young-looking elf, one who bore a resemblance to the queen, and Subai deduced this to be her older son, Callan. To his left stood a familiar figure, Callus. Next to Callus was a man wearing leathers and a long gray cloak. Subai said to the queen, The message is this, fair queen. An enemy of great evil lies between our realms. Callus, as much as any man, knows this evil. He has faced it more than any one, and knows it wears many faces. What would you have of us? asked the queen. Subai looked from face to face. I do not know, great queen. I had hoped to find the magician Pug here, for it may be we are at the mercy of powers only he might face. Tomas stood and said, Should we have need of Pug, I can promise you a quick passage to him. He has returned to his island and can be found there. Callus said, Mother, may I speak? The queen nodded, and Callus said, Subai, the Emerald Queen is dead, and so is the demon who destroyed her. Surely the kingdom can deal with the remaining invaders. I wish that it was so, Callus, said Subai, but on my way here I saw things that make me think we have again encountered more than we've suspected. I've seen the return of those men you told us of, the immortals, and other drinkers of blood. I've seen men, women, and children sacrificed up to dark powers. I've seen bodies piled in pits and mystic fires burning in villages. I've heard chants and songs that no human should hear. Whatever help you have to give, please, we need it now. The queen said, We shall discuss this in council. Our son has spoken at length of the invaders from across the sea. They do not trouble us, but they do patrol near our borders. Go now and rest. We shall meet again in the morning. Callus and the man in grey came down to stand before Subai. Callus shook hands with the captain. It is good to see you, said Callus. The pathfinder said, You can't imagine how good it is to see you, Callus, and I am betting that Eric wishes you were back in command of the eagles. Callus said, This is Pahaman of Natal. The man in grey put out his hand, and Subai said, our grandfathers were brothers. Our grandfathers were brothers, returned Bahaman. Callus said, An odd greeting. Subai smiled. It's a ritual. The pathfinders and the rangers of Natal are of like spirit. Never in the conflicts between the free cities and the kingdom has a ranger or pathfinder spilled the other's blood. Bahaman said, in ancient times, when Kesh ruled, our ancestors were imperial guides. When the empire retreated, many who were left behind became rangers, and those who lived near Krondor founded the Pathfinders. All are kin, Pathfinder, Ranger, and Guide. Kala said, Would that all men knew they were kin. Come, let us feed you, Subai, and find you a place to sleep. While you dine, tell me what you've seen. They departed. Tomas turned to his wife and said, More than any time since the Rift War, I fear we may not be free of involvement. The queen looked at her eldest counselor and said, Tatha? We will wait upon Callus's return. After he has spoken to the human, he will tell us how grave is the risk. Prince Callan said, I will join my brother and listen as well. The queen nodded, and the old warrior Red Tree said, what good would it do for us to leave Elvendar? We are few in number and could not tip the balance. Tomas said, I don't think that will be the question. He looked at his wife and said, The question becomes, should I depart Elvendar? The queen looked at her husband and said nothing. 23. Decisions the men walked softly. Dash led his detachment through the cellar, each man carrying a large billy club and a dagger. The order was simple. If they resist, subdue them. If they draw weapons, kill them. All over the city, raids were being conducted by constables and members of Patrick's royal household guard. 
Patrick would not permit the sounding of the city's alarm, and the only concession Dash could wring from the prince was the use of two hundred of his guards for a coordinated raid. Seven different hideouts had been discovered, as well as three ships in the harbor. The ships were being left to the Royal Navy, which had enough presence in the area that the sudden boarding of the target ships should be unexpected. But Dash was unhappy. He knew there were other agents in the city, and that a significant portion of the caravan guards of the caravansary were probably Keshian soldiers. The only comfort he drew from their going uncaught was that they were outside the wall, and would remain so. He had established checkpoints at the gate on the pretext of needing a better census with the rebuilding of the city. They had reached a cellar in the northeastern portion of the city. The building was still burned out, but Dash knew the door to the cellar had been restored. It had been scorched to look burned. He had debated the best way to approach this task with himself all day, and had finally elected to take the shock approach. The upper cellar was deserted, but he knew the rear door led to a ramp down to the lower cellar, the one which opened onto the sewers. He tested the door handle and found it unlatched. Gently he lifted it and moved the door open. He whispered to the men behind him, All right. Silently, until I say different. He crept down the ramp to a landing opening up on a large cellar, once previously used to house large casks of ale and wine. The building above had been an inn. On the far side of the room a score of men were lying around on bedding on the floor or sitting on barrels. Dash said to his own men, Spread out and don't stop. He walked purposefully toward the nearest man, who looked in surprise at the men approaching. Then he saw the red armband and started to stand up. Dash shouted, In the name of the prince, surrender! The man lying on the nearest pallet started to rise, but Dash lashed out with his billy club and knocked the man senseless. The other constables hurried forward, and one man who started to pull his sword was struck unconscious by three constables. Others raised hands in surrender, though one tried to run down a passage. One of the constables flung his billy along the floor, sending it skipping over the stones to strike the man in the back of the legs. He fell hard, and before he could rise, two other constables were on him. Dash had the prisoners roped together with their hands tied behind them before they could organize a resistance. One of the newly deputized constables said, That went easily enough, Sheriff. Dash said, Don't get too comfortable. The rest of the night won't be this easy. At dawn, Jimmy rose to find a worried-looking Marcel Duval standing over his sleeping roll. "'Earl James,' said the squire from Bostyra. "'What is it?' asked Jimmy, getting up and trying to stretch at the same time. "'Some of the horses are footsore, sir, and I was wondering if we might take a day to rest them.' Jimmy blinked, not sure he was entirely awake. "'Rest them? The pace has been punishing, sir, and some of these animals are going to be lame by the time we reach Grandor.' Jimmy came wide awake. "'Squire,' said Jimmy, in as calm a voice as he could muster. You may play at being a soldier all you wish back at the court in Bostyra. Here you are a soldier. Now, by the time I get my horse saddled, you and your men had better be ready to ride. Today your gallant troop rides in the van. Sir? That is all, said Jimmy, far too sharply. He closed his eyes a moment, then counted slowly to ten. He took a deep breath, then shouted, Mount up! Everywhere men scrambled to get their horses saddled. Part of what made Jimmy irritable was that he knew the horses were being punished. Duval's pretty bunch wouldn't be the only ones limping into Crondor, but he knew that by pushing this company he'd reach the city in three more days. He just hoped that would be soon enough. When the column was ready, Jimmy looked back and did a mental calculation. Five hundred cavalry and mounted infantry. The men were eating dried rations in the saddle, and already a few could be seen showing signs of illness. But sick or well, tired or rested, he was going to get them all to Crondor. They could tip the balance if the city was still intact when they got there. Fighting back hunger and fatigue, he shouted, Get something in your bellies while you can. In ten minutes we pick up the pace. Turning to the head of the line, he shouted, Squire Duval, lead the column at the walk. Sir, came the reply, and Duval led his fifty lanterns out in the van. As the sun crept above the horizon in the east, and rose and yellow hues bathed the landscape, Jimmy was forced to admit Duval's company did cut a dashing appearance. 
The attack came at dawn, before the sun had risen over the mountains, at the time when men were the least ready to fight and the most likely to react slowly. Eric was already awake and had eaten, seen to the fortifications he had ordered constructed, and had called for the camp to be made ready. Richard stood at the command tent, watching the advance in the gray of the morning, and said, They seek to roll over us. As I would in their place, said Eric. He held his helmet under his arm and pointed with his right hand. If we hold the center, we can win the day. If either flank falls, I can plug the flow. But if the center falls, we must retreat. Leland stood beside his father and said, Then we will make certain the center doesn't fall. He donned his own helmet and said, Father, may I join our men? His father said, Yes, my boy. The lad ran off to where a groom held his mount. Leland leaped into the saddle as his father said, Chithonanka, guard your blade, and Ruthia, smile on you. The invocation of the war god and goddess of luck was appropriate, thought Eric. The invaders marched in irregular rhythm, without drummers or the other timekeepers Eric would have expected from Keshian or other kingdom units. He had fought alongside most of the men he now faced, and while he had been a spy in their midst, he felt little kinship for them. Still, he respected their individual bravery, and it was clear that Fadawa had forged them into an army instead of the disorganized bands of mounted infantry and foot soldiers they had been in Novendus. Now he saw heavy infantry, companies of men with pikes advancing, supported by men with shields and swords, bucklers and axes. Behind sat men on horseback, cavalry units from the look of them, half with spears, the others armed with sword and buckler. Eric gave a silent prayer of thanks that horse archers had never been common in Novendus. A thought occurred to Eric, and he turned to a message runner. Send word to Aki and the Hadati. I want them moving into those trees to the right of opposition. Look for flanking bowmen trying to infiltrate the woods. The messenger ran off, and Eric turned to Richard. Nothing to do now but fight. He put on his helm and walked to where a groom held his horse. He mounted and rode quickly forward, inspecting the position of the three diamonds. As he had known would be the case, Jado had them in positioned as well as could be, and they were his hardest troops, with the Crimson Eagles holding the center diamond. Jado waved from the center of the middle diamond, and Eric saluted him. As an officer, he could have delegated command to a sergeant and remained with the horse units. But Eric knew that, at heart, Lieutenant Jado Shati, from the Vale of Dreams, would always be a sergeant. Tithonanka, strengthen your arm, Eric shouted. The men in the diamond cheered their commander. Then the invaders broke formation and charged, and the battle was on. Tomas watched as Akila meditated. Tathar and another elf sat with him at three points of a triangle. Tomas had asked for their wisdom, and Akila had agreed to use his mystic powers to provide guidance. At the end of the Rift War, Tomas had vowed to never leave Elvendar unprotected. Now Tomas wondered if that oath would ultimately lead to the destruction of the thing he had sworn to protect. Tomas knew ancient lore, lived through the memories of the being whose powers he had inherited. Ashen Shugar, last of the Valheru, had become for a time one with Tomas, and much of his power resided still in the former kitchen boy from Crydee. With but a few others, Tomas understood the powers behind much of what had shaped his life. In days past, beyond numbering, Ashen Shugar and his brethren had flown the skies on the backs of dragons. They had hunted like the predators they were, both creatures without intelligence and creatures with. In their arrogance, they counted themselves among the mightiest beings in creation, and had no concept of their own delusions. Tomas had, over the years, come to understand that what he knew from Ashen Shugar was truth as Ashen Shugar knew it. He knew how the ancient Valheru felt, thought, and remembered, but because the Valheru believed it true, didn't make it so. Alone of his kind, Ashen Shugar avoided the influence of Drakken Korin, who Tomas now knew was a pawn of the Nameless One, the god whose name alone invites destruction. The human in Tomas considered it ironic that the Nameless One used Valheru vanity and their own certainty of their omnipotence 
to destroy them eventually. The Valheru portion of Tomas's nature felt rage at the thought his race had been nothing more than a tool, and one used and discarded when it was no longer effective. Tomas looked at the three elves and knew it would be a while before Akila had wisdom to share. He left the contemplation glade and walked through Elvandar. Across the way he noticed Subai and Pahaman of Natal talking. Rangers rarely talk to anyone besides other rangers, and occasionally the elves, so Tomas knew that in Subai, Pahaman had found one he considered kin. The laughter of children pulled Tomas like a lodestone. He found a dozen little ones playing a game of tag. Tomas saw his son, Callus, sitting next to the woman from across the sea, Elia. They sat close, her hand in his, and Tomas felt a warmth toward his son. He knew that he would never father another child, for it was a special magic that gave life to his son. He had played his part in destroying the great threat to all life on Midkemia, the lifestone, and now his fate was his own. But Callus would never father children, so Tomas's line ended with his son. Yet at play were two elven children, Tylak and Chopak, who seemed family. Yet even the names of the boys, alien on the ears of those born in Elvendar, reminded Tomas that there would never be a place in the world where he entirely belonged. He smiled at Callus. Like his son, he had forged a place for himself and was content with it. Callus waved at his father and said, Join us! Elias smiled at Tomas, but it was a smile tempered with uncertainty. Rid of Ashen Shugar's Valhero mind during the Rift War, and cleansed of many of the lingering effects of that meld of human and Valheru by the lifestone, Tomas nevertheless bore the Valheru stamp upon him. To any of the Edhel, the elven races, there would almost be an instinctive response, a subservience that bordered on fear. Tomas knelt next to his son. There is much to be thankful for. Callus said, yes. He glanced at the woman at his side, and she smiled. Tomas was almost certain eventually they would wed. The boy's father had died during the war in Novendus that had led to the invasion of the kingdom. With a very low birth rate and a high percentage of marriage by those who underwent the recognition, the instinctive knowledge of who their mates were, there was little hope for a widow to find a second husband. As Callus had lived most of his life among humans and was half-human himself, there was no mate for him among his mother's people. Tomas felt that fate had chosen to deal kindly with the son by bringing this woman and her sons to Elvandar. Tomas said, There is much to concern us with the news Subai brings. Callus looked down. I know. I feel as if it might be wise for me to return to the kingdom and to again serve. Tomas put his hand on his son's shoulder. You've done your share. I think it's time for me to return to the kingdom. Callus looked at his father. But you said... I know. But if this threat is what you and I both know it could be, then if we do not deal with it now, down near Illith, we will deal with it some day. Only we will be fighting here. Elia said, This is the same madness that destroyed my village across the sea. Her accent was odd by elven standards, but she was mastering the tongue of her ancestors. They are evil beyond measure. They are black of soul and have no hearts. She glanced at her sons, playing. Only a miracle sent Miranda to save us. They had killed all the other children in the village. Tomas said, I am waiting for Akila's wisdom on this, but I think I must fly to Sorcerer's Island and take counsel with Pug as well. Callus said, with the demon destroyed, I thought it but an issue between men. Tomas shook his head. If I understand a tenth of what I have been told, it will never be merely an issue between men. There will always be far greater powers behind those men, and at each turn those powers must be balanced. Tomas stood up. I will see you at supper. Callus said, I dine with Elia and the boys. Tomas smiled. I will tell your mother. He wandered through Elvandar, home for most of his life, and as he did every day, he marveled that he was allowed to live here. If there was a more beautiful place in creation to live, he couldn't imagine it. This was part of his reason for vowing to never leave, to always be here to protect it 
for he couldn't imagine the world without Elvendar. He continued and found himself returning eventually to the contemplation glade. Akila had roused himself from his meditation and was walking toward Tomas. His expression was clouded with worry. Tomas was surprised, as the ancient leader of the Eldar rarely revealed his thoughts this casually. Tomas asked, You've seen something? To Tathar and the other elf, Akila said, Thank you for your guidance. He took Tomas by the elbow and said, Walk with me, my friend. He led Tomas through a quiet part of the woods, away from the kitchens and shops, near the edge of the inner circle of Elvendar. When he was certain they were alone, Akila said, Something dark still lingers in Crondor. He looked at Tomas. Something wonderful, too. I cannot explain it. But an old power for good verges upon returning. Perhaps the universe is trying to put itself right. Akila led the Eldar, the ancient line of elves who had been closest to the Valheru. Tomas had come to value his counsel. He had a perspective unique and vast. But whatever force for good there is, the evil unleashed by the demon before it was destroyed is still stronger, Akila continued. That dark agency has servants, and they are building power in Ilith and Zun and now in Lamut. What Subai said about human sacrifice? Akila said, It is a thing of great evil and great power, and it grows by the day. The servants of such evil often are dupes and have no idea of what they bring upon themselves as well as others. They do not know they destroy their own souls first. As soulless men, they feel no remorse, no shame, no regret. They merely act on impulse, seeking what they think they want, glory, power, wealth, the trappings of might. They do not realize they have already lost and anything they do serves only waste and destruction. Tomas was silent for a while, then said, I have Valhero memory, so those impulses are well known to me. Your Valhero forebears lived in different times, my friend. The universe was ordered differently. The Valhero were natural forces, serving neither good nor evil. But this thing is a thing of evil apart from any other consideration, and it must be rooted out and destroyed. And to do so, the forces which strive to endure and survive the onslaught will need help. Tomas said, So I leave to lend my strength. Akila said, Of all of us here, you alone have the means to tip the balance to good. I will leave and find Pug, said Tomas. Together we will do what we must to save the kingdom and prevent the rise of this evil in Crondor. Go to the queen, said Akira, and know whatever you do, you do for her and your son. Tomas gripped Akira's hand and left. Later that night, after dining with his wife and a lingering goodbye, Tomas returned to the clearing north of the center of the forest. He was now dressed in his white and gold armor. A legacy of an ancient past, the armor was without blemish or scratch. He had reclaimed his golden sword with a white hilt when his son had unraveled the mystery of the lifestone. His hand rested on its hilt, and he wore his white shield with a golden dragon emblazoned on it over his shoulder. He looked to the sky and sent forth a call. He waited. Men lay dead and dying on all sides. Eric stood exhausted, a mound of dead enemies before him. Sometime during the afternoon his horse had gone out from under him, courtesy of a stray arrow. Twice he had been tempted to order retreat, but on both occasions his men had rallied and the enemy had been thrown back. He vaguely recalled a lull during the afternoon in which he had greedily drunk from a water skin and eaten something. He couldn't remember what. Horns had sounded from the other side a few minutes before, and the enemy withdrew. The diamonds had held, and a thousand or more men had died trying to take them. Eric couldn't begin to guess how many defenders had died as well. He knew he'd get a body count in the morning. Leland rode up and said, My father's compliments, Captain. Eric nodded, trying to get his thoughts organized. 
I'll be along presently, Lieutenant. Eric Benton cleaned his sword on the tunic of a dead man before him, then put it in his scabbard and looked over the field. He had ended up in the gap between the center diamond and the one on the right. The bodies before him were waist-high. He turned toward Jado Shati, who yelled, I hope we don't have to do that again any time soon, man. Eric waved. Not until tomorrow. He headed toward Earl Richard's tent. When he got there, he found two bodies being dragged out of the tent by guards, and the old Earl sitting at his table and orderly bandaging his arm. What happened? asked Eric. Some of the enemy got loose on your left flank, Captain, and actually got here. I finally got to use this sword. How do you feel? asked Eric. Like hell, Captain. He looked at the orderly, who finished tying off the bandage and waved him away. Still, I can at last feel like a soldier. You know, he said, leaning back, I once rode a patrol, and we saw some Keshians who ran across the border when they saw us, and until today that was as close as I had come to being in an actual battle. He got a distant look. That was forty years ago, Eric. Eric sat. I envy you. I don't doubt that, said Richard. What next? We wait until they withdraw a bit more, then I'd like to put some scouts up on the hills to get a sense of how they're deploying. Our men did well this day. But we didn't break them, said Richard. No, said Eric. And each day we fight out here in the middle of the road, our chances of reaching Illith diminish, and our hope of freeing Yabon becomes faint. We need some sort of magic, said Richard. I'm short of magic right now, said Eric, standing up. I had better see how the men are. He saluted and left the tent. He encountered Leland outside and said, Your father's fine, his wound is slight. Leland's face reflected his relief. Eric's estimation of the boy rose. He had gone about his business not knowing how his father fared. Eric asked, How are the reserves? They stand ready, said Leland. Eric was relieved. I lost track in the afternoon and didn't remember if they had been called up. They were not, Captain. Good. Order the men inside the diamonds relieved and tell the cavalry to stand down. Get the men fed. Then come back. I have a job for you. Leland saluted and hurried off. Eric made his way to his own modest tent among the Crimson Eagles and sat down. Commissary soldiers hurried with water and food, and one approached Eric with a wooden bowl of hot stew and a water skin. He took the bowl and a spoon and dug in, ignoring the heat. Jado Shati and the men from the center diamond came walking slowly back, and Jado half sat, half collapsed next to Eric. Man, I don't want to do that again. How did we do? We lost a few, said Jado, fatigue making his speech slow and his tone somber. It could have been worse. I know, said Eric. We've got to come up with something brilliant and unexpected, or we're going to lose this war. I thought it was something like that said Giotto. Maybe if we could bleed them enough tomorrow, we could launch a counter-offensive and punch through their center, leaving their forces divided. Eric was almost finished eating when a messenger found him. Earl Richard's compliments, sir. Would you attend him at once? Eric rose and followed the youngster and returned to the command tent. There he found a terrified-looking scribe standing next to Earl Richard. This just came in a few minutes ago, Richard said to Eric. Eric read Jimmy's message and said, Gods! Richard said, What do you think we should do? If we take any of our forces south, we lose Yabon. If we keep them here, we lose Crondor. Richard said, We must preserve Crondor. We can hold here, and if we must, postpone the campaign to retake Yabon until next year. Eric said, This is impossible. He was silent for a minute, then said, My lord, if you'll allow me. The Earl said, I always do, Eric. You haven't made a mistake so far. The old Earl had come to recognize Eric's talents and his utter lack of personal ambition, and would ratify any decision Eric made. Eric said, Send for Jado Shotty. While the messenger was gone, Eric questioned the scribe and found the man completely ignorant of most of the things Eric wanted to know. He did, however, impress upon Eric the level of concern and agitation in Earl James, Enough that Eric felt he must heed Jimmy's warning. When Jado showed up, Eric said, We have a change in plans. 
Don't we always? I want you to start now on building a barricade. I want a fort by the end of this week. Where? Here, said Eric, across this road. Put a squad up in the hills to the east with Akiz Adati and kill anything that comes south. This is our new northern border until I tell you otherwise. What sort of fortifications? I want a six-foot-high earthen breastwork a hundred yards north of the Three Diamonds. When that's done, start building a wall. Fell trees to the south and get on it. I want it twelve feet high, reinforced with an archery platform every twenty yards. I want two ballista ports every hundred feet and a clear line of fire to the rear for catapults, so they can launch stones without knocking our own men off the walls. Man, how long is this thing to be? From the cliffs overlooking the sea to the steepest hill you can find. That that's more than two miles. Then you'd better start now. Leland of Malkurich appeared. The cavalry is standing down, sir. Good, said Eric. At first light I want you leading them down the coast back to Crondor. Crondor? said the youth, looking at his father. The old earl nodded. It appears our old friends the Keshians are about to launch an assault on the city. Earl James of Venkar requests reinforcements. But what about the fight here? asked the youth. You just get south and save Crondor, lad, said Eric. Leave this area to me. Yes, sir, said the lad. Which unit, sir? Every horseman we have. We can dig in and hold here for the rest of the summer with the footmen, but they can't reach Crondor in anything under three weeks. Now, listen carefully. Don't start off galloping down the coast. You'll kill half your mounts in the first three days. Start off forty minutes at a trot. Then get off the horses and lead them for twenty. At noon, switch to a half-hour trotting and a half-hour leading the horses, and give them plenty of grain and water each evening. If you do that, you'll save most of them and get thirty miles a day out of the troops. That should put you in Crondor in a week. Yes, sir, said Leland. He turned and left to carry out his orders. Eric balled his fist and looked skyward. Damn, he said. I just thought up a way to dig those bastards out from behind that fortress to the north, and this has to happen. Jada, who had been about to leave when Leland appeared, said, You know, they say Tithonanka runs a soldier's life, but I got to tell you, man, Banneth seems to run my little corner of the world. He left. Eric nodded. Banneth runs mine, too, it seems. The god of thieves was also known as the prankster, and was commonly given credit for everything that went wrong. Eric looked at the old earl, who said, We do what we can. Eric nodded and silently left the tent, feeling as defeated as he had ever felt in his life. Dash roused himself and rubbed his eyes. He had given up on staying awake during the afternoon unless an emergency occurred. There was too much to do after darkness fell. He began his day at sundown and worked throughout the night, with his morning spent at the palace or sorting out problems around the city. About noon, if the gods were kind, he would collapse into his bed at the rear of the Newmarket jail and fall into an exhausted sleep. Six or seven hours later, he would be roused. He had received unexpected help from the mockers in locating the infiltrators. He had put at least two hundred of them behind bars, and had forced Patrick to build a temporary stockade to the north of the city over the prince's objections. Should Kesh attack, when Kesh attacked, in Dash's mind, they would be freed by the Keshians. At least, thought Dash, they would be unarmed and outside the city. It was the ones still armed and inside the city that he worried about. As Dash entered the former inn's common room, used as a squad room by the constabulary, he realized he had overslept, and it was at least an hour after he had planned to be up. He asked one of the constables, What time is it? Eight to the clock about fifteen minutes ago. He's been waiting here an hour. We wouldn't let him wake you. The constable was pointing at a court page. What is it? he asked. The lad handed him a note. The prince wishes you at the palace at once, sir, said the boy. Dash read it and winced. He had completely forgotten he had been invited to dinner this evening at the palace and had agreed to go. I'll be along shortly, said Dash. Lately he was unhappy with Patrick even more than usual, and probably that was the reason he had forgotten the invitation. Dash realized that the prince could certainly operate in any fashion he wished, 
with or without Dash's approval, but given that the city's security was Dash's responsibility, he resented those decisions of Patrick's which made security that much more difficult to ensure. Dash wanted things from Patrick, and making the prince angry wasn't a good way to do that. He had to make Patrick understand how dangerous things were right now. Dash couldn't seem to impress upon Patrick the mere fact that having had two Keshian agents inside the palace walls was a major source of concern. Dash knew his grandfather would have had both men singing out the names of every contact they had from Crondor to the Overn Deep. Patrick, on the other hand, seemed oblivious, and Duke Rufio felt that as both men were absent from the palace, one gone and the other in custody, things were in hand. Dash wondered if Talwyn had put in an appearance as yet, and what his view on the matter was. Dash was certain his late father's spy wouldn't share Rufio's equanimity on the matter. Dash gave instructions on the night's raids, and put Gustav in charge of the most delicate one. He had come to trust the former mercenary as a steady influence on the other men. Dash got his horse and rode to the palace. As he rode through the city, Dash registered the rhythm of the place, becoming more familiar by the day. Crondor was reviving, and it angered him to the point of irrationality that anyone, Keshian or Fadawa, might return to undo the work he had done. Villanon had been his home until three years before, when his grandfather had brought Dash and his brother to Crondor. Since then he had worked for a while for Rue Avery, though he was always in his grandfather's employ, and against any reasonable expectation he had made the city his own. As he neared the palace, Dash conceded there was more of his grandfather in him than he might have once been willing to admit. Dash rode in past a pair of guards at the main gate, who saluted the sheriff. A groom hurried forward to take his horse. Dash moved quickly up the palace steps and passed guards standing in the entrance hall. He was hurrying to the point of almost running as he rounded the corner that would take him directly to the great hall. Instantly he knew something was wrong. The great doors were open, and a pair of guards stood just inside as if inquiring over something. A servant was running from the hall, toward the rear of the palace, shouting something. Dash ran. He pushed past the two guards at the door and saw people in agony or unconscious. The hall had been set up with a giant U-shaped table, allowing jugglers and entertainers to perform before the entire court. The prince, Francie, dukes Brian and Rufio were at the head table. Dash noted an empty chair at the far end on the prince's left. The other two tables were occupied by the remaining nobles of the area and most of the important citizens of Crondor. Half of them appeared unconscious, slumped down in their chairs or on the floor, while a few others were attempting to stand, and one or two were sitting, a vacant, disoriented expression on their faces. Dash ran across the room to the head table and vaulted over it, swinging his legs over the prone form of Duke Brian. Francie was slumped over the table between her father and Patrick, and Duke Rufio had fallen to the floor and was lying on his back, eyes open and vacant. The prince sat back in his chair, gasping for air, his eyes wide and unfocused. Dash stuck his finger into the prince's mouth, and Patrick vomited the contents of his stomach. He repeated the action with Francie, who also threw up what she had eaten. He turned to see startled-looking servants and guards standing around, unsure of what to do. "'Make them vomit!' shouted Dash. "'They've been poisoned!' He reached Duke Silden and got him to gag up food, but far less than Dash would have liked. He reached Duke Rufio and could not force a response. The Duke's breathing was shallow and his face was clammy to the touch. Dash jumped up and saw that three of the servants were attempting to get those still conscious to throw up. He shouted to a guard, Get a horse! Ride to Temple Square! Bring back any clerics you can find! We need healers! Dash organized the servants and had more come bringing fresh water. He had no idea what poison had been used, but he knew that some of them could be diluted. Make those who can drink swallow as much as they can, he shouted. Don't force those who can't. You'll drown them. Dash grabbed the sergeant of the guard and said, Arrest everyone in the kitchen. Dash realized that whoever had poisoned the entire royal court was probably gone by now, but perhaps he had not had time to flee. He certainly hadn't expected the sheriff to be late and avoid being among those afflicted. The room stank, and Dash set some of the staff to cleaning up as others attended those ill. It took nearly a half hour for the first cleric to arrive, a priest of Astalon. He set about doing what he could for the stricken, starting with the prince. Dash did a mental inventory of those in attendance. 
Of the nobles in Crondor, only he had been absent from this meal. Every other titled lord from duke to squire in the area was at that table. Of the town's wealthy and powerful merchants, only Rue Avery was absent, being out at his estate with his family. Soon other priests of the various orders appeared, including Brother Dominic, the Ashapian, who now served at Nacor's temple. They tended those in the room throughout the night, and Dash interrogated the kitchen staff. Near sunrise he returned to the great hall, which now resembled an infirmary. Dominic was near the door, and Dash called him over. "'How do we stand?' he asked. "'It was a close thing,' said the monk. "'Had you not acted as you had, you would be the only noble in the city still breathing.' The prince will live, though he will be sick for a long time, as will the Lady Francine. He shook his head. Her father is touch and go. I don't know if he'll pull through. Dash said, To Rufio? Dominic shook his head in the negative. It was the wine that was poisoned. He drank a great deal of it. Dash closed his eyes. I tried to tell Patrick that if we had one spy in the palace... Well, said Dominic... Well, the loss is terrible. At least the prince will survive. There is that. Dash looked at those dead who were being carried away. But we've lost too many already to have to endure this insult. It could have been worse, but not by much, said the exhausted young sheriff. Then the alarm bell began to ring, and Dash realized the city was under attack. 24. Attacks Dash raced down the street. People ran through the streets while soldiers raced to the walls. The gates were closing, and a panic-stricken constable in charge of the gate check said, Sheriff, a rider raced in, claiming there's a Cassian army coming up the road. Bar the gate, said Dash. He grabbed the constable and said, What's your name? Delwyn, sir, said the agitated young man. You're now a sergeant, understand? The man nodded, then said, But we don't have sergeants in the constabulary, sir. All right now you're in the army, Dash shouted. Come with me. He led Delwyn up the steps to the ramparts on the wall above the gate and looked to the east. The sun was rising over the distant mountains and caused him to squint. Movement caught his eyes, and he held his hand up to shield them from the sun. He squinted, and there, along a road running along the base of a distant hill, he saw movement. Nothing more than the appearance of a long line undulating along the side of the hill. Gods, he whispered. To the newly created sergeant, he said, Send word to the new market jail. I want every constable up on these walls with the soldiers. We have an army coming to visit. Sergeant Delwyn hurried off. Dash looked to his right and his left and saw a sergeant of the palace guard hurrying toward him. Dash grabbed him and said, What's your name? Mercury, sir. Your captain is either dead or very sick. I do not know which. Are there any other officers around? Lieutenant Yardley has the duty, sir, and should be above the palace wall. Go fetch him and tell him I need him here at once. The sergeant ran off and returned a few minutes later with the lieutenant. Sir, said the lieutenant, what are your orders? Dash said, as baron of the court and sheriff of Crondor, I find I am the only functioning noble in the city. How many officers escaped the poisoning last night? Four, sir, of which I am senior. You are now an acting captain, Yardley. How many men have we? Yardley spoke without hesitation. We have five hundred members of the prince's household guards, and fifteen hundred members of the city garrison spread out around the city. I don't know the current number of your constables, sir. Slightly better than two hundred. What about guards who came with the nobles last night? Maybe another three hundred honor guards, personal retinues, replied the newly made captain. Very well. Have them support your men on the palace walls. Have whoever's in charge of the city garrison find me here and report. Yardley ran off, and a short time later a gray-haired old sergeant appeared. I'm Sergeant Mackey, sir. Lieutenant Yardley said to report to you. Where's your officer? asked Dash. Dead, sir, replied the stocky old man. He was dining with the prince last night. Dash shook his head. Well, Sergeant, said Dash dryly, for the next few days you're going to play the part of Knight Marshal of Condor. The old man smiled and came to attention. With a glint in his eye, he said, I had hoped for a promotion before I retired, sir. He then lost his smile. If I may be so bold, who then are you to be? Me, said Dash with a bitter laugh. I get to play the part of the Prince of Crondor until Patrick's strong enough to stand. Well then, Highness, said the sergeant in a semi-mocking tone, 
I respectfully submit we'd better quit larking about and get ready to defend this city. He pointed to the advancing column in the distance. That lot doesn't appear very tender to me. Right you are, said Dash with a tired smile. I want you to deploy three men and four on the walls. I want the remaining men held in reserve. Sir, said Mackey with a salute. As Mackey ran off, Gustav and the constables ran down High Street toward the main gate. Dash yelled down, How did the raids go last night? Gustav shouted, We netted another score of the bastards, but I know there are more out there. Here's the duty. Call martial law and tell everyone to remain in their houses. Then I want the constables to check all the places we've talked about. Gustav knew exactly what Dash meant. Those places within the city vulnerable to attack from within. Then sweep the city and arrest anyone on the streets. Then report back to the jail and wait. Wait for what, Sheriff? Wait for word the Cassians are breaching the defenses, then come fast. Gustav saluted. He turned and gave orders to groups of constables, who ran off in different directions, shouting, Martial law! Get inside! Get off the streets! Dash turned and watched as the sun continued to rise in the east, and the enemy continued their advance. Eric leaned over, perspiration dripping off his brow as the enemy retreated once more. He stood at the point of the center diamond, the dead piled outside the shield wall to chest height. He turned when someone touched his shoulder and saw Jado behind him, his face a mask of red from the splattered blood. We held, said the lieutenant. We did it. The attack had been unrelenting. A wave of soldiers who had simply pushed themselves upon the waiting defenses of the kingdom. Eric had been able to repulse them without having to rely on horses, which he no longer had. The left diamond had threatened to collapse at one point, but a reserve company had been thrown in and the enemy pushed back. Archers had continued a slaughter between the diamonds, and two flying companies had been able to respond to threatened flanking attacks from either side. On the whole, it had been a masterful defense. Eric said to Jotto, I'm worried about arrows. Get scavengers out there picking up as many as can be salvaged. Jotto hurried off, and Eric waved over another soldier named Wilkes. Run to the command tent and inform Earl Richard I'll be along presently, and ask him if any supply trains have caught up with us. Then come back here and report. Eric was handed a water skin by a commissary, and he drank greedily. He then poured water over his face and wiped off whatever blood and dirt he could. Around him, men were pushing bodies outside the diamonds. The enemy showed no interest in removing their dead, and Eric was worried. Beyond the obvious problems of the stink and the danger of disease, there was the added burden of his men having to clear the positions so they could be defended. Eric directed the clean-up, and Jado returned, saying that the scavengers were hard at work, recovering any arrows that could be used again. Even some that were damaged would be repaired by a trio of Fletchers hard at work at the rear of their position. But Eric was nearly out of supplies and was concerned, because a baggage train due to arrive the previous day was overdue. He had dispatched a patrol to the south to find them and hurry them along. While a smith's apprentice, Eric had tended mules and donkeys and knew they were even more fractious and difficult at times than horses. But now he was concerned that something beyond a difficult team or two was slowing down the supplies. Jado said, Man, that was some fight. Not much in it, save stand and slaughter. Nightmare ridge all over again. Eric hiked his thumb at the enemy. They're not very smart, but they are fearless. I've been thinking, said Jado. We know that those we faced before were under some spell or another, a demon or what have you, according to the rumors, and that's why they fell apart after the battle at the ridge. But they don't seem to have learned anything over the winter. I know what you mean, said Eric. From everything we know about Fadawa, I'd expect something different. He must have discovered by now that we're not going to chase him. Eric rubbed his hand over his face as if he could wipe away the fatigue. Wilkes returned and said, Captain, Earl Richmond awaits your report and told me to tell you the baggage train has arrived. Good, said Eric. I was beginning to worry. To Jado, he said, Relieve the men in the diamonds and get something to eat. Sir, said Jado with a casual salute. Eric left the diamond and paused to inspect the three positions for a minute. The shields were damaged, as he expected, and he had ample replacements, but the spears were almost used up. He turned to a soldier. Johnson, get a squad and move south to the woods near the road. Start felling trees that we can use to make long spears. 
The soldier saluted, and Eric could tell from his expression he had no wish to be doing anything but eating and sleeping. But during war, few got to do what they wished for. Eric knew they'd not have spear points, but sharpened, fire-hardened stakes would serve to keep enemy horse at bay. And other weapons would be in the baggage, machine parts for constructing catapults, oil for burning out underground tunnels and firing wooden defensive positions. Eric began to feel optimistic about being able to hold the position. He had no thought at this moment about advancing, not with his entire detachment of horse soldiers dashing toward Condor. He reached the command tent and found the Earl sitting at his command table. How's the arm, sir? Fine, said Richard. He smiled. Do you want to know why our baggage is late? I was wondering, admitted Eric, as he poured himself a mug of ale from a pitcher on the table. Leland forced them off the road, said Richard, so he could get down to Crondor. Some of the wagons got stuck in the mud, and it took a half day to get them out. Well, said Eric with a laugh, I'd have rather had them here yesterday, but as long as they're going to be late, I'll settle for that reason. I was afraid they'd been ambushed. Hot, wet towels were provided, and Eric washed up. A servant went to his tent and returned with a fresh tunic, and Eric sat with the earl, the teeth-gritting pressure of the day beginning to slip away slightly as the ale relaxed him. Food was provided, and while plain camp fare, it was hot and filling, and the bread was fresh-baked. Eric bit off a large hunk of the hot, flavorful bread, and after he had swallowed, said, One good thing about holding a defensive position is our commissary has time to set up their ovens. Earl Richard laughed. Well, there you have it. I was wondering if there was even a hint of good in all this, and you found it. Eric said, Unfortunately, that may be about all the good there is to wring out of this situation. I would trade all the hot bread in the world to be outside the gates of Illith, ready to storm the city with our army. Someone once said that you can make all the plans you wish, but they all go to naught as soon as the first elements in your army encounter the enemy. My experience is that is true. The truly great field commanders can improvise. Richard looked at Eric. As you do. Thank you, but I'm far from being anyone's notion of a great general. You underestimate yourself, Eric. I wanted to be a smith. Truth? Truth. I was apprenticed to a drunk who failed to register my name with the guild, and had he, I would probably have been moved from Darkmoor before I killed my half-brother. He went on and outlined the story of how he had become a soldier, from murdering Manfred while in a rage over Manfred's rape of Rosalind, the girl who had been like a sister to Eric, and being tried and convicted of murder. He told him of being pulled from prison by Bobby de Longville, Lord James and Callus, and the journeys to Novendus. When he was done, Lord Richard said, A remarkable story, Eric. We had heard things in the East of some of those things Lord James did, but only rumors and conjecture. Lord Richard said, My son will follow me in my office, and perhaps rise even higher as a result of this service. But you stand poised for greatness should you choose to take advantage, Eric. With Greylock dead, it is but a short step for you to take command of the armies of the West. Eric said, I am unsuited for it. There is so much I don't know about strategy, long-range planning, the political consequences of things. The fact you know those issues exist places you ahead of most of us who might be selected for the position on the basis of who our fathers were, Eric. Don't underestimate yourself. Eric shrugged. I don't think I am, Richard. I'm captain of the Crimson Eagles and a court baron as a result. That's far more than I wished to be. I thought I had everything I wanted when I was named sergeant. I only want to serve as a soldier. Sometimes we have no choice, said Richard. I wanted to grow roses. I love my gardens. I don't think I'm happier than when I'm showing guests through them. I amuse my wife and annoy our groundskeeper no end by puttering around out there on my hands and knees pulling weeds. Eric smiled at the image of the old man out there in the dirt. Yet you do it. It makes me happy. Find what makes you happy, Eric, and hold to it. My wife, doing a good job. The company of friends, said Eric. I can't think of much more. You'll do, Eric von Darkmoor. 
You'll do very well, should fate tap you for greatness. They talked late into the night. Nacor pointed. That way. The captain said, I can't see anything in this fog. Are you sure? Of course I am, said Nacor. The fog's an illusion. I know where we're going. I'll remember you said that, sir. The captain appeared dubious. Nacor had tried a couple of tricks to contact Pug, but nothing seemed to work. He was almost certain new defenses had been erected around Sorcerer's Isle, and upon entering the region of fog he was certain that was the case. Pug didn't want to be bothered by casual travelers, it seemed. When Nacor had been in charge of the island, he had relied on the reputation of the place, coupled with a menacing-looking castle with blue light flickering in the tower windows. Now the defensive magic was stronger. Nacor had to correct the captain's course, because while in the fog the tillerman was letting the ship curve away from the island. In the distance he heard the sound of surf, and said, Get ready to lower sails, captain. We're almost there. How can you— Suddenly they were out of the fog, in brilliant daylight. Members of the crew looked over their shoulders and saw a wall of fog which circled the island like a fortress. The castle still stood atop the cliffs, a looming black presence that seemed to cast a pall over the area. Should we move farther down the coast? asked the captain. This is very good, said Nacor. They've added some new tricks. He looked at the captain. Everything is fine. You just lower a boat, drop me on the beach, then you can go back to Crondor. The relief was obvious on the man's face. How do we plot our course? Just sail through the fog that way, Nacor pointed. If you're turned around a little in the fog, that's fine, because it will want to turn you away from the island anyway. You'll come out more or less pointed east, and you can get your bearings off the sun or stars. You'll be fine. The captain tried to look reassured, but failed. The sails were hauled in and a boat lowered, and within an hour Nacor stood on the beach of Sorcerer's Island. He didn't bother to watch the ship depart, as he knew the captain would be raising sail even as the boat that had dropped Nacor off was rowing furiously back. Pug had done a wonderful job of casting a pall of woe and despair over anyone sitting off the coast. Nacor hiked the path up from the beach, and where it split toward the castle and down into the small valley, he chose the valley path. Nacor didn't even bother using the energy needed to shift his perceptions, as he knew that when he reached the limit of the illusion he would pass from the seemingly wild woodlands into a lovely pasture, dominated by a rambling villa. When the illusion finally did shift, Nacor almost tripped in surprise, for while the landscape was as he had expected it to be, there was one feature that was totally unexpected. A golden dragon rested comfortably next to the house, apparently asleep. Nacor hiked up his faded orange robe and hurried on spindly shanks until he was before the dragon. Ryana! he shouted. The dragon opened one eye and said, Hello, Nacor. Is there a reason you're waking me? Why don't you change and come inside? "'Because it's more comfortable sleeping like this,' said the dragon, her voice revealing her mood as less than pleased. "'Late night? Flying all night. Tomas asked me to bring him.' "'Tomas is here! That is wonderful news!' "'You may be the only one in Midkemia to think so,' rejoined the dragon. "'No, I don't mean the reason he's here. I mean the fact he's here. That means I don't have to explain things to Pug.' Probably for the best, said the dragon, as a nimbus of golden light surrounded her. Her form shimmered, the edges blurring, and the light seemed to shrink until she was human size. Then she resolved into the form of a striking woman with reddish blonde hair, enormous blue eyes, and a deep tan of gold. Put some clothing on, said Nacor. I can't concentrate when you run around naked. With a slight movement, Ryana created a long blue gown which accentuated her coloring. How you can be the age you are and still act like such an adolescent at times is beyond me, Nacor. It's part of my charm, said Nacor with a grin. Ryana slipped her arm in his and said, No, I don't think that's it. Let's go inside. 
They walked into the house and headed toward Pug's study. When they got there, they heard voices inside, and when Nacor knocked, Pug's voice said, Come in. Rihanna entered first, and Nacor came in behind her. Pug's study was large, with a broad window seat upon which Miranda sat. Tomas sat uncomfortably in a chair that was obviously a little too small for him, while Pug sat facing the two of them. If either Tomas or Pug were surprised to see Nacor, neither showed it. Miranda grinned. Why am I not surprised to see you here? I give up, said Nacor, sitting down. So what are we to do? All eyes turned toward him, and Pug said, Why don't you tell us? Nacor opened his sack and reached in, up to his shoulder, as if feeling around. Everyone in the room had seen him do the trick before, but the effect was still comic. He fished out an orange and said, Anyone want one? Miranda held up her hand, and Nacor tossed it to her. He got another one for himself. Nacor began to peel the orange. Something amazing happened in Crondor last week. A terrible thing, and a wonderful thing. Or they were both the same thing. Anyway, one of my students, a very special woman named Alita, was studying with Chopi, meditation, just the basics, when suddenly a light gathered around her. She rose in the air, and below her, trapped, was a very black thing. A black thing asked Miranda. Could you be a little more specific? I don't know what to call it, said Nacor. It's energy, perhaps a spirit of some sort. Maybe by now some of the other clerics from the different temples have figured out what it is. But it's something very bad. Maybe it's left over from the demon, I don't know. But I think it was in place so that something could happen in Crondor later. Later? asked Miranda. Then she looked at Pug, who shrugged. Thomas said, I have just been telling Pug that Captain Trubai of the Pathfinders reached Elvendar. It seems Greylock's army is stalled south of Quester's view. And from what Subai reported, there is dark power being used again. Nacor said, Yes, that makes a great deal of sense. He was about to say something, then hesitated. A moment. He made a broad gesture with his hands and waved over his head. Then the room crackled with energy. Tomas smiled. Don't lower the barrier prematurely this time. Nacor grinned in embarrassment. The last time he had used this mystic shield to protect them, he had lowered it too soon, and the demon Jakan had located them. I put the field around the room. I'll just leave it up permanently. No agency of Nalars will ever be able to spy on this room. Now we can talk without falling under his sway. At the mention of Nalar's name, Pug felt a prickling sensation in his head for a moment, and suddenly barriers to his memory were lowered. Images and voices swam in his consciousness, and things he had placed apart in his mind were now accessible to him. We must assume the Nameless One has more servants. Obviously, said Tomas. The human sacrifices and other slaughter are means for gathering power. What fascinates me, said Nacor, is what is happening in Grondor. Pug smiled at his occasional companion. Obviously, this new faith of yours is having a direct effect. Yes, but that's what I find odd and fascinating. He pulled a section from his orange and ate it. I am no expert on issues of faith, but I had the distinct impression it would take a few centuries or longer for our new temple to have any effect. Miranda said, don't give yourself too much credit, Nacor. It may be the power was already there, and your little temple just happened to be the convenient conduit. That makes more sense, agreed Nacor. In any event, we have this issue to discuss. When we fought the demon, we mistakenly thought we had defeated the Nameless One's agents. What we did was destroy their most current weapons. Nothing more. Nacor waved out the window past Miranda. Out there, he said, is at least one more evil agency doing very bad things, and it is gathering power. That is who we must defeat. Tomas said, Subai leads me to think that Elvendar will soon be at risk if we do not stop this army now. 
Nacor leaped out of his chair. No, you are not listening. He stopped, then said, Thor, I am not saying this right. We are not trying to save Elvendar, or Crandor, or the kingdom. He looked from face to face. We are trying to save this world. Ryana said, Very well, Nacor. You now have my undivided attention. These petty human wars are nothing to dragonkind, but we share this world with you. What is the threat to us all? This mad god, this Nalar, whose very name is a danger, he is the threat. When you look at everything that has occurred since the Chaos Wars, remember this. When you once again forget the very conversation we have this hour, when your memories are locked away to prevent you from falling under Nalar's sway, remember this much. There is always something deeper behind what you see on the surface. All right, said Pug. So, what we see on the surface, the invasion and the conquest by Fadawa, they hide a deeper truth. Yes, Fadawa is a dupe. He was before, and he is still. He is just the next to be placed at the head of this murderous army. We must identify whoever it is that stands behind him. In the shadow. There is something evil growing in Crandor. It is there against the time Fadawa's army arrives. Whoever is behind Fadawa an advisor or servant or a member of his guard, must be destroyed. Somewhere is a being who was there when my old wife Joma became Lady Clovis, when she was controlling Darkon, and when she sat the Emerald Throne. He was there when the demon ruled, and now when Fadawa is the leader. This creature, man or spirit, this thing is the agent of Nalar who is orchestrating the war. It is this being who seeks no conquest, but rather destruction. This is the creature who doesn't wish to see one side or the other win, but rather seeks to let the suffering linger, let innocence die. This is the creature we must find. Tomas said, Do you suspect another Pantathian? Nacor said, I don't think so. Maybe, but it may also be a man, or a dark elf, or any other manner of creature. It may be a spirit in the body of one such as Fadawa. I just don't know. But we must seek out this creature and destroy it. Pug said, This sounds as if we must fly to the heart of the enemy and confront their leader. Nacor said, Yes, and that is dangerous. Pug winced in memory of the trap the demon had laid for him, the one that in his arrogance he had overlooked, the trap that had almost cost Pug his life. Why don't we just... I don't know, said Miranda. Just burn everything within a mile of Fadawa's headquarters. That should end this creature, shouldn't it? Pug said, probably not. Years ago I faced another of Nalar's creatures, a mad magician named Sidi. A few of the older members of the temples know the story, for we strove to control the tear of the gods. Ryanna said, Tear of the gods? Pug said, It is a powerful artifact, used by the Ashapians to channel power from the controller gods. He looked at Miranda. You could burn this house down around city, and he would have been standing there laughing at you when the ashes cooled. How did you destroy him? asked Miranda. Pug looked at his wife. I didn't. Miranda said, Are you saying this person controlling Fadawa is this Sidi? It could be. Or it could be one of Sidi's servants, or another like him. Nacor said, Nalar has many agents. Most do not know they serve the mad god. They just do things because they feel the need. Tomas said, What must we do? Pug said, We lure this agent of Nalar into showing itself. How? asked Miranda. Pug nodded. Me. I have to be fate. For Darwin's true master must know that at some point I will act. I have in the past. 
and we can assume there's some sort of surprise waiting for me if I show up. Miranda said, No, the last time I goaded you into acting prematurely, you almost got killed. Since then, I think I've changed my mind about kicking down doors and walking into rooms. Let's sneak around some first. Nacor said, I've snuck around in the enemy's camp back when I went to Novendus with Callus and his friends, and I stood close to the Emerald Queen. I couldn't tell who was running things. Thug is right. We must find a way to force this person, or creature, or spirit, or whatever it is, to reveal itself to us. Miranda said, No, and I'm going to keep saying no until you get it through your head. She stood up. I've snuck around behind the lines, too. Let Nacor and me do it one more time. We can go to where Greylock's army is, and I know we can sneak into the camp. Let me get close to Fadawa and see what I can see. If we can't find anything, I'll agree to go in and let them throw everything at you. But I don't want to risk it just yet. All right. She touched his face. Your temper is going to get you killed, he warned her. I can keep it under control when I have to. Pug looked at Nacor. I want you to promise me you'll tell her when it's too dangerous and it's time to come back here. He looked at Miranda. And I want you to promise you'll listen to him. And when he says so, you'll transport yourself back to this room. They both agreed. Pug said, I don't like this any more than you like my idea. He kissed Miranda and said, it's better if you go now, while it's still dark over there. Miranda held out her hand. Nacor, where do we want to go? Last I heard, Greylock was somewhere south of Prester's View. I know a village on the coast. We'll transport there. Then we can fly up the coast. Ryana said, I'm going to go to sleep. Wake me when you have someone worth fighting. Nacor said, A moment, please. Pug and the others felt their memories shut off again, hiding knowledge of Nalar, and then the mystic barrier was lowered. Tomas said, Sleep well, friend. The dragon in human form left the room. Miranda took Nacor's hand, and they vanished from sight, leaving Pug and Tomas alone. Tomas removed his golden helm and placed it on Pug's desk. Well, old friend, there's not much for us to do but wait. Pug said, I'm not very hungry, but we should eat. He rose and led his friend out of the study, down the hall, and toward the kitchen. You better land soon, shouted Nacor. My arms are getting tired. They were flying to the east of the highway, just above the treetops, with Nacor dangling from his staff, which Miranda held below her as she flew. They had appeared at a fishing village near Quester's View. It had been deserted. Miranda had picked up Nacor and had flown across the highway some distance away from a few campfires, and then had turned northward. They had flown past the campfires of both sides, past a large static position that had Nacor puzzled. He knew something significant had occurred for Greylock to have halted his northward march. Miranda came in for a landing, letting go of Nacor's staff. He landed with an audible oof as he struck the ground hard. Sorry, she said as she landed. My wrists were starting to hurt. When you said we could fly together, I thought you had a spell that would carry both of us, Nacor said as he stood up, brushing himself off. I almost hurt myself on my staff. Well, if you'd left the thing behind like I told you to, it wouldn't have happened. She sounded very unsympathetic. Nacor laughed. You will be an excellent mother some day, She said, not until Pug and I feel the world is a safer place than it is right now. Being alive is being at risk, said Nacor, as he adjusted his garment and recovered his staff. Now, let us see if we can sneak into the enemy camp. How do you propose to do it? Like I always do. Act like I belong. Just stay close behind me and please one thing. What? Don't lose your temper. Miranda's expression clouded, and she said, I don't have a temper. Nacor grinned. There, you're doing it now. You insufferable little man, she said, walking off ahead of him. Miranda? What? she shouted, looking over her shoulder. Nacor hurried to catch up and said, 
For a woman of your experience, you can be very childish. Miranda seemed on the verge of saying something. She stood still for a moment, then finally said, You don't know me, Nacor. You may have been my mother's first husband, but you know nothing of me. You don't know what my childhood was like. You don't know what it was to be raised by imperial agents. If I'm childish, it may be because I had no childhood. Whatever the reasons, please try to keep from getting us killed, said Nacor as he walked by her. Softly, he said, and for a woman your age, you are very concerned about things that happened a very long time ago. She hurried to stay up with him. What? Nacor turned to face her, and for the first time since she had met him, there was not one shred of humor in the man's expression. He gazed at her with an expression that could only be called intimidating, and for a moment she glimpsed the power he had within him. Softly he said, the past can be a terrible weight bound to you by an unbreakable chain. You can drag it with you, forever looking over your shoulder at what holds you back, or you can let it go and move forward. It's your choice. For those who live centuries, it's a very important choice. He turned and walked away from her. Miranda stood for a moment, then caught up with him again. This time she said nothing. They worked their way down through trees on the western face of the Calastius Mountains. They had passed the battle lines several miles to the south, where Greylock's army had established a fixed front. Nacor said, Something strange has happened. Greylock is dug in down south. At least that's what it looked like from up there. He pointed skyward. As you sped along, it looks like he's digging in, perhaps against a counterattack. Miranda said, I don't know. Maybe they're going to wait for supplies sent up to that fishing village where we landed. Maybe, but I don't think so. From the battlefield, the stench of the dead filled the night air. Thousands of bodies littered the field. This is very bad. To leave the dead unburied is an evil thing. North of the battlefield, a structure was being built. It appeared to be a fortress of some type, but as they neared it, they could see it was actually a series of large buildings linked together by huge wooden fences, a uniform twenty feet high. Men were camped around fires scattered around the periphery. Look, said Acor, they don't camp too close. What is it? asked Miranda as they came near the edge of the sheltering trees. Something very bad, I think. A temple, maybe. Temple to what? Let's go find out. He glanced around. Over there. He led her through the trees to a place close to a collection of tents of all sizes and colors. They scurried through the heavy bowls until they found a gap between two campfires, where they could slip in without attracting undue attention. They passed by unchallenged. Nacor led Miranda past a series of campsites, where there were just two people among several walking about on some errand or another. But as they passed a large camp, a man walked toward them. His head was shaved, save for a single fall of hair, tied up to cascade behind him. The hair looked to be cinched by a ring of bone. He wore deep scars on each cheek. He was bare-chested and wore a vest of what appeared to be human skin. His trousers were dyed leather, and Nacor didn't inspect them too closely. He was massively muscled and carried a huge curved blade known as a flasher. It was a two-handed weapon, but he looked capable of wielding it with one hand. He walked up, weaving slightly, to Miranda, and looked her over in a very frank fashion, then turned to Nacor and said with a drunken slur, You show her to me. Nacor grinned. No, I can't. The man's eyes grew wide, and he looked as if he was about to erupt into a rage as he said, No! You say no to... Mustafa! Nacor pointed to the building and said, She goes there. Instantly the man's expression changed, and he looked at Nacor and backed away. I don't ask, he said, hurrying away. What was that? asked Miranda. I don't know, said Nacor. He looked at the building less than a hundred yards away. But I think it means we need to be careful in there. We're going to walk in? asked Miranda. You have a better idea? 
replied Nacor, walking toward the building. No, said Miranda, hurrying after him again. They both felt a strange energy as they neared it. As they got closer, it grew stronger. Miranda said, That makes me feel like I need to take a bath. If your husband doesn't object, I'll join you, said Nacor. Come this way. He motioned toward an opening in the fence between sections of the building, and they entered. Once they had entered, Nacor saw what the structures were. A huge square had three small buildings at each corner. In the center rose six large stones, each one carved with runes that set Miranda's teeth on edge to view. What is this place? she asked. It's a place of summoning, a place of dark magic, a place from which something very bad will come, said Nacor. They saw movement in the dark, in the middle of the ring of stones. They moved forward quietly. A band of men, all wearing dark robes, stood around a large stone. Behind the stone was a man who stood with arms outstretched, one who chanted something to the sky. Now we know why that man was so afraid, whispered Nacor. Look! Upon the stone lay a young woman, her eyes wide with terror, a gag in her mouth. Her hands were tied to rings of iron in the stone, and she was dressed in a short, black, sleeveless shift. Nacor's eyes widened as he considered this. We must leave, he said urgently. Miranda said, We can't leave her there to die. Thousands will die soon if we don't leave, he whispered, holding her elbow and steering her back toward the exit. Then there came a rumbling in the air, and Nacor said, Run! Miranda didn't hesitate, and followed Nacor out the doorway. The soldiers nearby ignored the two who ran from the building, for their eyes were riveted on the scene before them. A faint blue-green light was gathering around the building, swirling as if being stirred by a giant invisible stick. Nacor stopped a few yards before Miranda and held his staff overhead. Fly! he shouted. Miranda halted, closed her eyes, and gathered her own powers to fly. She leaped forward, as if diving, but rather than falling, she rose. She grabbed Nacor's staff and hauled him into the sky. She flew in a straight line up the hillside, then began a gentle turn. When she could look down upon the building, she said, Oh, gods of mercy! Up the coast, a dozen lights like the one before them had blossomed, evil green and blue lights that filled the night with a terrible illumination. Then down the coast came a line of power, moving from each of the constructions, starting somewhere near Illith and ending below where Miranda flew. A note painful to hear rang, and below those soldiers camped nearest the building reeled back from the sound. A faint light spread out in a fan from the building toward the kingdom camp, growing fainter as it went. It shifted through the spectrum, going to red, then back to green, then to violet. A last deep indigo wave faded from view, and the grinding sound suddenly stopped. Then, on the battlefield, the dead began to rise. 25. Confrontation Men screamed. Eric raced from his tent, barely dressed, holding his sword. Battle-hardened soldiers were fleeing in terror, while others struggled at the front. He grabbed one man and shouted, What is it? The man's eyes were wide with horror, and he could only point to the front of the line as he pulled free of Eric's grasp and ran. Eric hurried to the front of the line, and for a moment he couldn't understand what he saw. His men were fighting a vicious action against the invader, and he leaped forward, shouting, All units to the line! Then he saw one of the men locked in struggle with a kingdom soldier who wore the tunic of a different kingdom unit. For a second he wondered if they had been infiltrated. Then he saw the man's face, and the hair on Eric's neck and arms stood up. He felt revulsion unlike anything he had known in his short life. The soldier, trying to kill his former companion, was dead. His lifeless eyes were still rolled up in his head, and the flesh of his face was pallid and slack. But his movements were deliberate as he swung his sword. Eric jumped forward and severed the thing's head from its body with a single blow. The head rolled away, but the body kept swinging the sword. Eric hacked again and severed the creature's arm, yet the creature pressed forward. Jado Shate leaped past Eric and cut the creature's leg out from under it. The corpse toppled over. Man, they won't stop. 
Eric recognized the danger. Beyond the horror of facing men already dead, which had caused one man in four to run in fear, the dead were unrelenting. They could not be stopped unless they were hacked to pieces. And while one was being butchered, another would strike and kill a kingdom soldier. Then Eric saw a freshly killed kingdom soldier rise up, his eyes rolled up in his head, and turn to attack his former companions. How do we fight them? shouted Jado. Fire, said Eric. He turned and shouted, Hold them here, and ran to the rear. Men were running forward to answer the alarm, and Eric held up his hands, halting a score of them. Go to the rear and get all the hay the cavalry left, he pointed to where the road narrowed. Lay it from there to there. He indicated another point opposite it across the road. Then he ran to another squad, who were about to run to the front, and shouted, Strip the tents! Get everything that will burn and pile it on the hay! What hay, Captain? asked one soldier. When you get back with the tents, you'll see the hay. Eric hurried to the rear, where the engineers had been sleeping under their partially completed catapults. They were up and buckling on weapons, ready to defend their war engines if necessary. Are any of these finished? asked Eric. The captain of engineers, a stocky man with a gray beard, said, This one is ready, Captain, and that other over there is just about ready to go. What is going on? Eric grasped the man's arm. Go to the front. See where our forward positions are. Return here and aim your catapult at that location. The captain of engineers ran off while Eric turned to the rest of his crew. How many of you will it take to finish that other catapult? One of the engineers said, Just two of us, Captain. All we have to do is install the locking clamps on the arm. We could have finished last night, but we wanted to get supper. Go finish it. The rest of you, come with me. He led them to the baggage train and shouted to the soldiers guarding it, Get to the front and hold. They ran off, and Eric pointed to a pair of wagons sitting on the side of the road. He asked the engineers, Can any of you hitch up those horses? All of them answered they could. So Eric said, Get half that oil to the front, where you'll see them building a barricade, and the other half to the catapults. He ran back to the front. The plan would only work if they could keep the dead soldiers outside the barricade. And until that task was finished, Eric could serve his cause best by using his power to hack apart each dead soldier trying to get past the diamonds. Miranda said, We must get Pug and Tomas. They watched from a vantage point among the trees upon the hillside as the kingdom forces rallied to repulse the first wave of undead soldiers. Then Nacor heard horns blowing at the rear of Fadawa's army. Men under arms gathered and formed up behind the struggle taking place of the diamonds. Yes, said Nacor. Get Pug and Tomas and Rihanna if she's there. Miranda vanished. Nacor heard a trumpet sound, and the kingdom forces at their diamonds retreated to a barrier wall that had been building rapidly behind them. They leaped over it, and those who were wounded were dragged up and over it by their comrades. No man wished to die and turn against his comrades. Then a fire was ignited, and another. Suddenly the barricade was ablaze. Von Darkmoor, he thought. Young Eric was thinking fast on his feet. The dead stumbled into the flames, and noiselessly they flailed about until they collapsed upon the ground. The few that managed to gain a purchase on the burning barriers were pushed back by spears and poles. Then Nacor heard the sound of a war engine firing, and in the darkness he could see something flying over the camp to land near the diamonds. A minute later, another missile came flying overhead and landed closer to the barricade. Nacor could see a barrel explode upon impact, sending oil in all directions, which ignited when some struck the barricade. The pool of fire engulfed those corpses stumbling toward the barricade, and soon they were falling. Pug, Tomas, Rihanna, and Miranda suddenly appeared next to Nacor. Pug said, Guards! Nacor said, Those corpses aren't the problem, Pug. Eric von Darkmoor is taking care of them as needed, but there is where you must go. He pointed northward. Find the source of that energy, and you'll find the one you need to destroy. Battle horns sounded, and Fadawa's army started to march forward as the fires began to abate. Tomas asked, where can I best serve? Nacor said, Killing those soldiers here does no good, but ending the problem up there may save the West. Rihanna shifted her form, and suddenly the huge dragon towered over them. I will carry you all. They climbed on her back, and she launched herself skyward. Those soldiers who happened to be glancing toward the tree line as Rihanna struck a mighty beat of her wings and gained altitude were astonished. And many shouted and pointed, but as the battle built in fury and the advancing army of Fadawa bore down on the abandoned diamonds, most were too preoccupied with survival to notice the dragon. 
She circled once and headed north. Dash heard the drums from the Keshians in the field. He knew he'd see what they had in store later. The darkness hid the Keshians' deployment as sunrise was still hours off. As best the watchmen on the walls could tell in the dark, they were facing only cavalry and mounted infantry, with no heavy foot or war engines. Dash assumed they had infiltrated fast-moving companies for weeks now, and that slower-moving units had been avoided. With even half the normal garrison here, Kesh would never risk an attack on this scale. So the news was mixed good and bad. They were only facing swordsmen and horse archers, but they were facing a lot of them. Dash expected this meant the escaping Keshian officer Duco wrote of in his message to Patrick had successfully reached his army with the news of Crondor's weaknesses. The only good news in the message had been the fact of Jimmy being alive and Malar being dead. The word from the palace was equally mixed. Patrick, Francie, and her father would recover, though Lord Brian might have lasting effects from the poison. Lord Rufio was dead, and several of the other nobles of the area as well. Two officers had recovered enough to take up positions on the walls, but Dash knew they were woefully undermanned to hold off the Keshian army for more than a few hours, a day or two at best. There were still too many weaknesses in the defense of the city. There were ways into the city that you didn't have to be a mocker to find. The dry aqueduct along the north wall had more than a half-dozen entrances if one simply took the time to probe. Dash wished he could have repaired the sluice gates and flooded it, but he would have filled a hundred cellars full of water by doing so. Suddenly an idea struck Dash. He called out, Gustav! The mercenary appeared and said, Sheriff, take two men and run to the city armory. See if we have any Quagan fire oil. If we do, here's what you do with it. Dash outlined his plan, then called to Mackie. Hold things here while I'm gone. I'll be back as soon as I can. Dash hurried off the wall and ran down High Street to the intersection of the Northgate Road. He cut through burned-out buildings until he reached the cleverly cleared alley, and he hurried through it, despite the pre-dawn darkness. He jumped fences and ducked under obstacles, risking injury to reach his goal in as timely a fashion as he could. He found the door he sought, a root cellar entrance from all appearances, but really a cover to one of the mocker-controlled tunnels leading toward their headquarters. He hurried down stone steps as lightly as he could while keeping up a good rate of speed. He grabbed a stone wall corner with his left hand, steadying himself as he swung around. A man turned with a startled expression on his face, and without breaking stride, Dash hit him as hard as he could, dropping him to the stone floor without a sound. Dash hurried along a wide walkway which ran above the watercourse. There was a slow trickle of water flowing through it. Dash knew that would change if Gustav found the oil and used it as directed. Dash reached a section of wall that appeared identical to the adjacent sections, but which yielded to pressure, swinging open on a shaft perfectly balanced so as to pivot with ease. Down a short tunnel, Dash hurried, reaching a plain door. Dash knew that here he stood the biggest risk of being killed before he could speak. He tripped the locks from his side, but instead of opening the door, he stood back. The audible clicks alerted someone, for after a moment the door swung open and a curious face peered through. Dash grabbed the thief and hauled him forward, spinning him around while off balance and propelling him back through the door before he entered. The man careened into two others who were standing on the other side of the door, knocking all of them over in a heap. Dash stepped through. He held his hands out so anyone could see he wasn't armed. But to ensure that he made things as clear as possible, he shouted, I'm not armed! I came to talk! The denizens of mothers, the headquarters for the mockers, turned in astonishment at the sight of the sheriff of Crondor standing before them, his sword still at his side. From across the room, Trina said, Why, Sheriff Poppy, to what do we owe this honor? Looking from face to face, most of which were shifting from surprise to anger, he said, I came to warn you. Of what? said one man. Keshians in the tunnels? They're your worry, said Dash. The ones outside the gate are mine. No, I came to warn you that in less than an hour this entire room and the rest of Mother's is going to be underwater. What? shouted one man. It's a lie, swore another. No, it's not a lie, said Dash. I'm going to flood the North Aqueduct and the bypass channel below Stinky Street. The culverts above the main passage, he pointed to the door through which he had just entered and the passage beyond, are shattered and all that water is going to come flooding down here. This entire section is going to be underwater by noon. Trina walked over, two very large, menacing-looking men accompanying her. You wouldn't be saying that to flush us out, would you, Sheriff Puppy? 
It could be useful to have us running through the sewers and tangling with some Keshians you haven't managed to find yet. Maybe, but that's not it. Or maybe you want us to be standing up on the streets for the Keshians to run over when they break down the gate, said a man nearby, pulling his dagger. Hardly, said Dash. There are enough bumps in the roads as it is. I don't need more. I would believe you, said Trina, if I didn't know the North Sluice is damaged from the war and can't be opened until it's repaired. I'm not repairing it, said Dash. I'm going to burn it. Several men laughed. You're going to burn a gate that's half underwater, said one. How are you doing that? Quag and fire oil? Suddenly a man said, It burns underwater. Trina turned and shouted orders, and men began to grab packages, bundles, and sacks. She came to stand before Dash and said, Why warn us? He grabbed her arm and looked her in the eyes. I've grown fond of certain thieves over my life. He kissed her. Call me an idiot, he said after she stepped back. Besides, you may be a bunch of ragged good-for-nothings, but you're my ragged good-for-nothings. Where should we go? she asked, and Dash knew she wasn't referring to the mockers in general. Take the old man to Barrett's Coffee House. It's almost rebuilt, and Rue Avery already has stocked it with some food. There's a tunnel off of the sewer under Prince Arutha's way that leads to a landing by his basement. Lie low there. She looked him in the eyes and said, You're going to cause me more trouble than you're worth before we're done, Sheriff Puppy. But for now, I am in your debt. He started to turn away, but she grabbed him and kissed him back. Whispering into his ear, she said, Stay alive, damn you. You as well he whispered. Then he turned and hurried back down the tunnel. He stopped to revive the man he had knocked unconscious and was glad he hadn't tried a stunt like walking into Mother's Uninvited when the mockers were at the height of their power. There would have been a dozen guards in that tunnel instead of one. The groggy man didn't quite understand what it was Dash was telling him, but he pieced together enough of the message to know he had to get to high ground in a hurry. Dash ran along the major waterway that passed Mother's and reached a place where the culverts above had broken through. He leaped and grabbed the jagged edge of a heavy, hard clay pipe that protruded out of the wall above his head. He pulled himself up and stood on it, working his way along to a break in the wall barely large enough to permit him entrance. He risked getting stuck as he wiggled through the break to a place where a large hole appeared above his head. He pulled himself up and stood outside in the bed of the northern watercourse. He looked around in the pre-dawn gray and saw no one in sight. He ran toward the east. As he reached the end of the aqueduct, he saw Gustav and his men standing before the large wooden gate. Two men were already slamming axes into the supports on either side of the jammed gate. Dash said, How goes it? Gustav smiled ruefully. If those supports don't give way before we want them to and drown us all, this might work. How much oil did you find? Several casks. I've got some of the lads pouring it into clay jugs, like you said. Dash hurried over to the place, Gustav indicated where two men were pouring sticky, foul-smelling naphthalene from small casks into large clay jugs. Only about a third of the way, said Dash, and leave the stoppers off. We want the air to get to it. The men nodded. As Dash started to return to Gustav, he said, And you want to be as far away from fire as you can get until you wash that stuff off. Use lots of soap. Remember, it burns underwater. The two men who were swinging the axes jumped back as one when a loud crack sounded accompanied by a flexing of the wooden gate. Small jets of water spurted through cracks in the wood, and a bit of dirt and gravel washed down the bank. Looks like it's going to go under the weight of the water, said Gustav. Eventually, but we can't wait until the next big rain. Did you bring the rags? Over there, said Gustav, pointing to a man standing over a box up on the bank. Good, said Dash, hurrying over to inspect the damage. To one of the men with an axe, he said, Crack this beam here some more. The beam was a huge one, a foot on each side, that had been stuck between foundation stones and held the right side of the sluice gate. The man set to with his huge axe, smashing into the wood, almost as hard as rock with age. Yet each time he struck, chips flew and the wood splintered more. Dash waved his men out of the way and indicated that the rags and what was left of the naphthalene and the casks should be brought over and the jars should be taken to the top of the bank. The men hurried up the stone bank of the aqueduct. Dash motioned the axe-wielder aside and said, Get up there! He set two casks down on the stones and picked up the third. Carefully, he laid out a long run of the rags, tied it into a knotted cord, and dribbled naphthalene on it. He then tucked one end of the rags into a cask and set a third atop the two on the bottom, 
forming a little pyramid right below where the beam had been chopped by the axe. Dash hurried to the far end of the rag and pulled a piece of flint from his pocket. Using his knife blade, he struck sparks until one caught on the naphthalene-soaked rag. Dash wasn't entirely sure what to expect. He had heard stories from his grandfather, but had only seen the results of the use of this oil distillation mixed with powdered limestone and sulfur. With a whoosh, the flame sprang up the rag. Dash ran. He reached the bank of the aqueduct as the flame burned quickly along the rag. He stood next to Gustav and said, If it burns as hot as it's reputed to burn, it should eat through the rest of that wood quickly. The water pressure should shove over the... The flame reached the casks. They exploded. The force of the blast was far more than Dash had expected, thinking he was going to get more of a large fire. Instead, men were thrown to the ground and two were struck by wood splinters. Gustav picked himself up off the ground, saying, Gods, what was that? I'm not sure, said Dash. My grandfather told me something about too much air on the stuff, and I guess that's what he meant. Look, said one of the constables. The blast had cut through most of the large beam, which now was being bent back by the gate under the pressure of millions of gallons of river water trapped behind it. With a loud groan, the entire sluice gate began to move as the water started to pour through several gaps in the wood. As the force of the water increased, the wood started to move more rapidly. Creaking and groaning sounds were replaced by a crack. The beam sheared in two, and suddenly the entire gate was swept away before a wall of water. Dash sat on the bank, watching the wall of water move down the aqueduct. When it hit the break in the stones that would send water pouring into the lower sewer, he could barely see a pause as the wave swept on past it. Gustav said, Well, that should drown some rats. We can hope, said Dash, taking the constable's offered hand and putting himself to his feet. Thinking of the mockers, he said, As long as it isn't our rats that get drowned. What do you want us to do with these clay jugs, Sheriff? asked one of the constables. Dash said, I was going to have you throw them at what I thought would be a nice little fire down there. Bring them along. I think we can find a use for them. As the man reached down to grab the jugs, Dash added, and handle them gently. He motioned to the water surging through the destroyed sluice. They hurried back through the city, and as they turned the corner to High Street, Dash shouted to Gustav, Get some barricades up here. He then pointed back another block and said, And there, when they break through, I want them turned before their cavalry hits the market. As soon as the gate goes, get archers up on the roofs there, there and there. He pointed to three corners of the intersection. Gustav nodded. I notice you didn't say if they break through. It's just a question of when, and if help can get here before they do. I think we're in for some nasty days ahead. Gustav shrugged. I'm a mercenary, Sheriff. Nasty days are what I get paid for. Dash nodded as Gustav hurried off to carry out his orders, and the rest of the constables carried the jugs of naphthalene to the gate. He glanced around the city streets, now deserted as people hid in their houses, hoping against hope that somehow they would be spared another destructive rampage, such as they had endured the year before. Dash shook his head. Mercenaries, soldiers, and constables might get paid to endure such as this, but citizens didn't. They were the ones who suffered, and in his time as sheriff he had forged a bond with the people of Crondor he couldn't have imagined before. Now he was starting to understand why his grandfather had loved this city so much, both the noble and the base, the exalted and the low. It was his city, and Dash would be damned to the lowest hell before he'd see another invader take it again. Dash hurried toward the gate when he heard horns. He knew a Keshian herald was approaching under a flag of truce to announce under what conditions his general would accept the surrender of the city. Dash climbed the steps in the gatehouse and reached the battlements as the Keshian herald approached, the rising sun peeking over the mountains behind him. He was a desert man, and on each side accompanying him rode a dog soldier, each holding a banner. One was the lion banner of the empire, and the other was a house flag. Dash knew his grandfather and father would both disapprove his not recognizing it at once. Sergeant Mackey said, They want to talk. Dash said, Well, it would be rude not to listen. Dash would be tempted to drop a jar of the naphthalene on the herald before the man was through, he thought, but each minute that passed before the attack bought them a little more time to prepare. The herald rode before the gate and shouted, in the name of the Empire of Great Kesh and her great general, Hasham ibn al-Tuk, open the gates and surrender the city. Dash looked around and saw that every man on the wall was watching him. 
He leaned out between two Merlins on the wall and shouted back, By what right have you come to claim a city that is not yours? He glanced at Mackey and said, Might as well go through the formalities. We claim these lands as ancient Keshian soil. Who speaks for the city? I, Dashell Jameson, Sheriff of Crondor. With contempt in every word, the herald shouted, Where is your prince, O jailer of beggars, hiding under his bed? Still sleeping, I think, said Dash, not wishing to reveal to this man anything about the poisoning. If you care to wait, he may show up later today. That's all right, came a voice from behind Dash. Dash turned and saw a pale Patrick standing there, being held erect by a soldier. Patrick had donned his royal armor, golden-trimmed breastplate and open-faced helm, with a gold-trimmed purple sash of office over his shoulder. As he passed Dash, Patrick whispered, Should I lose consciousness? Tell them I've left an outrage. He reached the wall and steadied himself, and Dash could see how difficult it was for him to stand, even with a strong soldier holding on to him from behind. Yet Patrick found it within himself to shout out with power. I am here, dogs of cash. Say what you will. The herald barely hid his surprise at seeing the Prince of Crondor on the wall. He obviously had believed the poisoner successful. Most gracious prince, said the herald, my master bids you open your gates and withdraw. He will escort you and your retinue to your nation's borders. Just this side of Salador, said Dash quietly. Patrick shouted, My nation's borders! I am standing on the wall of the capital city of the Western Realm. These lands are ancient Kesh and are being reclaimed. Dash whispered, I know we're buying time, but why bother? Patrick gulped for air and nodded. Then, with his last strong breath, shouted, Then come you on and do your worst. We reject your claim and scorn your master. The herald said, At not in haste, fair prince. My master is kind. He shall make his offer three times. At sundown tonight we return to hear your second answer. Should you say again, nay, we shall come one last time at dawn tomorrow. And that shall be the last of it. The herald turned and spurred his mount forward. Dash turned to see Patrick barely conscious, still being held up by the soldier. Bravely done, fair prince, Dash said without sarcasm. To the soldier, he said, take him back to his quarters and see he rests. Turning to Mackey, Dash said, get the men down from the wall and fed. Keep a few to watch, but the Keshians will probably be as good as their word and not attack us until dawn tomorrow. He sat down and suddenly felt bone tired. At least now we know when their spies inside the city will attack. Looking at the old sergeant, he said, They'll try to open the gate tonight. The dragon sped through the sky, while in the east the sun rose above the hills. The mystic energy along the coast was a map for them to follow. Tomas's arts, the lingering heritage of the Valheru, allowed them all to ride upon Ryana's back without falling. You know, said Nacor, speaking loudly to overcome the wind noise as he sat behind Miranda at the base of the dragon's neck, as much as being an engine of death, this display is set to lure us to some sort of confrontation. Pug, who sat directly behind Tomas, said, I expect as much. There, said Tomas, pointing down and to the left. Below them stretched the coastline, a southwest-facing shoreline from Quester's view to Illith. The harbor of Illith showed a frenzy of ships, most of them hauling anchor and sailing out of the port. Nacor said, Those ships' captains didn't like what they saw last night and are catching the morning tide out. Ryana, said Tomas, down there. He indicated the eastern gate of the city, outside of which a great building had been erected, and it was that building that was the source of the energy which had flowed down the coast, fueling the evil magic that had animated the corpses. As the dragon landed, armed men ran in all directions, uncertain of what to do. Let me go first, said Tomas. Pug said, Let's not shed any blood until we have to. Miranda said, We will have to. Pug said, But until then, 
He gestured toward the ground just before Rihanna touched down. They all could see a ripple, as if water had been troubled by a stone, causing the earth to undulate. A deep rumbling could be heard, and dust shot into the air following the course of the quickly expanding circle. As they touched down, the circle was now large enough to easily encompass the dragon. The soil below their feet was motionless. But where the expanding circle's wave struck, it was as if an earthquake raged, for each advancing soldier who stepped upon the ripple was thrown down to the ground, then mercilessly tossed into the air several times. Many turned and fled, leaving only the bravest of the invaders to confront the dragon and her riders. Then Rihanna bellowed, and their ears rang, and she shot a blast of fire into the heavens, and the rest of the soldiers fled. No sane man would face a great golden dragon. As the four of them dismounted, Miranda said, Thank you. That should buy us some time. Rihanna said, You are welcome. To Tomas, she said, When the danger has passed, I shall leave, but until it has, call me should you need me. I will be nearby. The dragon launched herself into the sky, and with a powerful beat of her wings was gone, speeding to the north. Tomas walked purposefully toward the building. Pug, Miranda, and Nacor followed. With the departure of the dragon, some of the bolder warriors near the city gate ran to intercept the four. Tomas unstrapped his shield from across his back in a movement so fluid and natural it looked impossible to Pug. No mortal man could have duplicated the feat. His sword was out before the first warrior had closed. The man was big and carried a large sword in two hands. He ran at Tomas, shouting an inarticulate battle cry, but Tomas continued to advance at his normal pace. The man struck a powerful blow downward, and Tomas moved his shield slightly, causing the blade to skid off the surface. The man saw sparks explode from the contact, but no mark sullied the surface of the shield. Tomas swung lightly as if flicking a fly from his shoulder, and the man died before he hit the ground. Two men behind him hesitated. One then shouted and charged, while the other showed fear and turned and ran. The one who charged died like the man before, and Tomas again looked as if he were disposing of annoying pests, not battle-hardened warriors. Tomas reached the building, a thing of black stones and wooden facades. It squatted, a terrible black sore on the landscape. There was nothing about it pleasing to the eye or harmonious in any fashion. It reeked of evil. Tomas walked to the large black wooden doors and paused. He drew back his right fist and struck the rightmost door. The door exploded inward, as if there had been no hinges. As they walked in, Nacor looked at the shattered iron hinges and said, Impressive. Miranda said, Remind me never to get him mad. He is not mad, said Nacor, just determined. If he was mad, he'd pull the walls down. The building was a giant square, with two rows of seats set hard against the walls. There were two doors, the one through which they had entered, and another opposite. In the center of the room a square pit yawned at them, and from deep within a red glow could be seen. Above it hung a metal platform. "'Gods!' said Miranda. "'What a stench!' "'Look,' said Nacor, indicating the floor. Before each seat on the floor lay a body. They were warriors, men with scars upon their cheeks, and each was open-mouthed, their eyes wide as if they had died screaming in horror. Makar hurried over to the pit and looked in. He stepped back. Something is down there. Pug looked up at the platform and said, That appears to be a way down. Indicating the dried blood and gore on it, Miranda said, And now the way up. Tomas said, Whatever caused that necromancy last night is down there. Makar said, No, it is a tool, like all those dead fools. Where is Fadawa? asked Miranda. In the city, I think, said Nacor, probably in a baron's citadel. A strange keening sound echoed from deep within the pit. The hairs on Pug's neck stood up. We can't leave this here, Nacor said. We can always come back. Miranda said, Good, let's leave this place. She walked to the closed door, opposite the one through which they had entered, and threw it wide. As soon as she did, they saw the soldiers arrayed on the other side, their shields in a wall, their bows poised, and cavalry behind them. 
in the moment it took for the scene to register. They heard the order given, and the bowmen fired. Dash swore. We've got twelve, eighteen hours to ferret out the rest of the infiltrators, or risk a breach. Thomas Calhern, a squire in Duke Rufio's court, had recovered enough from the poison to serve. Dash had named him an acting captain. What matter? he asked. Gods, man, you saw the army outside the gate. Dash said, Never been in a battle before? No, said the young man, about the same age as Dash. If the walls are intact, those outside must bring ten men against the wall for every one we have on top of it. We should be able to hold them for a few days, perhaps a week. And if my brother is as clever as I know him to be, a force from Port Vicor should arrive within days. But if some band of Cassian thugs gets a portal opened, and the Cassians get inside the walls, this battle is over before it starts. They were sitting in the prince's conference room, and Dash turned to Mackey. Send a message to the lads at Newmarket Jail. I want the constables sniffing around the streets. That takes care of the streets, said Mackey. But what about below them? Dash said, I'll take care of that part. Dash slipped through a door, and a dagger was suddenly at his throat. Put that away, he hissed. Sheriff Poppy, said a happy-sounding Trina. I would have been very upset had I killed you. Not as much as I, said Dash. How is he? She nodded toward the corner. A score of thieves were huddled in a far corner of the cellar. Dash smelled coffee and food. Raided the kitchen, have we? Trina said, It's a coffee house. We were hungry. There was food up there. What did you think? Dash shook his head. I don't know what I'm thinking these days. Trina walked with him over to where the old man lay upon a low bed, one that had been used as a stretcher to bear him to barracks. She whispered, He's not doing well. Dash knelt beside the old man, who looked at him, but didn't say anything. The old man held up his hand, and Dash took it. Uncle, he said softly. The old man gently squeezed, then let go. His one eye closed. She leaned over, and after a moment said, He's sleeping again. Sometimes he speaks, other times he can't. Dash stood up, and they went to a relatively uncrowded corner of the basement, between stacks of crates. How much time? asked Dash. A few days, maybe less. When he was recovering from his burns, the priest said only a great wish or the gift of a god would save him. He's known this day was coming since then. Dash looked at this odd woman who had come to captivate his attention. How many of you are left? She started to make a quip, then said, I don't know. There are maybe another two hundred scattered through the city. Why? Pass the word. We can use every sword we can find. The Cassians will sell you all under slavery, you know that. If they can find us, said Trina. If they take the city and hold it more than a week, they'll find you. Maybe. Well, anyone who shows up with a sword and fights, I'll see their pardon for their crimes. Guaranteed? she asked. You have my word on it. I'll pass the word, she said. I've got more pressing matters now. The Cassians have given us until dawn tomorrow to surrender, else they'll attack. We assume that means they're going to try to open one of the gates between now and then. And you want us to watch the gates and let you know? Something like that? He stepped closer to her, looking deep into her eyes. You've got to slow them down. She laughed. You mean defend the gates until you get there? He smiled. Something like that, he repeated. I can't ask my brothers and sisters to do that. We're not warriors. Sure, we have some bashers among the mockers, but most of us don't know which end of a sword is which. Then you'd better learn, said Dash. I can't ask them. No, but you can order them, said Dash slowly. She said nothing. Dash said, I know the old man has been unable to run things for a while. I'll bet my inheritance you're the current daymaster. She remained silent. I won't ask anything from you without fair trade. What do you propose? Hold the gate, whichever they attack. Defend it until I can get a flying company there, and I will pardon everyone. A general amnesty? The same deal I made originally with the old man. Not enough. What more do you want? asked Dash. She pointed around the room. Do you know how we came to be? The mockers of Crondor? Dash said, 
I've heard stories since I was a boy from my grandfather about the mockers. But did he ever tell you how the guild came to be? No, Dash admitted. The first leader of the guild was called the Square Man. He was a fence who settled disputes between different gangs in the city. We were killing ourselves more than the citizens. We were stealing from one another as much as from the citizens. And we were getting hung for it. The Square Man fixed that. He started making truces between gangs and getting things organized. He made a place for us called Mothers, and he paid bribes and bought some of us out of jail and off the gallows. The upright man took over before your grandfather was born. He consolidated the square man's power and made the guild the place it was when Jimmy the Hand was running roofs. A few of us enjoy the dodgy path, Dash. Some of us like breaking heads, and there's no excuse for us. But most of us just got dealt a bad hand. Most of us have nowhere else to go. Dash looked around the cellar. Men and women of all ages gathered there, and Dash remembered the stories his grandfather had told him of the beggar gangs, the urchins running the streets, the girls working the taverns, and the rest of them. If we get amnesty, we're back on the streets the next day, and most of us are breaking laws, and we're right back where we started. There was only one Jimmy the Hand who had a prince reach down and raise him up to the heights. Trina gripped Dash's arm. She said, Don't you see? If your grandfather hadn't saved the prince that one night long ago, he would have lived out his life with these people. It might have been him lying on that bed over there instead of his brother. And you might be over there with the other young men, thinking of how to survive the coming war, find a meal, and keep out of the sheriff's clutches instead of being the sheriff. You're only a noble by a quirk of fate, Dash. She looked into his eyes, then she kissed him long and hard. You've got to make a promise, Dash. Make a promise and I'll do whatever you ask. What is the promise? You've got to save them. All of them. Save them? You've got to see they are fed and clothed and warm and dry and out of harm's way. Dash said, Oh, Trina, why don't you ask me to move the city? She kissed him again. I've never felt anything for any man like I feel for you, she whispered. Maybe I'm finally acting the love-struck girl after all these years. Maybe in my foolish dreams I see myself living in comfort as the wife of a noble. Maybe tomorrow I'll be dead. But if we fight for Crondor, then you must save us all. That's the deal, not some meaningless amnesty. You must take care of the mockers. That's the promise. He looked at her for a long time, studying every detail of her face, as if memorizing it. Finally, he said, I promise. She looked at him, and a tear formed in each eye. As they ran down her face, she said, The deal is done. What do you want us to do? Dash told her, and they spent another moment together. Then he tore himself away from her, the hardest thing he had ever had to do in his life, and he left Barrett's, knowing that his life would never be the same. In his heart, Dash knew that he had made a promise that would be impossible to keep, or if he kept it, he would be betraying his duty to his office. He tried to tell himself that the expediency of the moment required this, that saving the city came first, and that should Crondor fall and they all die, the promise was nothing anyway. But deep inside, Dash knew that he would never look at himself or any oath he gave the same way. 26. Discovery Pug's arm shot forward. A rippling energy wave exploded forward, a wall of moving forces that distorted the air as it passed. Bowmen who had just released their arrows saw them shattered by it an instant before the wall struck them. As if a giant child's arm had swept aside a table full of toys, the soldiers were thrown back. Horsemen died as their mounts were seemingly picked up and tossed back a dozen feet, landing upon their riders. Horses screamed in terror, and those that managed to land on their feet bucked and kicked as they fled. Pug, Tomas, Miranda, and Nacor walked through the avenue cleared by Pug's magic, past men who lay groaning upon the ground. One more hearty warrior rose to his feet, his sword in hand, and lunged toward them. Tomas's sword snaked out of his white scabbard silently and took the man's life before he had taken a step. They walked to the gates of Illith. 
A guard on the gate had witnessed the assault and had frantically ordered the gates closed. Men were pushing furiously on the gates as Tomas reached them. They swung ponderously toward him, but he reached out, placing his shield against the left gate and his sword against the right, and with one massive push, the gates swung inward, knocking dozens of men aside. Nacor said, I wish he'd left Elvendar earlier. Pug nodded. But a vow is a vow. He couldn't see the threat to his home until now. Miranda said, Having power doesn't free one from being short-sighted. Not short-sighted, said Pug. Just a different appreciation of the situation. Where to now? asked Miranda. If I remember the layout of Illith, said Nacor, straight down this street to the high road, turn right, and we walk straight up to the citadel. Archers on the wall loosed a barrage of arrows, and Pug erected a protective barrier. Ignore those, he said to Tomas. We have weightier matters to address. Tomas smiled at his boyhood friend. Agreed. They walked calmly through the city of Illith, and the depredation of the occupation was visible on every side. Some buildings had been rebuilt, but others still lay abandoned, their doors off their hinges and windows shattered, looking like nothing so much as empty faces. Men ran from the sight of the four people encompassed by a sphere of flickering blue energy. From nearby alleys and streets, archers peered out and fired arrows at them. They bounced harmlessly off the magic shell. They reached the corner where they needed to turn and found another company of archers waiting. Dozens of arrows struck the barrier and bounced off, and when Tomas reached a position a dozen feet before the first rank of archers, they broke and ran. Nacor said, These men are not dangerous to us as long as we pay attention to them, but somewhere ahead is someone who is very dangerous. Do you know this as a fact? asked Tomas, or are you conjecturing? Conjecturing, said Nacor. But you suspect something, said Miranda. What? asked Pug. Nothing I care to talk about yet, said Nacor. But yes, I have a suspicion. I've learned over the years to take those seriously, said Pug. What do you suggest? They were nearing a large intersection where soldiers were rolling wagons across the street in a barricade. Nacor said, Only to be careful. Arrows rained down upon them, and even knowing the defense was in place, Miranda and Nacor flinched. This is irritating, said Nacor. Pug said, I agree. And as you observed, it could be dangerous if I let my concentration slip, he said. Stop a moment. They did, and Pug raised his hand. He pointed up in the air, and outside the protective sphere, directly over the tip of his finger, a spark of white light appeared. Pug twirled his finger a moment, and the tiny white hot point of light spun. Protect your eyes, Pug warned. Abruptly the scene became a harsh contrast in white and black, as the point of light erupted to the brilliance of the sun at noon, then brighter. The pulse of light lasted only for a moment, but the effect was literally blinding. Pug and his companions opened their eyes to see men crying in panic and terror, some reaching around while others fell to their knees, their hands to their eyes. I'm blind! was repeated on all sides by panic-stricken men. Tomas walked through a gap between two wagons, the defense of the city forgotten by men made blind. How long will it last? asked Miranda. No more than a day for some, hours for others, said Pug. But this particular group will not be any further trouble to us. They made their way around the last of the barriers and moved up the street toward the citadel. The remaining soldiers, who had retained their sight, ran at the vision of the four powerful beings, walking purposefully down the street. A panic-stricken sentry had called for the drawbridge to be raised, and as they came within a hundred yards of the bridge, they saw it starting to rise. Tomas broke into an effortless run, his sword drawn, and Pug realized he had left the containment of the defensive shell. Pug let it lapse, for while it didn't take a considerable level of concentration to maintain, it required energy he might need later. Tomas leaped atop the rising bridge as it reached a height of six feet above the road. With a quick swing of his sword, he severed the massive iron chain on the right, links the size of a man's head shearing with an explosion of sparks and a deafening clang. Then he severed the left chain, and the bridge crashed back into place. The soldiers inside the citadel cut the restraining ropes on the winch that raised the portcullis, and the heavy iron gates slid down before them, the iron points slamming into the stones with a loud crash. I can raise it, 
And you can all slip under, said Tomas. Miranda said, No, let me. She waved her hands in a series of gestures and raised her right palm, then extended her right arm toward the gate. A ball of scintillating white and silver light formed around her hand, then flew off like a ball lazily tossed by a child, arching gracefully to strike the center of the portcullis. The energy ran along the bars, sparking and sizzling, and the iron in the gate began to smoke. Then it heated up, turning first red, then white hot. Even standing yards away, they could feel a scorching heat of the metal as it began to melt and crumble before them. The men in the gatehouse above the portcullis began to shout and flee the structure due to the tremendous heat rising from the burning gate. Where the molten metal struck the wood of the gate, it flamed and smoke rose. In minutes, a hole more than adequate to allow them to pass had been melted through the gate. Watch where you step, Nacor, said Miranda. You watch, too, said Nacor. I'm not the one wearing sandals, she said. They entered the courtyard, and no one was in sight. Whatever fight may have resided in the garrison was driven from them by the destruction of the portcullis. They crossed the small bailey and entered the keep. A simple tower keep had dominated the harbor at Illith for years, for the original rulers had been little more than pirates and traders, and their harbor was everything. But after the kingdom had annexed Yabon, the new baron had decided to build this citadel at the north end of the city to protect the city from goblins and brothers of the dark path from the northlands raiding down into Yabon. Here, for five generations, the business of the barony had been conducted. They walked up a broad set of steps to a daunting set of oak doors. Tomas pushed them open, and they parted with a shattering crack as a bar the size of a man's arm behind the doors splintered and broke. Before they crossed the threshold, Nacor said, Where well, this place? It is a seat of power. Tomas said, I can feel it. It has an alien feeling, something no Valheru has encountered. Pug said, That's saying something. If a dragon lord hasn't encountered what's on the other side of that door... He closed his eyes and sent out his senses. At the portal, a ward existed. Had they passed through without protection, they would have been incinerated. Pug quickly ascertained the nature of the ward and countered it. It's safe to pass, he said. Sword at the ready and shield before him, Tomas entered the room first. Pug followed with Miranda and Nacor. As soon as they entered the old baronial great hall, it was as if they had stepped into another world. The hall reeked of death, and the floors were stained with blood. Skulls and bones were scattered around the room, and a faint haze darkened the air. Torches burned in sconces, their light angry and red, as if something had sucked the light out of the flames. Men who were no longer human stood on either side of the great hall. Their eyes were glowing jewels of luminous red, their muscles unnaturally enlarged and straining at the skin. They all wore facial scars and expressions of madness. Some twitched and others drooled, and they all had mystic tattoos covering their upper bodies. Some carried double-bladed axes and others had swords and buckler shields. They seemed poised to attack, yet appeared to be waiting upon something. The great vaulted windows of the room had been painted in red and black, passing only the faintest illumination from outside. The rooms upon them were alien and repugnant to view. Nacor glanced from window to window. These are wrong, he whispered. What do you mean? asked Miranda. Whoever painted those is trying to do something very, very bad. But they didn't do it correctly. How do you know? asked Tomas, holding his sword ready and watching first one side, then the other, as he advanced slowly up the center of the room. Years of sleeping on the Codex of Vodar Hosper. I remember things when I need to know them. If I thought about that too much, it might make me upset. As they crossed the hall, they confronted a figure on the right-hand side of the baronial throne that caused them all to pause. It was clearly not human. It looked roughly human, though its skin had a pale blue tinge. Upon its back, large wings with brilliant white feathers sprouted. On the left-hand side of the throne stood a man, dressed in black robes with runes embroidered upon them. 
He had a silver collar around his neck. Sitting on the throne was an old warrior, still strong-looking despite his age. His grey-shot hair was cut short, though he retained the long fall common to those who had chosen to serve dark powers, and upon his cheeks the ritual scars clearly showed. He regarded the four intruders with a wary gaze, and said, "'One of you must be the magician named Pug.' Pug stepped forward and said, "'I am Pug.' "'I was warned that eventually you would be troubling me.' "'You are General Fadawa, said Pug. "'King Fadawa," said the man, with an anger that didn't mask his fear. Nakor said, "'Your claim to that title seems to be at the root of our dispute.' Fadawa's eyes drifted to Tomas, and he said, "'What is that?' Tomas said, "'I am Tomas, war-leader of Elvendar.' The being to Fadawa's left smiled. His features were cruel and evil, despite being stunningly beautiful, and twice as terrifying for that beauty. A high brow framed in golden ringlets, a straight regal nose. The mouth was full, sensual, and the eyes were a pale blue. His body looked powerful, heavily muscled, and there was an aura of danger about him even as he sat motionless. He spoke and the room rang with despair upon every word. The Valheru, he said. The creature stepped forward and said, Stand aside, your majesty. Fadawa stood up and moved behind the other man, who silently watched the exchange. Crossing to stand before Tomas, the entity was his equal in stature. The creature's voice boomed out in laughter. "'Long have I ached to face one of the dragon host,' he said. Suddenly he lashed out with his bare fist, striking Tomas' shield. Tomas flew back across the room, and the dozens of guards who had stood motionless erupted into action. Miranda reacted before either Nacor or Pug. She spun full circle, her hand held palm downward, and spoke a word of power. A diamond of energy flew from her hand, shrieking through the air to strike the wall behind one of the warriors. It ricocheted off the wall and struck another warrior in the back. Like the finest blade-slicing butter, it cut the man in half. Across the room it flew as Miranda shouted to Tomas, Stay down! Pug ignored Miranda's destructive energy blade and turned to face the monster. Pug made a single motion, both hands circling like an open-handed fighting monk's. But rather than striking a blow, he pulled both hands back before his chest and shouted a word. A single blast of energy came from both his hands, invisible but parting the air like a thousand fists. The winged creature was physically picked up and slammed back into the throne. Fadawa and the man with the silver collar both jumped away to avoid being struck by the thing's wing. Nakor ran forward as if to attack, but rather than strike with his staff, he confronted the being. What are you? he demanded. Laughing as it stood, the creature pushed Nakor aside as if he was too trivial a being to warrant violence. I am the one who was called. Who are you? Nekar repeated, sitting on the floor. Leaning over, his beautiful face mere inches from Nekar, he said, I am Zaltaeus of the Eternal Despair. Nekar shouted, Tomas, you must vanquish him! With a gesture of his finger, Zaltaeus seemed to lift Nekar up and propel him in an arc across the hall, letting the old Isolani gambler slam into the wall. Nacor slumped to the floor. Tomas lay below the flashing mystic blade that Miranda had cast, as it rebounded from wall to wall, carving through those warriors still standing. Pug held his hand palm out toward Zaltaeus, and an explosion of energy slammed into the winged being, propelling him backward into the throne one more time. The mystic weapon that Miranda had cast faded suddenly, and Tomas leaped to his feet. The dozen remaining warriors surrounded him, and he struck out with his sword. Possessed by senses beyond human, he moved to avoid every blow. His golden sword, not wielded in battle since the Rift War, struck out, and each blow took a limb or a head. Miranda ran past the struggle in the middle of the room to see how Nacor fared. The ancient gambler lay stunned. Miranda couldn't tell how serious his injuries were. Pug advanced on Zaltaeus, who sat with eyes blinking a moment, as if stunned. Then his eyes focused and he grinned. 
Pug felt only hopelessness on seeing that smile. I underestimated you, Pug of Cridy, Malamber of the Assembly. You are no Mockros the Black, but you are a power. Too bad you are not worthy of your mentor's legacy. Pug faltered a moment, suddenly unsure of his next act. That hesitation cost him as Zaltaeus flicked his hand and sent coils of black energy snaking toward Pug. They struck, and each time they hit, Pug felt pain unlike any he had known. Beyond the pain of flesh ripped by cruel fangs, each bite made him doubt his own ability. He hesitated, then fell back. Pug! shouted Miranda, seeing her husband retreating. Tomas swung his golden sword and killed the last of the warriors as Nacor started to rouse. As Pug fell back, Tomas leaped past him, and the golden sword swung down. Zaltaeus raised his arm, taking Tomas's blade on a golden bracer upon his wrist. The blade showered golden sparks, and Tomas overbalanced, leaving himself open to a blow from the winged creature. Zaltaeus leveled a backhand strike with his right fist, slamming into Tomas's face, and the warrior in white and gold staggered from the blow. In thirty years, Tomas had never faced a creature of this power. Not since facing the combined mind of the Valheru had Tomas known such doubt. Even the demon Jakan seemed a trivial test compared to this creature. Tomas fell to the floor and tasted blood on his lips. What are you? I, said Zaltaeus, I am an angel of the seventh circle. I am an agent of the gods. Nacor stood up and said, Get back! He is not what he seems. He is a creature of lies and misdirection. Nacor shook off Miranda's hand as she tried to steady him. The old man hurried over to the bloody bodies that littered the floor and said, These are dead because this thing convinced them their only hope was to do as he bid, and he treated them thusly. He will deceive and mislead and raise doubts that will strike to the root of your being. If you listen to him, he will eventually convince you to serve him. Tomas rose up, the blood from his lip dripping onto his breastplate, where it ran off without stain. I will never serve this creature, he said. First he'll make you doubt your ability. Then he will make you doubt your purpose. Then he'll make you doubt your place in the universe. Then he'll convince you where that place is. The self-proclaimed angel from hell said, You talk too much, old man. He withdrew the black coils that had struck Pug and pointed his hand at Nacor. A blinding flash of white-hot energy flared, and Nacor leaped aside as it shot across the hall. It shot out the doorway as Miranda also leaped aside. Tomas jumped to his feet, drawing back his sword, and struck down at the crown of the creature's head. Zaltaeus pulled away, so the tip of the blade struck him in the face. He reeled back, screaming in rage and pain. A red gash cut him from crown to chin. As if the muscles below his skin were pushing outward, the crack down his face widened, then split running down his throat to his chest and stomach, and he shrieked an inhuman sound. It was a keening sound, and it made Pug's teeth ache as if they were being ground together. Pug saw the red gash splitting Zaltaeus from crown to groin. Like a pea pod being cracked open, Zaltaeus' skin and wings fell away. The thing that emerged from within that shell looked like a giant praying mantis with a black chitinous exterior, and large diaphanous wings. "'That is no more its true shape than the last,' shouted Nacor from his position on the floor. "'You cannot kill it. You can only hold it. You must confine it and return it to that pit outside.' "'And that you will never do,' said the thing that was now Zaltaeus. It buzzed an angry sound, and the wings blurred as it launched itself from the dais. Tomas lashed out again with a sword and sheared through one of the wings. Zaltaeus slammed hard into the stones, and Nacor stood up, moving back as Miranda came forward, encanting a spell. Pug was also attempting a spell. Nacor hurried around the confrontation, now in the center of the room. He didn't want to get in the way. He looked over to where General Fadawa stood, his own sword at the ready, as if he sought to join in the fight on the side of his infernal servant. The other man crouched down beside the throne, and Nacor approached them, his staff ready if he needed to defend himself. Miranda and Pug's spells were completed within seconds of one another. Crimson bands materialized around the insect and clamped down hard upon it. It chittered in rage and pain. Then Pug's spell manifested, a nimbus of white light which caused Zaltaeus to go limp. 
It crashed to the stones. Quickly, shouted Nacor. Take it back to the pit and cast it in. Then seal the pit. How? asked Miranda. Anywhere you can think of. Turning to face Fadawa and his companion, Nacor said, I'll take care of these two. Tomas picked up the imprisoned creature, while Pug cast a backward glance at Nacor. Miranda said, Go, now. Nacor advanced on Fadawa, his staff before him, while the general stood poised with his sword. I don't need demons from hell to best an old fool like you, sneered the leader of the invading army. I was killing better men than you when I was a boy. No doubt, said Nacor. But you'll find that for my obvious shortcomings I'm still very difficult to kill. He glanced at the man beside Vadawa. Ask your companion there. He knows. What? asked Vadawa, glancing to his left at Kahil. That slight distraction was all Nacor needed. Lightning swift, his staff shot forward, the butt striking Vadawa's sword hand with a knuckle-crushing blow. The sword fell from fingers gone numb, and the general fell back, knocking over Kahil. Fadawa tried to pull out a belt dagger with his left hand, but Nacor smashed it with his staff, and the general cried out in pain as he now held out two useless hands. Nacor's staff shot out a third time, and the general's kneecap shattered. He fell, crying in agony, as Nacor said, For too many crimes to measure, beyond what the Emerald Queen and the demon Jakan forced you to do, you have earned death. I shall be merciful and spare you the suffering you deserve. Suddenly the staff shot forward again, striking the now helpless Fadawa in the center of his forehead. Nacor heard the man's skull crack. The self-styled king of the bitter sea's eyes rolled up into his head, and he died. Nacor moved around Fadawa's body and knelt next to the man who crouched next to the throne. He was a thin man, his cheekbones the most prominent feature of his face. Hello, my love, said Nacor. You recognize me, he whispered. Always, said Nacor. Who are you in this body? I am Kahil, captain of intelligence. The power behind the throne, eh? said Nacor. So this is where you went when the demon took your place? No, before, said Kahil. I sensed something wrong with that body when I wore the emerald crown. My powers were being subverted. In any event, Kahil had been with Vadawa before and was trusted. He was clever, but he was greedy. It took little for me to take over this body. For a while, the emerald queen was nearly mindless, but no one seemed to notice. Then that damned demon showed up and ate it. Kahil shrugged. I was the only one who could see through the illusion and knew a demon ruled in my place. I bided my time, knowing eventually I would have a chance to rule again. There have been things working beyond your most ambitious dreams. Do you now realize what a dangerous game you played? Weakly, the man said, Yes, Nacor. Then a light came into his eyes, and he said, But I can't help myself. Nacor stood and helped Kahil to his feet. But uh, Fadawa, mad. His mind was totally gone. I thought to build a weapon, an engine of magic that would create an army of the dead. There were so many of them lying around. And it did that, but it also brought Zaltaeus out of the pit. I did not expect that. Fadawa could control it, at least for a while, and I could not. I was, I believe the expression is, caught between a rock and a hard place. I was ready to dispose of Fatawa once the kingdom was defeated, and I held all of your bon, but with Zaltaeus around, I couldn't quite get to that point. You always failed to anticipate consequences, Jorma. Kahil, please. How do you like being a man this time? It's occasionally useful, but I miss my last body. It was by far the most beautiful. Looking at Nacor, the being who had once been Nacor's wife, the Lady Clovis, and the Emerald Queen, said, You've used that body for a very long time now? I like it, said Nacor. It was the one I was born with. I just change my name every once in a while. He pointed to the door through which his companions left. Did you see your daughter? That was Miranda, 
said Cahir. My gods! Nacor grinned. The other was her husband. Do I have grandchildren? Not yet. Nacor lost his smile. You know, you've gone so far down an evil road, I barely remember what it was you once were. A vain girl, but no worse than some. But you have spent far too much time with dark powers. You do not even know what it was you did, do you? You have no idea who really controls your destiny. I control my destiny. Oh, you vain woman. You are no more than a pitiful tool of a power far more than you can begin to imagine. He gained your soul so long ago that you can never be saved. You can only go to him for whatever torment he has in store for a failed minion. You know what I have to do? I know what you must try to do, said Cahiel, stepping back. Your vanity almost brought this world to ruination. Your lust for the external youth and beauty caused you to destroy nations. You cannot be allowed to continue. So at last you will attempt to kill me. It will take more than a tap to this head to rid this universe of me. No, I will kill you. Cahil started to encant a spell, but before he could finish it, Nacor struck him in the face with the butt of a staff. The former emerald queen, now in a man's body, staggered backward, his concentration broken and his spell incomplete. Nacor leveled his staff, and a burst of white light shone on Cahil. He froze, transfixed, and from his mouth a mournful sound emerged. It grew weaker by the second as the body faded, becoming pale, then translucent, then transparent. When it vanished from view, the sound ceased, and Cahil was absent from the room. Sadly, Nacor said, I should have done that a century ago. But then I didn't know how. He indulged himself a moment to reflect on everything, then he turned and hurried to overtake the others, until Zaltaeus was returned to the pit, and it sealed after him. The struggle was not over. Miranda waved her hand, and a brilliant shower of sparks exploded from her palm and sprayed a dozen soldiers hanging back near the gates to the city. As they began to be stung, they turned and ran. Not very dangerous, she said, but dramatic. She looked back to see Tomas struggling with all his considerable strength to hold Zaltaeus on his shoulder, while Pug could do almost nothing but hang back. As they cleared the city gates, the building which covered the pit in view, Zaltaeus overbalanced Tomas and flipped over his shoulder, landing hard upon the ground. The creature thrashed around, and Miranda said, My spell is failing. Suddenly the crimson bands shattered, flung in all directions, the pieces fading from sight. The insect-like creature bounded upright and lashed out with a razor-shot forearm. Tomas took the blow on his sword, and the sound of the clash was steel upon steel. The bright orange light bathed Zaltaeus as it pulled back to strike again. It's casting a spell! Miranda shouted. Pug incanted a word of power, which should have given him the ability to sense the monster's magic. Instead, he felt a blinding stab of pain in his head, and he fell to his knees. Pug's hands went to his head, and tears ran down his face as he struggled to make himself breathe. The images and sensations that flooded his mind were so alien as to cause nothing but pain. The spell he had utilized was designed to sense out the nature of the spell being used, and to counteract it, if possible. But even the emanations of the dread lord that appeared under Sethanon and of the demon kings, Jakan and Ma'arg, were comparatively familiar compared to what he was experiencing now. Pug fell to his knees, his eyes squeezed shut, and his fists at his temples. Miranda took a more direct approach and simply tried to burn the creature, sending forth her most powerful spell of flames, a white-hot burst of energy that burned bright enough to blind anyone who looked at the flame. Zaltaeus writhed in the center of the flame, his own magic forgotten, a creature trapped in the heart of a star. Tomas circled the burning creature, and went to where Pug knelt, helping his friend to his feet. Suddenly the fire vanished as Nacor came hurrying up to them. Quick, carry it to the pit! The monster was swollen and cooking in its own juices. The carapace cracked in several places. Tomas grabbed one of the forearms and tried dragging it. He made slow progress, but Zaltaeus was hauled through the large doors of the building and toward the pit. Then, with a loud crack, 
The chitinous outer shell broke, and inside the body they could see something writhing. The shell parted, and something akin to a giant white worm began to wiggle out. Miranda said, I don't have the strength to burn it again. Nacor said, You don't need to burn it. Get it into the pit. Tomas charged the creature as it was halfway out of the smoking insect shell. He bashed it as hard as he could with his shield, and Zaltaeus was knocked backward, dragging the insect carcass with him, its lower section still embedded in the shell. The thing shrieked, a sound which cut through the skull like a knife, causing Tomas to falter, but he overcame the sound and smashed the creature again, knocking it back once more, now only a dozen feet from the yawning opening of the pit. Zaltaeus frantically snapped his tail, trying to rid himself of the insect corpse. Tomas kicked the thorax section, and it spun the creature around, the insect body sliding toward the pit. Pug wiped his hand across his eyes, his ringing head now clearing, and he uttered a simple spell that threw a punch of air, but one which could crush a man's ribs. The creature was knocked backward and suddenly was overbalancing. As they watched, arms began to extrude from the worm's upper segment, frantically waving, Nacor said, Enough of this! He ran forward, his staff cocked over his shoulder, and he struck the thing across the upper body as hard as he could. With a scream that threatened to shatter their ears, Salteus fell into the pit. Miranda was knocked to her knees, as was Pug again. Tomas had to use all his willpower to remain upright, and Nacor gripped his staff as if it was the only thing keeping him alive. Then the sound was gone. Nacor said, we must seal this pit. Oh, asked Pug. I've never seen anything like this. Yes, you have, said Nacor. You're just not recognizing it. Pug took a deep breath and used what little energy he had left to assess the pit. It's a rift, he said at last. Yes, said Nacor, but not the sort you know. How did you know? asked Miranda. I'll explain it all later, said Nacor, but you must close it. A faint breeze stirred, and Miranda said, Did you feel that? Yes, said Tomas, and I don't usually feel the wind inside a building. There's something trying to come through, shouted Nacor. Pug said, I need help. What do we do? asked Miranda. Give me whatever strength you can, shouted Pug. He closed his eyes and let his mind enter the rift. He sensed the energies and was again assaulted by an overwhelming sense of alien wrongness. Yet there was a pattern, and as alien as it was, once he apprehended it, he was able to study it, and with study, the structure began to emerge. I have it, he said at last. He let his mind call up the knowledge he had gained as a great one on Kelowan, as he had studied rifts and their nature. The nature of the rift was that Pug could either use more power to close it than it took to open it, or he could subvert the power used to keep it open. He chose the latter course, as his energy was too depleted to attempt the former. Besides, he felt that even at his best, that choice might prove beyond his powers. He sent a cord of energy that snaked out and engaged the source of the rift. Suddenly, a presence appeared on the other side of the rift. It was massive and powerful beyond anything he had thought possible, and it was nothing but a distillation of hatred and evil, so pure it defied human understanding. A part of Pug's mind recoiled and wanted nothing more than to fall to the floor and whimper, as Fadawa had done. But Pug's mental discipline came to the fore, and he held his ground against this horror of the mind. Whatever it was, it quested. It knew Pug was somewhere close by, but not quite where. Pug felt a sense of urgency rise up inside as he sought to unweave the matrix of power that held open the rift, for he knew that should this being find him, he would be lost forever. A faint surge of power came to Pug, and he knew that Miranda had succeeded in joining her power to his. He felt a sense of reassurance from her when she touched him, and the part of his mind able to perceive her sent forth its thanks. The questing consciousness on the other side of the rift was becoming more aware of Pug as each second passed. Pug had his own spell ready. He opened his eyes, and for a moment it was as if he was seeing two images at once. Before him stood Tomas, sword at the ready, with Miranda and Nacor beside him. 
Overlaying that image was one of a torn section of space and time, through which a great terror was peering in his direction. More than anything else, Pug was struck by the image of a vast eye peering through a keyhole. Pug yanked back his own line of power, disrupting the supporting matrix of energy. He sensed a terrible rage from the other side of the rift. Get out, he shouted, and as he turned to run, he realized he could barely move. Tomas threw his shield over his back and put his left arm around Pug, nearly picking him up. They ran from the building as Rihanna landed. I called her, said Tomas. The ground began to shake as they climbed aboard the dragon. As she launched herself into the sky, a terrible crack of thunder came from within the building. The dragon beat her wings and gained altitude, and Pug turned to watch the scene below. A great wind was being drawn to the building, and the building began to shudder and shake. A crack of timber heralded the roof shattering, collapsing into the building. Miranda said, Everything's being sucked into the rift. Pug said, I hope not everything. Nacor said, It will balance out, but there will be a very big hole in the ground to fill when it's done. A thunderous rumble sounded, and as Nacor predicted, a huge hole in the ground appeared and the rest of the building fell into it. A giant cloud of dust shot heavenward, and more ground fell into the hole. Then the rumbling stopped. It is over, asked Miranda. Pug closed his eyes and rested his head upon Tomas's back. It will never be over, he said. A ragged boy ducked under the outstretched arms of a guard who shouted, Hey! I gotta talk to the sheriff! he shouted as he dodged by. Dash turned to see the youngster scampering up the stairs. He stood on the rampart over the city gates, watching the Kessians deploy in the pre-dawn darkness. What do you want? he demanded. Trina says to tell you the South Palace Gate, now! Instantly, Dash knew he had overlooked other agents inside the palace. The South Palace Gate was the entrance used by tradesmen making deliveries directly to the palace. It opened on the large marshalling yard used to train Callus's Crimson Eagles. It also provided direct access to the one portion of the palace that was unprotected by walls and gates. Should the Kessians get through that entrance to the city, they would not only be in the city, they would also be in the palace and most of the city's defenders would be in the wrong place. Dash shouted to Gustav, South Palace Gate! Gustav had a flying company, a company ready to run to any point in the line and reinforce, and they were off as soon as Dash shouted the location. Turning to an officer nearby, Dash said, Keep things here under control. Until their agents report the gate open, they'll go through the charade of asking for surrender one more time. Dash hurried down the stairs and chased after Gustav and his men. He ran through the streets until he could hear the sound of fighting. Where is the palace guard? he demanded. Gustav said, They were ordered up to support the main gate. Who gave that order? asked Dash. I thought you did, replied the constable. When we find who gave that order, we'll have found our poisoner. Dash and his constables raced through the street to the northmost entrance to the palace and found the gate unattended. He motioned for the men to run to the left around the stables and into the marshalling yard from the north. At the far end of the marshalling yard, he saw a brawl taking place in front of the south gate. He had ridden wagons through that gate when working for Rue Avery, what seemed like years before, in a different life, but never before had the marshalling yard seemed so vast. As he reached a point halfway across the open stretch of ground, he saw the struggle was nearly decided. Old men, boys, and a few men of fighting age stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with armed mercenaries, trained killers who were dispatching them with cold-blooded efficiency. Standing before the huge bar that kept the gate closed was Trina, a sword in one hand and a dagger in another. A bleeding man at her feet told Dash that he had already paid the price of trying to get by that determined woman. The mercenaries at the gate were quickly disposing of the thieves, and Dash tried to will himself to be faster. He was twenty yards away when he saw a burly man with a beard strike down a young thief, barely more than a boy, then turned to join his companion facing Trina. The first man before her struck an overhand blow, which she blocked high, leaving her guard open. The burly man stepped under and drove the point of his sword into her stomach. No! Dash cried as he ran right into the two men without slackening speed. He carried both of them away and down in a heap. He struck out with a sword, killing the bigger man as he lay on the ground, then rolled over to come to his feet facing the first man who had struck at Trina. The man made a combination attack, feigning a head blow, then turning his wrist to slash at Dash's side. 
Dash nimbly stepped back, then forward, while the man's sword point was moving past him, and before he could reverse his blade's direction, Dash killed the man with a stabbing blow to the throat. The constables overwhelmed the attackers at the gate as the thieves began to carry away their wounded. The Cassian agents fought to the last, but eventually they were all killed or disarmed. Dash looked around, and when he saw everything was under control, he ran over to where Trina lay. The gate was still closed. He knelt and cradled her in his arms and saw her skin was pallid and clammy. Blood flowed copiously from her stomach, and Dash knew her life was draining away. He shouted, Get a healer! A constable ran off while Dash cradled Trina in his arms. He tried to staunch the flow of blood by pressing on the wound, but the pain was almost unbearable to Trina. She looked up at him and weakly said, I love you, Sheriff Puppy. His tears fell unhindered. You crazy good-for-nothing, he said. I told you to stay alive. He gathered her to him, and she moaned, then whispered, You promised. Dash was still holding the dead woman when the priest reached the gate. Gustav put his hands on Dash's shoulders, moved him back, and said, We have work to do, Sheriff. Dash looked upward and saw the sky was brightening. He knew circumstances demanded he put aside his personal grief and the numbing sense of loss he felt. Soon the Cassian herald would approach the gate and make his final demand for surrender. But when the Cassian army saw the southern gate wasn't open, they would know their only option was to attack. And they would come. 27. Intervention The horses panted. Riders urged them on and prayed their mounts would hold out for one more day. Jimmy had put them on a punishing regimen from dawn to dusk with the shortest breaks possible. The horses were all exhibiting the results of the forced march, ribs beginning to show where not so many days before they had been sleek and comfortably fat. Six horses had come up lame, and those riders had been forced to drop out, walking their animals back to Port Vicor or following after, hoping there would be a kingdom army awaiting when they at last got there. Two animals had been so badly injured they had been put down. The troop was within minutes of being in sight of Crondor, and Jimmy prayed again that he was wrong in his surmise, and they would find the city peacefully going about its business. He would gladly accept the years of jests and taunts he would endure as a result, should that be the case. But he knew in the pit of his stomach he was about to run headlong into a fight. Jimmy crested a rise and saw a baggage train before him. Most of the baggage handlers were boys, but a few guards stood ready to defend the Cassian supplies. Jimmy shouted, Don't kill the boys! and then pulled a sword. The baggage boy scattered, but the Cassian dog soldiers guarding the baggage train stood firm, and the battle was on. Dash raced along the walls as the Cassians began their assault. The Cassian herald had been polite in his contempt, a quality Dash would have found more admirable had he not been in a nearly murderous rage over Trina's death. It had taken all the self-control he could manage to not grab a bow and take the herald out of his saddle when he came for the third time, demanding the surrender of the city. Patrick was back in his castle, under guard against another attack by agents of Kesh. Dash put aside the sinking feeling in his stomach that if they should somehow survive the assault on the city, it would be a search of tedious proportions to uncover all the agents of Kesh. Trumpets sounded and the war horns blew, and the Keshian infantry marched forward. In files of ten men they carried ladders. Dash could hardly believe they'd assault first with scaling ladders, without heavy machines or a turtle to protect the men. Then a hundred bowmen rode into view, and Dash called out, Get ready to duck! A horn sounded, and the men with the ladders broke into a run, while the horse archers spurred their mounts forward between them. The horsemen unleashed a barrage of arrows, and Dash hoped all his men had heard the warning to duck. A clattering of arrows against stones and shields, and the absence of more than a few oaths and screams, told him most had understood. Then his own bowmen rose up and delivered a withering fire down on those below the wall. Dash crouched down behind a merlin and said, Pass the word. Target those with the ladders. Worry about the archers later. The soldiers on both sides passed the word, and Crondorian archers jumped up and fired at the ladder-bearers. They ducked as another round of arrows flew at the walls. Dash Duck walked to the rear of the rampart and called down to one of his constables. Keep the patrols active. They may still be trying to get in through the sewers. The constable ran off, and Dash returned to his place on the wall. A palace guardsman ran over and said, we found a spy, sir. Who was it? Another clerk, man name of Amos, 
He just walked into the squad room and told us you'd ordered every man to the gate. Where is he? Dead, said the guardsman. He was one of those trying to seize the South Palace gate, and he died during the fighting. Dash nodded, making a mental note to make sure no palace servant or functionary stayed in place without a thorough investigation. The period when the prince had resided in Darkmoor and Dash had overseen the transition from Duco's rule to Patrick's return had been too lax. Malar and other agents had easily insinuated themselves into the palace. Which also meant Cash had plans for this offensive long before the truce at Darkmoor last year. Dash kept his rage bottled up, his frustration and anger at Trina's death and the assault on the city. He vowed that should Keshians come over the wall, he would personally kill more of the enemy than any man defending the city. And should the city endure, he would see that his promise to Trina was not made in vain. They landed in a clearing a few miles from the city. Pug staggered as he got off the dragon's back and sat down on the grass. Miranda sat next to her husband and said, Are you all right? Pug said, My mind is still swimming. Thomas said, Where to next? Many places, said Nacor, and not all of us together. To Thomas he said, Why don't you have your friend fly you home to your wife? There is still much work to be done, but you can return home knowing you've saved Elvendar and his inhabitants from problems for the near future. I would like to hear a few things first, said Tomas. Yes, said Miranda. What was that creature? I have no knowledge of anything like him, said Tomas, and the memories I inherited from Ashen Shugar are extensive. That's because no Valhero ever encountered anything like Zaltaeus, said Nacor, sitting on the grass next to Pug, mostly because he was not a creature. Not a creature? asked Miranda. Could you attempt to just explain without the usual convolution? Acor smiled. Right now you remind me of your mother, the good parts. There were good parts, said Miranda, with thinly veiled contempt. In the most wistful tone anyone had ever heard from him, Acor said, Yes, there were, once, a very long time ago. What about Zaltaeus? asked Pug. Fadawa was lured to practicing dark magic by his adviser, Kahil, Nacor said. I think Kahil has been behind everything that went on in Novendus from the start. He was a dupe, a tool of the Pantathians, who somehow managed a degree of freedom, and he used that to create a position for himself, one where he could manipulate others. He hesitated, then continued. The same way Jorma became Lady Clovis and controlled the Overlord and Dahokon years ago. Kahil was at Fadawa's side from the start. He avoided destruction and continued to advise, and, well, I suspect he convinced Fadawa to turn to the very powers that destroyed the Emerald Queen and the Demon King. He served that power we do not speak of, and like most of the Nameless One's minions, he did not even know who he served. He was just driven. Zaltaeus, prodded Miranda, what did you mean when you said he wasn't a creature? He was not of this reality, more so than the demons or even the dread. He was a thing from the seventh circle of hell. But what was he? asked Pug. He was a thought, probably a dream. A thought? asked Tomas. Pug said, And when I looked into the rift, you saw the mind of a god. I don't understand, said Pug. Nacor patted him on the shoulder. You will in a few hundred years. For now consider that a god slept, and as he slept he dreamed. And in that dream he fancied some tiny creature spoke his name, and in doing so became his tool. In that dream, that tool created havoc and called to him, and he sent his angel of despair to answer the call. And the angel served the tool. Why couldn't Zaltaeus be killed? asked Miranda. Nacor smiled. You can't kill a dream, Miranda. 
even an evil dream. You can only send it back to where it came from. Tomas touched his lip. That dream seemed concrete enough to me. Oh, said Nacor, a god's dream is reality. Pug said, We should go. Where? asked Miranda. Back to the island? No, said Nacor. We should tell the prince the leadership of the enemy is dead. Crondor, then, said Pug. One thing, though, said Miranda. What? asked Nacor. You mentioned some time ago that the demon Jakan replaced Mother at the head of that army, but you never said anything about what happened to her. Nacor said, Your mother is dead. Are you certain? asked Miranda. Nacor nodded. Very certain. Pug stood up, still feeling shaky. Tomar said, Ryana will bear me back to Elvendor. Pug embraced his old friend and said, Again we say goodbye. And we'll meet again, answered Tomas. Fare you well, old friend, said Pug. And you three as well, said Tomas. He climbed aboard the dragon's back as she leaped into the sky. Two beats of her wings, and she banked off to the west and started on the journey back to Elvendar. Pug said, Are you up to getting us all to Crondor? Miranda said, I can manage. She took them both by the hands and closed her eyes, and reality swam around them. They appeared in the great hall of the prince's palace in Crondor as the war horns sounded the call for the reserve to come to the main gate. Gustav said, If you can't slip inside the gate and unlock it, kick it down, finished Dash. They heard the rumble as the ram was rolled down the road toward the main gate. The road into the city from the east was a long incline from a series of rolling hills, and the ram was a huge one, fashioned from five trees lashed together by heavy ropes. Horsemen rode on either side with guide ropes, and as they reached the last stretch of road before the gate, they released the ropes and veered off. The ram picked up speed, and the rumbling grew louder as the ram closed to within fifty yards of the gate. As it bore down, Dash reflexively gripped the stones of the wall as he anticipated the impact. Then someone shoved between Gustav and Dash and stuck his hand over the wall. A sheet of light extended from the man's hand, and Dash turned to see his great-grandfather standing next to him. Enough! Pug shouted, his anger clearly evident on his face as the ram exploded into a thousand flaming splinters. Whatever the Keshians expected, this display of magic wasn't it. Their attack, timed to coincide with a ram smashing the gate, faltered as men on horseback were suddenly greeted by the sight of a very high wall surmounted by archers, instead of an open gate for them to charge through. They pulled up and milled around in confusion, as the defenders on the wall unleashed a barrage of arrows. Pug shouted, No! and with a wave of his hands sent out a curtain of heat that turned the arrows into flaming cinders that fell far short of their mark. Turning to Dash, he said, I don't see any other officers. Are you in charge here? Dash said, For the moment. Then order your men to stop shooting. Dash did so, and the Keshians retreated to their lines unharmed. Pug said, Send a herald to the Keshian commander. Tell him I want to meet with the commander of that army in the prince's palace in one hour's time. In the palace? asked Dash. Yes, when he gets here, open the gate and let him in. What if he won't come? Pug turned his back, motioned to Nacor and Miranda on the rear of the gatehouse, and said, He'll come, or I'll destroy his army. But what do I tell him? asked Dash. Tell him the war is over. A pale and weak-looking Patrick stood before his throne, as General Asham ibn al-Tuk marched into the throne room, flanked by a guard and a servant. He bowed perfunctorily. I am here, Highness. Patrick said, I did not call this meeting. Pug stepped forward and said, I did. And you are? asked the general. I am called Pug. The general raised an eyebrow in recognition. The magician at Stardock. The same. Why have you summoned me? to tell you to take your army and go home. The general said, If you think that display outside the gate will turn my attention... A guard ran in and said, Highness, fighting has erupted. 
The general said, I am under a flag of truce. Patrick asked the guard, Where is the fighting? Outside the wall. It appears as if cavalry from both the north and south has attacked the Cassians. Patrick said, General, those are units not presently under my command. They are obviously riding to relieve Crondor and do not know of the truce. You are free to rejoin your men. The general bowed and turned to leave, but Pug said, No. What? asked both the prince and the general simultaneously. Pug said, This will end now. He vanished from sight. Macor, who had been standing in the corner near Miranda, said, For a tired man, he manages to get around, doesn't he? Yes, he does, Miranda agreed with a faint smile. Pug appeared over the heart of the battlefield and saw that baggage wagons were afire at the rear of the Keshian position and that a company of horse was attacking along the coast road from the north, catching the Keshians between two attacking columns. Pug hovered a hundred feet above the battle and clapped his hands together, and a peal of thunder struck those below, knocking some of the riders directly underneath them out of their saddles. Men looked up and saw a man floating in the air, and from that man a brilliant light erupted, a golden glow that was as bright as the sun. His voice carried to every man as if he were standing next to them. This ends now. With a wave of his hand he sent a force through the air, a ripple which visibly distorted the air. The wave hit horses and knocked them down, throwing more men to the ground. Men turned and ran. Jimmy sat firm on a bucking, frantic horse, trying to bring the animal under control. After two more kicks, the animal set out at a run, and Jimmy let it, turning it and then bringing it to a halt. He turned the animal around and saw more animals running in every direction as Keshians raced back toward their burning wagons. Then he glanced up to where Pug hung in the air. And again came Pug's voice. This ends now. Then Pug vanished. Nacor said, Well, at least you got them to stop fighting for a while. The three of them sat in an abandoned room in the palace, after the prince had retired, and the Keshian general returned to his army. I will get them to stop for good, said Pug. Or what? asked Miranda. Pug said, I'm sick of killing. I'm sick of destruction. But more than anything, I'm sick of the mindless stupidity I see on every side of me. Pug thought of the losses to war he had endured, from his childhood friend Roland and Lord Borick to Owen Greylock, a man he had not known well, but one whom he had found himself liking from their winter together at Darkmoor. Too many good men, and too many innocents. It can't go on. If I have to, I don't know, put up a wall between both armies, I'll do it. Nacor said, You'll think of something. When the prince and the general have time to calm down, you can tell them what you want. When are you meeting again? asked Miranda. Tomorrow at noon. Good, said Nacor. That gives me time to see if what I think has happened has happened. You're being cryptic again, said Miranda. Nacor smiled. Come along and see. We'll get something to eat. He led them out of the room, then out of the palace, past guards who stood an uneasy watch, knowing they might have to return to the walls and a terrible fight at a moment's notice. As they left the palace, they saw horsemen riding into the marshalling yard through the southern gate. At their head, Pug saw his other great-grandson and waved. Jimmy rode over and said, I saw that display, Pug. He grinned, and Pug's heart squeezed slightly, when for a second he saw Gamina's smile echoed in it. You saved a lot of my men's lives. Thank you. Pug said, I'm pleased you were among those who benefited. Is Dash? He's inside alive, and until Patrick regains his strength in command of the city. Jimmy laughed. Somehow I don't think he enjoys that very much. Go see him, said Pug. We're going to Nacor's temple, and we'll be back in the morning. We have a general meeting at noon to end this nonsense. Jimmy said, I will be more than pleased to see that. Duco's a marvel, and he's managed to keep the South under control despite this Keshian adventure. But we're sorely tested along both borders, and I haven't any idea how things go in the North. That war is finished, too. Jimmy said, I am relieved to hear that, great-grandfather. I will see you in the morning. Nacor said, Let's go. I want to see what's happened. They hurried through a city cautiously returning to normal activities as people ventured out of their houses. 
With so few people about, they reached the temple quarter of the city quickly. No one was visible outside the tent, but once they stepped through, they saw a crowd sitting on the floor. In the center of the room, the woman Alita sat on the floor, rather than floating in the air, and the light about her was gone. So was the ill-aspected darkness which had hovered in the air beneath her. Dominic hurried over and said, Nacor, I am glad to see you. When did this happen? asked Nacor. A few hours ago. One moment she was floating in the air, and the next the blackness below her vanished, as if it had been sucked down through a hole, and she gently floated back to the ground, opened her eyes, and began speaking. Pug and the others turned their attention to what the woman was saying, and instantly Nacor said, Her voice, it's different. Pug had no knowledge of what the young woman had sounded like before, but he knew it could be nothing like what he heard now, for her voice was magical. It was soft, and yet easy to hear if one but took a moment to listen, a musical voice. What's she saying? asked Miranda. She's been talking about the nature of good since she awoke, said Dominic. He looked at Nacor. When you first began this temple, and when you told us what you would do, I was skeptical, but knew we had to try. But what we see before us now is absolute proof the power of his shop needed to be shared with the Order of Arch Indar, for there, before us, sits a living avatar of the goddess. Nacor laughed. Nothing so grand as that. Come. He led them through the seated crowd and came to stand before the young woman. She ignored him and continued talking. Nacor knelt and looked into her eyes. Is she repeating herself? he asked. Dominic said, Why, yes, I believe so. Has anyone written down what she said? Sho P was sitting to one side and said, I have heard two acolytes recording her words, Master Nacor. This is the beginning of her third iteration of the same lesson she taught. Good, because I'll bet she's getting hungry and tired. He put his hand on her shoulder, and she faltered in her speech. She blinked, and her eyes seemed to change focus, and she looked at Nacor and said, What? Her voice was different. What one might expect of a mortal woman of her age, without the magic that had made it soothing and wonderful a moment earlier. You've been asleep, said Nacor. Why don't you get something to eat? We'll talk later. The girl got up and said, Oh, I'm stiff. I must have been sitting like that a while. Nacor said, A couple of weeks, actually. Weeks? Alita said, You can't be serious. I'll explain everything to you later. Now go get some food and then a long nap. After she left, Dominic said, If she's not an avatar, what is she? Nacor grinned. She is a dream. He looked at Pug and Miranda and said, A wonderful dream. Miranda said, But Nacor, she's still here. Zaltaeus is gone. Nacor nodded. He was a thing of the mind from that other world, projected into this. Alita is a normal woman, but something reached across worlds to touch her and used her to hold back that blackness. What was that blackness? asked Dominic. A very bad dream. I'll explain over dinner. Let's find something to eat. Dominic said, Very well. We have food in the kitchen. As they were walking, Nacor said, By the way, we have to change a few things around here. What? asked Dominic. To begin with, you must notify the Ashapians you are no longer a member of their order. What? Nacor put his arm around Dominic's shoulder and said, You look very young, but I know you're an old man like me, Dominic. Pug told me the story of the time you and he went to the Tsarani homeworld. I know you've seen lots of things. Shopi over there is a perfect choice to teach the young monks how to be monks. But you are the one who must teach Alita. Teach her what? asked Dominic. How to be high priestess of the Order of Arch Indar, of course. High priestess? That girl? That girl? repeated Nacor. She was an avatar of the goddess a moment ago, wasn't she? 
Miranda laughed, and Pug put his arm around her shoulders. It was the first time in a long while he had felt like laughing. Herrick said, We can only assume Subai got through to the magician. By all reports, they simply stopped fighting everywhere about the time all the corpses fell over. Earl Richard said, Thank the gods for that. I wish we still had cavalry, Eric said reflectively. I have a hunch we could get men up to Illith without much trouble. Well, order up a unit on foot and see how far they get. Eric smiled. I already have. And I'm sending Aki and his Hadati to the hills toward Yavon. Richard said, Do you think we'll ever know what happened, truly? Eric shook his head. Probably not. I've been in battles where I still don't know what happened. We'll probably read more reports on this fight than we want to, and I'll write a few of them myself, but truth to tell, I have no idea what really occurred. One minute we were struggling to beat back an army of dead men and crazed killers, and the next the dead men all fell over, and the killers were walking around slack-jawed and apparently without minds. I've never heard of a fight going from hopeless to easy in a second before. The very tired young captain said, But to tell you the truth, I don't really care now that the fighting stopped. You're a remarkable young man, Eric von Dockmoor. I'll mention that in my report to the king. Thanks, but there are a lot of men out there deserving of praise more than I. He sighed and looked out the tent door. And many of them won't be going home. What should we do now? asked Earl Richard. Without cavalry, I'm inclined to sit tight until we get word of the situation down in Crondor. But my instinct tells me we need to advance northward as fast as we can. Fadawa may have fled or been killed, but that doesn't mean some other petty captain won't try to grab power and fashion a modest little kingdom for himself. And as far as we know, Yabon City is still under siege. Earl Richard said, I'm tired of sitting around myself. Give the order to advance. Eric smiled and stood up. My lord, he said with a bow. He went outside and found Jado Shati near the Crimson Eagle's campsite. Break camp, he ordered, and ready to march. You heard the man, said the former sergeant. I want every man ready to march in an hour. Jado turned and grinned at his old companion, and Eric found once more he couldn't resist that man's smile. He grinned in return. Patrick showed every sign of being on the way to a full recovery. His color had returned to normal, and he sat firmly upon his throne. The Keshian general Asham ibn al-Tuk again stood before the throne, looking even less pleased than the last time he had appeared. Now he faced a kingdom army reinforced by cavalry units from Port Vicor and from the north. Pug walked in. Patrick said, You demanded we be here at noon, Pug. What have you to say to us? Pug looked at Patrick, then at the general, and said, This war is over. General, you will refresh your soldiers outside one more day. Then at first light tomorrow you will return to the south. You will return beyond the original borders south of Land's End. You will carry orders to all Cassian units to cease their attacks on Land's End, and you will relay the following message to your emperor. Should Kesh come north again, uninvited, no man crossing the border under arms will survive. The general stood ashen-faced and shaking with rage, but he nodded. Patrick beamed. His smile was one of victory. There, Turlinga, Keshian, and my magician will destroy your army where it stands. Pug turned. Your magician? Pug advanced upon the young prince and walked up the stairs to stand before him. I am not your magician, Patrick. I loved your grandfather and counted him among the greatest men I've known. And I treasured the love of your great-grandfather, Boric, who gave me the name Condoin. But you don't own my soul. There are forces loose in the universe so far beyond your petty dreams of power and wealth. They are a flood to a drip of water. It is those forces who command my attention. I just refuse to sit idly by any longer and see innocent women and children slaughtered and brave men die because rulers are too foolish to see they have abundance. Turning to the general, Pug said, You may also tell your emperor that should any kingdom soldier move south uninvited, every man under arms who crosses the border will be destroyed. What? 
said Patrick, standing. You dare threaten the kingdom? I make no threats, said Pug. I am telling you that you will not be permitted any retribution against Kesh. You will both return to your respective sides of the border and act like civilized neighbors. You are a duke of the kingdom, a member of the royal family by adoption, and a sworn vassal to the crown. If I tell you to destroy that army outside the gate, you will do so. Pug's anger rose up, and he stared the taller young man in the eyes. I shall not. No power you possess can compel me to act against my will. If you want those Keshians outside the walls dead, take a sword and go out and try to kill them. Patrick's rage erupted. You traitor! Pug put his hand on Patrick's chest and shoved him back into the throne. Guards throughout the hall put hands on the hilts of swords to protect their prince. Miranda stepped forward and upraised and said, I wouldn't. Nacor stood at her side and held up his staff. The boy is all right. Pug leaned over, almost nose to nose with Patrick, and said, You who have never drawn a sword in a battle more serious than chasing some goblins around in the north, call me traitor. I have saved your kingdom, you fool. I did not save it for you any more than I saved the empire for that man's. His finger shot out, pointing at the Keshian general. Master, I did it because of the countless souls that would have been lost had I not. Looking first at Patrick, then the general, Pug said, Take word to your father and your master that Stardock is free. Any attempt to force kingdom or empire rule on that entity will bring by intervention. They have my word on that, and I shall enforce their independence. Pug turned and stepped away from the throne. I care not who sits on your father's throne, Patrick. You gather together the shards of your broken crown and rebuild your nation. I care not for your titles and rank. I am done with your kingdom. He put his arms out, and Miranda and Nacor came to stand on either side. I renounce my title as Duke of the Kingdom. I forswear my oath as subject to the crown. I have larger concerns than your vanities and national agendas. I am here to protect this world, not just one part of it. Let it be known that Pug of Crydee is no more. I am now merely the Black Sorcerer. My island is no longer a hospitable place for the uninvited. Anyone sailing within sight of it is at peril, and anyone setting foot upon it without my leave will be destroyed. Then, with a thunderous crash and a thick cloud of black smoke, he vanished with his companions. Dash said, Great-grandfather certainly twisted Patrick's smalls, didn't he? Jimmy said, I've had more pleasant afternoons. They had just retired from a council with the prince. The withdrawal of the Keshian troops was discussed as well as what exactly Patrick would report to his father. It had lasted long past dinner and into the night. They were walking toward Jimmy's quarters for a quiet moment alone before retiring for the night. Did you talk to Francie? asked Dash. Jimmy said, No, I saw her a brief second, but didn't get a chance to really speak with her. She's afraid that once she's married to Patrick, you'll just stop talking to her. She doesn't want to lose your friendship. Jimmy said, That won't happen. One thing about this war, it taught me what really is important and what just seems important. Dash said, I know. There was a note in his voice Jimmy had never heard before. What is it? Dash said, Just some people I cared about didn't get through this. Jimmy stopped. Someone special to you? Dash turned and said, I don't want to talk about it today. I'll tell you all about it some day. Just not today. Jimmy said, Very well. He was silent a minute as they continued to walk along the hallways. I think I learned something myself, and maybe it's important too. What? Francie is someone special. But I think I feel the need for something, and she is the person I elected to cast in the role of a person to fulfill that need. Grandfather and grandmother? Yes, what they had. 
I think that seeing how they felt, especially after seeing how cool mother and father always were to each other, it makes me want to have what grandmother and grandfather had. Few gain that. They reached the door to Jimmy's room and opened it. Three people were sitting inside. Come in and close that door, said Pug. Jimmy and Dash entered, and Dash closed the door. Pug said, I could not leave without speaking to you two. You are the last of my line. Trying to lift the mood, Jimmy said, Please don't put it that way. Miranda laughed. Dash said, And we do have relatives in the East. Pug laughed. There is so much of your grandfather in you, too. He looked at Dash. Upon occasion, you looked like him when he was a boy. He looked at Jimmy. And sometimes you look so much like my gamina, it haunts me. He opened his arms, and Jimmy and Dash came and hugged him in turn. I shall not return to the kingdom, unless it is for a reason far more important than the whims of kings, said Pug. But you two are my blood, and you and your children will always be welcome on my island. Dash said, You have influence with the king. Do you have to make this sort of break? Pug said, I knew King Liam as a boy in Crydee. I knew Arutha better, but both knew my heart. The king knew me from his father. Nacor said, Boric knows me well, and my words might carry some weight, but what Pug is being diplomatic in avoiding is that sort of an unexpected disaster. Patrick will some day be king. We are avoiding an argument of momentous proportion later by having it now, said Pug. The kingdom is in shambles. Patrick is forced by circumstances to yield to my demands. If this confrontation occurred years from now, how many innocents would die as I enforced my will? And what would that make him? said Miranda. Only a different tyrant than those men of whom we just disposed. Dash said, You cut yourself off from so much. Pug said, I have seen worlds and traveled through time, my boy. I have so much more to see. This kingdom of the Isles is but one of many places that are now dear to me. Nacor said, And if need be, we'll be back. Dash said, Well, we have a lot of work to do, and if you want my opinion, you're doing the right thing. Pug smiled. Thank you for that. Jimmy said, I can't say I agree with Dash. But I know that it is your choice, and I wish you well. He smiled at Miranda. Shall I call you great-grandmother? Not if you value your life, said Miranda with a smile. Dash said, I shall think of you a lot. Jimmy said, As shall I. Pug stood. Be well, he said, holding out his hands to Nacor and Miranda. And they vanished. Dash sat down on Jimmy's bed, leaning back against his down pillow. I think I'm going to sleep for a week. Then make it next week, Sheriff, said Jimmy. We have a lot of work to do in the morning and one a hell of a mess to unravel. He glanced over and saw his brother was already asleep. For a moment he considered waking him. Then he shrugged, left, and went next door to sleep in Dash's bed. Twenty-eight. Division. Gathis bound. I am pleased to see you all return and looking well, he said. Pug, Miranda, and Nacor had just materialized near the fountain that was the centerpiece of the garden of Pug's estate on Sorcerer's Island. Pug said, We are equally pleased to see you. How fair things here? Gathis smiled his toothy, goblin-like grin. Very well. If you would indulge me, there is something I think you should see before you rest. It should only take a few moments. Pug nodded, and Gathis led him out through the building and across the meadow toward the hidden cave that was the shrine to the lost god of magic. The cave stood open to view. What is this? asked Pug. You observed, I think, Master Pug said Gathis, that eventually the appropriate person would find this shrine? Miranda said, And that person has arrived? 
Not as we thought, said Gathus. Pug entered the cave with the others behind him and looked at the statue that had once resembled Makros the Black. He faltered as he saw his own features upon the statue. What? Miranda stepped around beside her husband, and she saw her features upon the statue. I see myself, Nacor said. Watch a moment. The face on the statue shifted, and they saw the features of Robert Delise. Then they saw the features of other students on the island. What does this mean? asked Miranda. It means, said Nacor, that all of you are servants of magic, and that there is no one person who shall be the god's agent on Midkemia. Rather, many people will work on behalf of returning the lost god of magic to his place in this universe. Pug studied the statue as other faces appeared, magicians known to him and those he had never met. After a few minutes, Pug saw his own face again. Pug said, Let's return to the house. As they walked toward the house, Pug said, Nacor, I didn't see your face upon the statue. Nacor grinned and shrugged. I know there is no magic, Pug laughed. It is an all-or-nothing proposition, Nacor. Either everything is magic, or nothing is magic. Nacor shrugged. I find either proposition equally probable, but aesthetically I prefer the concept that there is no magic, just power and the ability to utilize it. Miranda said, This borders on the type of long debate you two enjoy over wine, and I am very hungry. Gathis said, Food and wine wait you in your study, Master Pug. Join us, said Pug to his servant. When they returned to the house, they found a sumptuous table set for them. Miranda took a plate and began piling on fruit and cheeses. Pug took a large flagon of wine and filled goblets. Gathis, said Pug, you are the keeper of that shrine. What is your opinion on what we've seen? It is as Master Nacor has observed. No longer will one individual act as an agent on behalf of the lost god of magic. Perhaps the powers have learned the error of depending too much on one individual. It says that those who practice the arts will aid the return of magic. Nacor shrugged. It means that whatever power seeks to return, the god of magic has deduced that assigning all that responsibility to one individual is risky. Makros, for all his power, made mistakes. Pug said, I appreciate that fact having already made quite a few myself. Miranda said, Now that you are no longer a duke of the kingdom, what are your plans? I still have many thousands of Sa'awa to relocate to the Ethel Duath. Eventually I will have to return to Shila and destroy whatever demons may linger there. Then be about the business of reseeding enough life on that world so that in a few centuries the Sa'awa may return. He smiled. Then there's the matter of the students here. They need to be taught, and learned from as well. And there's the problem of finding and destroying Nalar's agents wherever they may be hiding. Other than that, I think I may take up fishing. Nacor laughed. Fishing teaches patience. That's why I never took it up. Tens of thousands died during the Rift War and more than twice that number during this latest war, this Serpent War. These catastrophic events must never be allowed to be duplicated again. How are we to ensure they don't? asked Miranda. Pug said, That I need to think on, and it's something we all need to be involved with. I think I may have some ideas I'll share with you and the others living on this island. The first thing we must be certain of is that there can be no manipulation of those who serve on our behalf. Those are the tactics of our enemy, and as one who was subjected to such manipulation by your father, my love, I find the idea of continuing that practice distasteful. This is why this island must become our bastion, and those who serve here must do so willingly, and with as much knowledge as it is safe for them to possess. What of Stardock? asked Miranda. Pug said, 
The star duck was begun with good intentions, but I made too many errors. I thought I would give the students more of a voice in the organization of the academy, and to be frank, I was a product of the Tsarani Assembly. It's been enough years since then that I think I recognize those errors. Starduck will continue and be an asset to us. Before I built the community there, magicians were often persecuted by those fearful of their talents. Witches were hunted down and their pitiful woodland huts burned to the ground. Or wizards were walled up in caves to die of starvation and thirst, unless they became powerful enough to keep people away through fear or they had patrons who were noble or rich. At least now those have a haven if they care to make their way to Stardock. And we may find recruits to our cause among those who study at Stardock for a time and leave, seeking something else. How do we ensure we don't make the same mistakes? asked Miranda. There are many things we will do differently. I will be the final authority here. I may seek your wisdom and that of others, but in critical matters I will decide. I erred in thinking that was ignoble and arbitrary at Stardock, and now I know it is the opposite. Without a vision, we become a debating society and a place where habit quickly becomes tradition. Tradition often becomes an excuse for repression, bigotry, or reactionary thinking. My blue riders will keep them from being too tradition-bound. My friend, said Pug, your blue riders will become another tradition, and those who survive the fight of those traditionalists who are now calling themselves the Hand of Korsh and the Wand of Watum will become just as fixed in their ways. Even Korsh and Watum would be appalled to see what their followers have created. Maybe I should go back there, offered Nacor, half in jest. Maybe not replied Pug. Stardock will endure, and there will be times we will be grateful it does. Looking around the room, Pug said, We here are embarking on a long fight. There are powers moving through the universe, vast, terrible powers, that we have only glimpsed. The two great wars we have so far endured are but the opening moves in a game of chess. Miranda said, what are the gods on our side doing about all this? Nacor said, They are helping you. How? asked Miranda. In ways obvious and subtle, said Nacor. Pug said, During the Chaos Wars, the very nature of things changed, and since then the gods have acted through agents and minions. We are who we are because the gods have chosen us to be their agents. Even gods need to learn said Nacor. Your father's relationship with Sarig was not particularly effective from the god's point of view, so rather than repeat that mistake, he's elected to try a different tactic. Miranda said, There seems a great degree of futility in what we attempt. Perhaps, offered Nacor, but we have seen wonderful things. The creation of the Temple of Archindar is no mean feat. It will be a tiny, inconsequential sect for centuries, and most who encounter it will not think it equal in importance to the long-established worship of Astalon, Dala, Sung, and the other lesser gods. But the fact that enough purity of the goddess exists in the universe to serve us in balking Nalar's attempts to again create havoc on our world is a miracle. There may not be another such manifestation for centuries, yet we know one may come. What of you? asked Pug. What are your plans? My work here is done for a while, said Nacor. Where will you go? asked Miranda. Here and there. I will seek out Nalar's minions and send you word should I encounter them. And every so often I will encounter likely candidates for your community and send them to you. And from time to time I will return to eat your food and drink your wine and see what's new and interesting here. You will always be welcome, Nacor. Miranda said, Who do you serve, Nacor? Nacor grinned. Myself. All of us. Everything. He shrugged. I don't know. Perhaps some day I will. But for now I am content to wander learn things, and help out where I may. 
Well, said Pug, reaching for another cup of wine, stay a while longer while I bring about the creation of my new council here, and give me the benefit of your wisdom. Nagor said, If you think it wisdom, then you do need my advice. Miranda laughed. Trumpets sounded and drums beat as the prince and his fiancée departed the throne room. After six weeks of relative peace since Pug had ended the war, the crown judged it time to make the formal announcement. Patrick had just finished informing the court that he and Francine would depart at the end of the month to return to Villanon for the royal wedding. The nobles and influential commoners in the room cheered and waited to disperse until Patrick escorted Francine out of the hall. Jimmy approached Eric von Darkmoor and said, Captain, I just wanted to tell you how impressed I am by what I read of your actions in Yavon. Eric shrugged. After what Pug, Nacor, and the others did, we had little serious opposition. Those forced marches, though, must have been punishing. They were, said Eric, but mostly on our feet since we had no horses. We had very little problem securing any area we entered, and... Once we freed prisoners in Illith and Zun, we had enough men to leave behind and act as jailers. By the time we reached Lamut, we were hunting bandits, nothing more. Now that General Norton has agreed to lead those who want to leave, and a few who don't, back to Navendus, and the rest are being sent down to serve with Duco, things are getting relatively quiet. Jimmy said, Still, it was an impressive three weeks. I just wish we had more ships, said Eric. This business of having to do business with the Quiggins to get the invaders back across the sea has me feeling itchy each time I see a Quiggin ship anchor off a of fish town. Blame your old friend, said Jimmy, pointing at Rue, who stood with his wife talking to a minor noble. Rue always could smell an opportunity. I just wish I knew how he got the Quiggins to make the deal. They're usually impossible to deal with, Jimmy shrugged. Probably just found something they really wanted and agreed to get it for them. That's usually how you do business. I'll leave business to Rue. Being the captain of the Crimson Eagles is enough for me. I'm surprised you didn't accept the promotion, said Jimmy. I'm happy where I am. Being captain of the Prince's Household Guard is a lot more ceremony than real soldiering. But it's one step from there to being swordmaster for a duke or the knight marshal's position here in Condor. Eric smiled. I'm happy. I like running the Crimson Eagles, and I think the kingdom needs an army independent of the other nobles. We might have had a different war had we had kingdom garrisons in Sarth, Illith, and Zun. You may be right, but the dukes will resist the idea of garrisons in their duchies they don't control. I'll think about that when I return to Krondor, said Eric. Right now I'm going to Ravensburg and to my wife. It's been months, and I wonder if she remembers what I look like. Jimmy said, You're not easy to forget, Captain. Few men come as large as you. Eric laughed and said, What of you? I am the king's servant. I'll return with Patrick to Villanon, and his majesty will tell me where I serve next. I suspect I'll be back in Crondor quickly enough. With Rudolfo dead and Brian unable to walk since the poisoning, we'll need a new duke in Crondor quickly. Duke Carl survived up in Yabon, but between those two duchies we have enough work to keep a score of nobles occupied for a century. I'll probably be given a title and too few resources for too much work. That's usually the way it works. Eric smiled and patted Jimmy on the shoulder. Well, do I know that, Jimmy. Rue and Carly joined them and were warmly greeted by both men. Eric said, When the Kessians were marching across your estate, how did you avoid being captured like the others in your area? Rue laughed. We were sleeping in an outbuilding while we were rebuilding the estate house. When the cavalry showed up, they went inside the big house, and we snuck off into the woods. I have a tiny little cave set up to lie low in. I stocked it first thing after I returned. Too many armies running around here in the west for my taste. Eric said, We're trying to solve that problem, Rue. Carly hid her smile behind her hand. Rue said, I haven't seen your brother around, Jimmy. Dash is off somewhere. With everyone heading off to the wedding, he's being left behind in charge for a while. I'm sure he's distressed at missing the wedding, said Carly. Jimmy smiled. 
Probably not as much as he is at the work to be done putting this city back together again. Rue said, I know. Someone broke into the basement at Barrett's and took every scrap of food and all the coffee. How can I open a coffee house without coffee? I guess you'll have to buy more, said Eric. He playfully squeezed his friend's shoulder. You always manage to find a way to make a deal, my friend? Rue smiled. I have to work a little harder since Jimmy's grandfather is no longer around. But then I'm getting to keep the money I make rather than pay taxes. Jimmy said, I could speak to the prince about that, if you'd like. Rue put up his hands in mock surrender. No, that's fine. I'll pick my own time to bring up the matter of the Crown's debt to the Bitter Sea Company. Let's get the West back in order before we start that long and boring wrangle. Carly said, There's your brother, Jimmy. Who's that he's talking to? Jimmy turned and saw Dash entering the room deep in conversation with another man. He's a court functionary named Tallwin. I'm still a bit vague on what he does for Patrick, but I've seen him around over the last few years. He's being named Castle Reeve, while everyone else is going to Villanon for the wedding. I'm sure he and Dash have a great deal to discuss. You can't have it both ways, Dash, said Tallwin. You're either taking care of your duty or you're not. Dash looked at the head of Royal Intelligence and said, Look, we're going to be stuck together for over a month while the wedding is going on. So why don't we agree to work together? You take care of the business of the principality and the castle itself, and I'll take care of the city. Because you're unreliable, said Tallwin. Dash's face flushed in anger. Explain yourself. Twice in the last week I know you have arranged to get minor offenders released without trial. They were hungry people, said Dash, raising his voice enough that a few lingering members of the court turned to look. Dash lowered his voice. We've got enough trouble dealing with the prisoners we have. I'm not going to throw a child who stole bread into a cell with murderers. Then he laughed. And I'm damn well not going to toss him in with those damned Jikanji cannibals we inherited from Padawa. Tallwin laughed. Very well. I'll concede there may be some sense to your decisions. But since the fighting stopped, I've noticed that a great deal of street crime is returning to Crondor, and you're far less vigilant than before. I'm tired, said Dash. Then he said, Yes, that's exactly it. He smiled. You just made me see something important. Thank you. For what? For seeing something I've been ignoring for weeks. He patted Tallwin on the arm. I'll have my resignation on your desk tomorrow. What? I don't want to be sheriff of Crondor any longer, said Dash. Find someone else to do the job for you, Tallwin. He turned and walked across the hall to where his brother stood with Eric, Rue, and Carly. After he exchanged greetings, he said, Rue, I could use employment. Jimmy said, What? I resigned as sheriff. Why? Jimmy persisted. We'll talk about that later. Answered Dash. To Rue, he said, Could you use some help? Someone of your talents? Certainly, said Rue. But the last time I employed you, it ended up costing me a great deal of money. Dash grinned. Well, then I was really working for my grandfather. This time, I'd be working for myself. Meaning? I think I would rather seek my own fortune than continue to trade on my nobility and work for the crown. I think that with the Bitter Sea Company I can find a position from which I can someday start running my own business concerns. We can certainly talk about it, said Rue. Come to Barrett's tomorrow and we'll discuss the matter. He took Carly's arm. Now, if you will excuse us, we need to be on our way home. They left and Eric promised to drop by on his way to Ravensburg. He turned to Dash and said, Are you certain about this resignation? The king might insist you stay. Not if I resign my offices, said Dash. Eric said, I'll leave you two alone to discuss this. I'm off to Ravensburg to see my wife and family. Jimmy grabbed his younger brother by the arm and steered him to a window, away from the others who lingered after court. Are you mad? Resign your hereditary offices? I may be mad, big brother, but I'm serious. I will have a resignation on Tallwin's desk in the morning for him to pass along to Patrick. Unless the king repeals the great freedom, no man can be compelled to hold office against his will. 
I don't need a title. I can do fine living by my own wits. Jimmy looked appalled. What about everything we've done? What about grandfather and father? Are there deaths for nothing? Dash grew angry. Don't throw those deaths in my face, Jimmy. They died for what they believed in, and my choosing to go another way doesn't diminish their sacrifice. I am just tired of living their vision of what I should be, who I should be. Jimmy said, Why don't you come to Villanon with me? I'll get Patrick to name another sheriff in your place. We'll go to the wedding, then we'll take ship to Roldham and visit Mother. A week or two with her, and you'll be aching to get back to your criminals. Dash laughed. No doubt. Now you go. Kiss Mother and Aunt Magda and the others for me. Tell Mother I'll come to visit some day. I know she'll never set foot on Kingdom soil again. She might if I'm crowned king, said Jimmy. Maybe for that, agreed Dash, and they both laughed. Jimmy put his arm around his younger brother's shoulder. Are you going to be all right? Eventually, said Dash. Right now, I just want to get started on a life of my making. I want to use my wits for something other than getting people killed. Remembering the wild charge at the Keshian's rear elements, the fighting outside the wall before Pug appeared, Jimmy said, I can't see much wrong with that. It's just... What? It's just that we're our father's sons. I know. This isn't easy. But once I made up my mind, I knew it was the right thing. We have duties to each other that are more important than our duties to a flag or a king. Can you honestly say you can work on Patrick's behalf without question? Jimmy said, I would never work for Patrick the man. It's the crown for which I labor. Dash lightly poked his brother's chest. And that, dear brother is the difference between us. I saw common men and women die to protect this city. And what reward is there for them? They get to keep their liberty, said Jimmy. You know what Keshian rule would bring to Crondor? Slavery, press gangs, children being sold to brothels. Are we so noble, then? We have problems, certainly. But we have just laws, Dash said. I've been administering those laws for a while now, Jimmy. I'm not so sure sending a ten-year-old boy to the labor gang for stealing food is just. That's just an extreme case, said Jimmy. I wish that was so. Jimmy said, I have to go. We have been invited to dine with Francine and Patrick. Are you coming? No, said Dash. I'll send a note with my regrets. I have a lot of things to do before the morning if I'm going to turn my office over to someone else. Jimmy said, I wish you'd at least wait until Patrick returns from Milanon. Maybe by then you'll have changed your mind. It's not too late, you know. Dash was silent for a while. Then he said, If I do, that will give me more time to get my affairs in order. Very well. I'll wait until the prince and princess return from Milanon, and then I'll resign my offices. Jimmy grinned. I'll talk you out of it. I'm still not coming to supper. I'll see you in the morning before you leave. They embraced, and Dash left the great hall, heading out the main entrance and through the courtyard toward the new market jail. In the darkest hours of the night, before the sky to the east began to lighten, a single man hid in the shadows near the docks. He kept looking back as if fearing he was being followed, and at last he ducked into a doorway, waiting to see if anyone was behind him. Long minutes passed. Then he stepped out of the door, only to be slammed back against it with a dagger held to his throat. Going somewhere, Reese? The thief's eyes widened. The sheriff! I wasn't on the dodge, honest. I was just heading back to my hall to sleep the day. I need information, and you're going to give it to me, said Dash. Sure, whatever you want. Who's the new daymaster, now that Trina's dead? If I told you, it would be my life, said Reese. If you don't, it will be your life. I don't mean hauling you to Newmarket for a trumped-up trial and a hanging. I mean cutting your throat right now. It doesn't matter, said Reese. There isn't one. There's barely what you'd call a Marcus, since the upright man and Trina died. Who's the nightmaster? He died during the war. There's no leadership anymore. Even mothers ain't safe no more. 
Someone's setting up a new gang near Fishtown for boosting goods unloaded off ships, and there's some bashers setting themselves up down near the old docks. Times ain't what they used to be, Dash. Tell me where to find the gangs in Fishtown and down by the docks. Reese told him what he knew, then Dash said, Here's what you need to know. Things are changing in Crondor, and we're going to be the ones making the changes. We? asked Reese. You and me. I get caught working for the sheriff. I'm a dead man, said Reese. Oh, before we're done, you'll wish it was that simple. You're a bright one, Reese. You were smart enough to hook up with Tall One and me and get out of the work gang. Well, I saw my chance, and I took it. Who's another really smart lad or lass, someone who works well with the children? Jenny's got a level head, and the beggars and pickpockets like her. Good. I want you and Jenny to meet me by the old landing below the North Wall Reservoir, an hour after sundown tomorrow. He let go of the man's shirt and put away his dagger. What if I just don't turn up? Then I'll find you and kill you, said Dash. An hour after sundown, just the two of you. We said, I'll bring her. He ran off into the dark. Dash looked around to make sure he was unobserved, then went the other way. Jimmy rose to depart, and Francine said, Jimmy, may I have a word with you? Jimmy smiled. Many time, Francie. She came over and said, If we still had a garden here, perhaps we could go for a walk. Want to turn around the marshalling yard? She laughed. That will have to do. She turned to her father and Patrick and said, We won't be long. They went down the long corridor from the prince's great hall to the balcony overlooking the marshalling yard. The evening air was warm, and the air held a hint of blooms. When we return, I shall see the garden is restored as soon as possible. Jimmy said, That will be nice. Are you returning to Crondor in time for Midsummer's Festival? Francie asked. Probably not. I shall sail to Roldham to visit Mother. With father dead, she'll never return to the kingdom. Francine sighed. They never grew to love one another? Jimmy shook his head. I think at best they enjoyed things about one another. She admired father's skills as a diplomat. Roldham's a nation of courtiers. He was a very fine dancer, did you know? I remember seeing him at a celebration in the king's court. He cut a very dashing figure. I had a crush on him as a child. He was a very fine father, said Jimmy, suddenly missing him a great deal. He always liked Mother's ability to organize. If there was one guest for dinner or a hundred, she always had everything right by the time the event began. He used to joke that she'd have made a better duke than he. But they never grew close. No, said Jimmy sadly. I know Mother had lovers, though she was always very discreet about it. I don't know about Father. He always seemed so occupied with whatever Grandfather set him to. He probably was too busy to really care. He cared about you and Dash. Jimmy nodded. I know he did. He was always generous in his affections with us. She put her hand on his arm. I don't know what I'm going to do, Jimmy. I like Patrick well enough. The three of us have always been friends. I used to think I was going to marry you back when we were children. He smiled. I know. I used to find it irritating. Then I found it pleasing. She leaned over and kissed him, lightly but lingeringly. Then she said, Be my dear friend. I don't know if I'll become like your mother and ignore Patrick, or if I'll turn my life over to raising a future king of isles. I may take up gardening. And if I decide to have a string of lovers, I'll make you the first one. But most of all, I'm going to need good friends. Everyone I know is now trying to be my friend, and I know that what they see is the future Queen of the Isles. You and Dash and a few of our good friends back in Rillanon are all I have. Jimmy nodded. I understand, Francie. I'll always be your good friend. She took his arm in hers and snuggled into his shoulder. Thank you, Jimmy. Now, let's go back and rejoin the prince. Jimmy knew at that point that he also would eventually marry for reasons of state. He said a silent prayer to any god who would listen that 
the woman fate had in store for him was the match of the one holding on to his arm at this moment, and prayed she would also prove as good a friend as Francine. Two nights later, thieves drifted into mothers. Many looked around for bolt holes, for by general consensus, mothers wasn't safe any more. Still, a few lookouts hung outside, keeping an eye out for the prince's men. Reese stood up on a table and said, Is everyone here? From the back of the room, someone shouted, Everyone who's coming! That brought some guarded chuckles from a few, but no one felt easy enough to really enjoy the weak humor. Reese said, We've got no rules. Rules? shouted a large man in a corner. Whose rules? Mocker's rules, shouted a young woman entering from a far door. She was solidly built and plain of features, but she was known for being one of the smarter thieves in the guild. Her name was Jenny. Who says there's a mockers to make rules for? asked another man. The upright man, shouted Reese. He says. The upright man's dead, said a man from the back of the large room. Everyone knows that. From deep within the shadows behind Reese, a deep voice said, The upright man's died before and always returns. Who's that? said the beefy man in the corner. One who knows you, John Tuppin. You run the bashers. The man looked pale at the dark figure, knowing his name. A thin man in the rear said, Everyone knows Tuppen. He's too big to miss. Others laughed, but a few glanced around, worried expressions on their faces. From the shadows, the voice said, I know you too, Rat. You're the best point lookout of the markers. I know you all. I know every thief, cut purse, dodger, and basher, every toughsman and the whore who calls mothers home. And you know me. It's the upright man, whispered someone. You can claim to be whoever you want, said John Tuppen, but claiming and being ain't the same. I could claim to be the bloody Duke of Crondor, but that don't make it so. From out of the shadows, the voice said, The Fishtown gang was run today. Suddenly, people throughout the room were talking. Reese picked up a large wooden club and slammed it against the wall. Shut up! Silence fell, and the voice from the darkness said, Tomorrow the sheriff will run the old dock bashers. No one works the streets of Crondor without my permission. If those bashers get run tomorrow, said Tuppen, I'll believe you're who you say you are. I will too, shouted the man called Rat. Pass the word, said the voice. The Cassian renegades who sell drugs out of the caravansary will be run. The swine who grabbed kids to sell to the Durban slavers will be run. Anyone not doing business with the mockers will be run. A few in the room cheered. Reese is nightmaster, and Jenny is daymaster. You have a problem, you bring it to them. More cheers. Then Reese said, Get out there, pass the word. The upright man is back. The thieves dispersed until only three people remained at Mother's. Dash stepped out of the shadows. You did well. Tell Tuppen and Rat they did well, too. It's a hard sell, said Reese. You're going to have to bust a lot of heads before they get it. Have a couple of months before the prince returns and installs a new sheriff, said Dash. Between now and then, we'll get organized. The girl said, I don't get one thing. Why are you taking on this job? You're the son of the Duke of Crondor. You're never going to be as rich on the dodgy path as you could be on the straight. If we get caught, we do time in prison or the work gang. If you get caught, you get hung for treason. Why are you doing this? Dash said, A promise. Jenny seemed about to ask another question, but Dash cut her off. You have a lot of work to do, and so do I. You need to get someone into the palace and close to Talwyn. You need to get him followed, and that won't be easy. We have to find his contacts and identify his agents. He's going to be the worst threat to the mockers we'll face. I have just the girl, said Jenny. Young, innocent-looking, can wash and sew, and will cut your heart out for a copper piece. I've got a man I can get into the kitchen, 
said Rhys. I'll get them inside, said Dash. Now, go. They left, and Dash ducked out the back way. He waited, and when he was satisfied no one had seen him depart the thieves' headquarters, he knew that his life would never be truly his own. He knew he'd earn riches as a merchant and marry some well-thought-of young woman, one whom he would probably love and father children. It would be, to outward appearances, a good life. Publicly, he would be a man of importance, one worthy of envy. But he also knew he would live in two worlds, and that most of his life would not be his own. More than his duty to the crown, given to him at birth, without his consent, by his father and grandfather, this duty to a ragged bunch of thieves and thugs was far more binding upon him, for it was a duty he elected, one chosen as a matter of honor, and he knew he would never fail in that duty short of death. Dash set out through the sewers that would be a second home to him for the rest of his life. Epilogue Pug stood. The students who joined him, Miranda, Nacor, and Gathis, looked around the cave curiously. Two torches burned, cutting the gloom. Pug said, We come together tonight to ratify a vow each of you has already given to me in private. Others will come to join us over the years, and a few of you will leave, but this group will endure. We meet in a conclave, for no one outside this group may know we exist. We must linger in the shadows, hidden from the sight of those who live in the world of light. Pug looked from face to face and said, Each of you will act on behalf of people who will never know you exist, who might even fear you or oppose you if they knew of you, out of ignorance or because they are misled. Death will be the reward of many who choose this path. Pug pointed to the mouth of the cave. Out there are men who have taken a path that leads into the darkness. Some are allies, others are ignorant of one another, some are unaware of who they truly serve, and others willingly embrace the evil we face. They will all seek to destroy us. Some of you will leave us, seeking to find our enemies. Others will be looking for new students to send here for training. Others will remain here to teach and organize. The school at Villa Beata will continue as it was, and those who find us, without us seeking them, as many of you have done, will be welcomed here as before. Again, I repeat, no one outside of this group may know we exist. We will deal in dreams and nightmares, in a war few out there can imagine. We are brothers and sisters in this calling, and we must be obedient to the needs of this conclave. No one of us can be above that need. If our lives are the price, so be it. No one in the room spoke. Pug said, We are the conclave of the shadows, and we oppose the madness of the nameless one and his agents. We have endured the rift war and we have survived the Serpent War. We now prepare for the next struggle, one that few will know of, one that will be fought where few can see. It will be a war in the shadows. Pug put out his hand, and Miranda took it. He nodded to Nacor and Gathis, and led his followers out of the cave, down the path to their home. End of Shards of a Broken Crown Serpent War Saga, Volume 4 By Raymond E. Feist Read by Roy Avers